Side 7, the autobiography of Malcolm X, continuing on page 227. On the Thursday MGT and GCC nights, sometimes I would drop in on the classes and maybe at Sister Betty's X's classes. Just as on other nights, I might drop in on the different brothers' classes. At first, I would just ask her things like, how were the sisters learning? Things like that. And she would say, fine, Brother Minister. I'd say, thank you, Sister. Like that. And that would be all there was to it. And after a while, I would have very short conversations with her, just to be friendly. One day, I thought it would help the women's classes if I took her, just because she happened to be an instructor, to the Museum of Natural History. I wanted to show her some museum displays having to do with the Tree of Evolution that would help her in her lectures. I could show her proofs of Mr. Muhammad's teachings of such things as that the filthy pig is only a large rodent. The pig is a graft between a rat, a cat, and a dog, Mr. Muhammad taught us. When I mentioned my idea to Sister Betty X, I made it very clear that it was just to help her lectures to the sisters. I'd even convinced myself that this was the only reason. Then by the time of the afternoon I said we would go, well, I telephoned her. I told her I had to cancel the trip, that something important had come up. She said, well, you sure waited long enough to tell me, Brother Minister. I was just ready to walk out of the door. So I told her, well, all right, come on then, I'd make it somehow. But I wasn't going to have much time. While we were down there, offhandedly, I asked her all kinds of things. I just wanted some idea of her thinking. You understand, I mean, how, she thought. I was halfway impressed by her intelligence and also her education. In those days, she was one of the few whom we'd attracted who had attended college. Then right after that, one of the older sisters confided to me a personal problem that Sister Betty X was having. I was really surprised that when she had had the chance, Sister Betty X had not mentioned anything to me about it. Every Muslim minister is always hearing the problems of young people whose parents have ostracized them for becoming Muslims. Well, when Sister Betty X told her foster parents, who were financing her education, that she was a Muslim, they gave her a choice. Leave the Muslims, or they'd cut off her nursing school. It was right near the end of her term, but she was hanging on to Islam. She began taking babysitting jobs for some of the doctors who lived on the grounds of the hospital where she was training. In my position, I would never have made any move without thinking how it would affect the Nation of Islam organization as a whole. I got to turning it over in my mind. What would happen if I just should happen sometime to think about getting married to somebody? For instance, Sister Betty X. Although it could be any sister in any temple. But Sister Betty X, for instance, would just happen to be the right height for somebody my height and also the right age. Mr. Elijah Muhammad taught us that a tall man married to a too short woman or vice versa. They looked odd, not matched. And he taught that a wife's ideal age was half the man's age plus seven. He taught that women are physiologically ahead of men. Mr. Muhammad taught that no marriage could succeed where the woman did not look up with respect to the man, and that the man had to have something above and beyond the wife in order for her to be able to look to him for psychological security. I was so shocked at myself when I realized what I was thinking. I quit going anywhere near Sister Betty X or anywhere I knew she would be. If she came into our restaurant and I was there, I went out somewhere. I was glad I knew that she had no idea what I'd been thinking about. My not talking to her wouldn't have given her any reason to think anything, since there'd never been one personal word spoken between us, even if she had thought anything. I studied about if I just should happen to say something to her, what would her position be? Because she wasn't going to get any chance to embarrass me. I'd heard too many women bragging, I told that chump, get lost. I'd had too much experience of the kind to make a man very cautious. I knew one good thing. She had few relatives. My feeling about in-laws was that they were outlaws. Right among the Temple Seven Muslims, I'd seen more marriages destroyed by in-laws, usually anti-Muslim, than any other single thing I knew of. I wasn't about to say any of that romance stuff that Hollywood and television had filled women's heads with. If I was going to do something, I was going to do it directly. And anything I was going to do, I was going to do my way. And because I wanted to do it. Not because I saw somebody do it. Or read about it in a book. Or saw it in a moving picture somewhere. I told Mr. Muhammad when I visited him in Chicago that month that I was thinking about a very serious step. He smiled when he heard what it was. I told him I was just thinking about it. That was all. Mr. Muhammad said that he'd like to meet this sister. The nation by this time was financially able to bear the expenses so that instructor sisters from different temples could be sent to Chicago to attend the headquarters Temple Two women's classes and while there to meet the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in person. Sister Betty X, of course, knew all about this, so there was no reason for her to think anything of it when it was arranged for her to go to Chicago. And like all visiting instructor sisters, she was a house guest of the messenger and Sister Clara Muhammad. Mr. Muhammad told me that he thought that Sister Betty X was a fine sister. If you're thinking about doing a thing, you ought to make up your mind if you're going to do it or not do it. One Sunday night after the Temple Seven meeting, 
I drove my car out on the Garden State Parkway. I was on my way to visit my brother Wilford in Detroit. Wilford, the year before, in 1957, had been made the minister of Detroit's Temple One. I hadn't seen him or any of my family in a good while. It was about ten in the morning when I got inside Detroit. Getting gas at a filling station, I just went to their payphone on a wall. I telephoned Sister Betty X. I had to get information to get the number of the nurse's residence at this hospital. Most numbers I memorized, but I'd always made it some point never to memorize her number. Somebody got her to the phone finally. She said, Oh, hello, Brother Minister. I just said it to her direct. Look, do you want to get married? Naturally, she acted all surprised and shocked. The more I have thought about it, to this day, I believe she was only putting on an act. Because women know. They know. She said, just like I knew she would. Yes. Then I said, well, I didn't have a whole lot of time. She better catch a plane to Detroit. So she grabbed a plane. I met her foster parents who lived in Detroit. They had made up by this time. They were very friendly and happily surprised. At least they acted that way. Then I introduced Sister Betty X at my oldest brother Wilfred's house. I'd already asked him where people could get married without a whole lot of mess and waiting. He told me in Indiana. Early the next morning, I picked up Betty at her parents' home. We drove to the first town in Indiana. We found out that only a few days before... The state law had been changed, and now Indiana had a long waiting period. This was the 14th of January, 1958, a Tuesday. We weren't far from Lansing, where my brother Philbert lived. I drove there. Philbert was at work when we stopped at his house, and I introduced Betty X. She and Philbert's wife were talking when I found out on the phone that we could get married in one day if we rushed. We got the necessary blood tests, then the license. Where the certificate said religion, I wrote Muslim. Then we went to the Justice of the Peace. An old hunchbacked white man performed the wedding, and all the witnesses were white. Where you supposed to say all those I do's, we did. They were all standing there, smiling and watching every move. The old devil said, I pronounce you man and wife, and then kiss your bride. I got her out of there, all that Hollywood stuff. Like these women wanting men to pick them up and carry them across thresholds, and some of them weigh more than you do. I don't know how many marriage breakups are caused by these movie and television addicted women expecting some bouquets and kissing and hugging and being swept out like Cinderella for dinner and dancing, then getting mad when a poor, scraggly husband comes in tired and sweaty from working like a dog all day looking for some food. We had dinner there at Philbert's home in Lansing. I've got a surprise for you, I told him when we came in. You haven't got any surprise for me, he said. When he got home from work and heard I'd been there introducing a Muslim sister... He knew I was either married or on the way to get married. Betty's nursing school schedule called for her to fly right back to New York, and she could return in four days. She claimed she didn't tell anybody in Temple 7 that we'd married. That Sunday, Mr. Muhammad was going to teach at Detroit's Temple 1. I had an assistant minister in New York now. I telephoned him to take over for me. Saturday, Betty came back. The messenger after his teaching on Sunday made the announcement. Even in Michigan, my steering clear of all sisters was so well known they just couldn't believe it. We drove right back to New York together. The news really shook everybody in Temple 7. Some young brothers looked at me as though I'd betrayed them. But everybody else was grinning like Cheshire cats. The sisters just about ate up, Betty. I never will forget hearing one exclaim, You got him! That's like I was telling you. The nature of women. She'd got me. That's part of why I never have been able to shake it out of my mind that she knew something all the time. Maybe she did get me. Anyway, we lived for the next two and a half years in Queens sharing a house of two small apartments with Brother John Ali and his wife of that time. He's now the National Secretary in Chicago. Attila, our oldest daughter, was born in November 1958. She's named for Attila the Hun. He sacked Rome. Shortly after Attila came, we moved to our present seven-room house in an all-black section of Queens, Long Island. Another girl, Kabila, named after Kabila Khan, was born on Christmas Day of 1960. Then Ilyasa, Ilyas is Arabic for Elijah, was born in July 1962. And in 1964, our fourth daughter, Amila, arrived. I guess by now I will say I love Betty. She's the only woman I ever even thought about loving. And she's one of the very few, four women, whom I've ever trusted. The thing is, Betty's a good Muslim woman and wife. You see, Islam is the only religion that gives both husband and wife a true understanding of what love is. The Western love concept, you take it apart, it really is lust. But love transcends just the physical. Love is disposition, behavior, attitude, thoughts, likes, dislikes. These things make a beautiful woman, a beautiful wife. 
This is the beauty that never fades. You find in your Western civilization that when a man's wife's physical beauty fails, she loses her attraction. But Islam teaches us to look into the woman and teaches her to look into us. Betty does this, so she understands me. I would even say I don't imagine many other women might put up with the way I am, awakening this brainwashed black man and telling this arrogant, devilish white man the truth about himself. Betty understands is a full-time job. If I have work to do when I'm home, the little time I am at home, she lets me have the quiet I need to work in. I'm rarely at home more than half of any week. I've been away as much as five months. I never get much chance to take her anywhere, and I know she likes to be with her husband. She's used to my calling her from airports anywhere from Boston to San Francisco, or Miami to Seattle, or here lately cabling her from Cairo, Accra, or the holy city of Mecca. Once on the long-distance telephone, Betty told me in beautiful phrasing the way she thinks. She said, You are present when you are away. Later that year, after Betty and I were married, I exhausted myself trying to be everywhere at once, trying to help the nation to keep growing. Guests teaching at the temple in Boston, I ended as always, Who among you wish to follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? And then I saw in utter astonishment that among those who were standing was my sister, Ella. We have a saying that those who are the hardest to convince make the best Muslims. And for Ella, it had taken five years. I mentioned you will remember how in a big city a sizable organization can remain practically unknown unless something happens that brings it to the general public's attention. Well, certainly no one in the nation of Islam had any anticipation of the kind of thing that would happen in Harlem one night. Two white policemen, breaking up a street scuffle between some Negroes, ordered other Negro passers-by to move on. Of these bystanders, two happened to be Muslim brother Johnson Hinton and another brother of Temple Seven. They didn't scatter and run the way the white cops wanted. Brother Hinton was attacked with nightsticks. His scalp was split open, and a police car came and he was taken to a nearby precinct. The second brother telephoned our restaurant, and with some telephone calls, in less than half an hour, about 50 of Temple Seven's men of the Fruit of Islam were standing in ranks formation outside the police precinct house. Other Negroes, curious, came running and gathered in excitement behind the Muslims. The police, coming through the station house front door and looking out of the windows, couldn't believe what they saw. I went in as the minister of the Temple Seven and demanded to see our brother. The police first said he wasn't there. Then they admitted he was, but said I couldn't see him. I said that until he was seen, and we were sure he received proper medical attention, the Muslims would remain where they were. They were nervous and scared of the gathering crowd outside. When I saw our brother Hinton, it was all I could do to contain myself. He was only semi-conscious. Blood had bathed his head and face and shoulders. I hope I never again have to withstand seeing another case of sheer police brutality like that. I told the lieutenant in charge, that man belongs in the hospital. They called an ambulance. When it came and Brother Hinton was taken to Harlem Hospital, we Muslims followed in loose formations for about 15 blocks along Lenox Avenue, probably the busiest thoroughfare in Harlem. Negroes who never had seen anything like this were coming out of stores and restaurants and bars and enlarging the crowd following us. The crowd was big and angry behind the Muslims in front of Harlem Hospital. Harlem's black people were long since sick and tired of police brutality and they never had seen any organization of black men take a firm stand as we were. A high police official came up to me saying, Get those people out of there. I told him that our brothers were standing peacefully, disciplined perfectly, and harming no one. He told me those others behind them weren't disciplined. I politely told him those others were his problem. When doctors assured us that Brother Hinton was receiving the best of care, I gave the order, and the Muslims slipped away. The other Negroes' mood was ugly, but they dispersed also when we left. We wouldn't learn until later that a steel plate would have to be put into Brother Hinton's skull. After that operation, the nation of Islam helped him to sue. A jury awarded him over $70,000, the largest police brutality judgment that New York City has ever paid. For New York City's millions of readers of the downtown papers, it was at that time another one of the periodic racial unrest in Harlem stories. It was not played up because of what had happened. But the police department, to be sure, pulled out and carefully studied the files on the nation of Islam and appraised us with new eyes. Most important, in Harlem, the world's most heavily populated black ghetto, the Amsterdam News made the whole story headline news, and for the first time, the black man, woman, and child in the streets was discussing those Muslims. Chapter 14. Black Muslims. In the spring of 1959, some months before Brother Johnson Hinton's case had awakened the Harlem black ghetto to us, a Negro journalist, Louis Lomax, then living in New York, asked me one morning whether our nation of Islam would cooperate in being filmed as a television documentary program for the Mike Wallace show, which featured controversial subjects. 
I told Lomax that, naturally, anything like that would have to be referred to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And Lomax did fly to Chicago to consult Mr. Muhammad. After questioning Lomax, then cautioning him against some things he did not desire, Mr. Muhammad gave his consent. Cameramen began filming Nation of Islam scenes around our mosques in New York, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. Sound recordings were made of Mr. Muhammad and some ministers, including me, teaching black audiences the truths about the brainwashed black man and the devil white man. At Boston University around the same time, C. Eric Lincoln, a Negro scholar then working for his doctorate, had selected for his thesis subject the Nation of Islam. Lincoln's interest had been aroused the previous year when, teaching at Clark College in Atlanta, Georgia, he received from one of his religion students a term paper whose introduction I can now quote from Lincoln's book. It was the plain-spoken convictions of one of Atlanta's numerous young black collegians who often visited our local Temple 15. The Christian religion is incompatible with the Negro's aspirations for dignity and equality in America, the student had written. It has hindered where it might have helped. It has been evasive when it was morally bound to be forthright. It has separated believers on the basis of color, although it has declared its mission to be a universal brotherhood under Jesus Christ. Christian love is the white man's love for himself and for his race. For the man who is not white, Islam is the hope for justice and equality in the world we must build tomorrow. After some preliminary research showed Professor Lincoln what a subject he had hold of, he'd been able to obtain several grants and a publisher's encouragement to expand his thesis into a book. On the wire of our relatively small nation, these two big developments, a television show and a book about us, naturally were big news. Every Muslim happily anticipated that now, through the white man's powerful communications media, our brainwashed black brothers and sisters across the United States, and devils too, were going to see, hear, and read Mr. Muhammad's teachings, which cut back and forth like a two-edged sword. We'd made our own very limited efforts to employ the power of print. First, some time back, I'd made an appointment to see editor James Hicks of the Amsterdam News, published in Harlem. Editor Hicks said he felt every voice in the community deserved to be heard. Soon, each week's Amsterdam News carried a little column that I wrote. Then Mr. Muhammad agreed to write a column for that valuable Amsterdam News space, and my column was transferred to another black newspaper, the Los Angeles Herald-Dispatch. But I kept wanting to start, somehow, our own newspaper that would be filled with Nation of Islam News. Mr. Muhammad, in 1957, sent me to organize a temple in Los Angeles. When I'd done that, being in that city where the Herald-Dispatch was, I went visiting and I worked in their office. They let me observe how a newspaper was put together. I've always been blessed in that if I can once watch something being done, generally I can catch on to how to do it myself. Quick picking up was probably the number one survival rule when I'd been out there in the streets as a hustler. Back in New York, I bought a second-hand camera. I don't know how many rolls of film I shot until I could take usable pictures. Every chance I had, I wrote some little news about interesting nation of Islam happenings. One day every month, I'd lock up in a room and assemble my material and pictures for a printer that I found. I named the newspaper... Muhammad Speaks, and Muslim brothers sold it on the ghetto sidewalks. Little did I dream that later on, when jealousy set in among the hierarchy, nothing about me would be printed in the paper I had found it. Anyway, national publicity was in the offing for the Nation of Islam when Mr. Muhammad sent me on a three-week trip to Africa. Even as small as we then were, some of the African and Asian personages had sent Mr. Muhammad private word that they liked his efforts to awaken and lift up the American black people. Sometimes the messages had been sent through me. As Mr. Muhammad's emissary, I went to Egypt, Arabia, to the Sudan, to Nigeria, and Ghana. You will often hear today a lot of the Negro leaders complaining that what thrust the Muslims into international prominence was the white man's press, radio, television, and other media. I have no shred of argument with that. They are absolutely correct. Why, none of us in the nation of Islam remotely anticipated what was about to happen. In late 1959, the television program was aired. The hate that hate produced. The title was edited tightly into a kaleidoscope of shocker images. Mr. Muhammad, me, and others speaking. Strong-looking, set-faced black men are fruit of Islam. White-scarved, white-gowned Muslim sisters of all ages. Muslims in our restaurants and other businesses. Muslims and other black people entering and leaving our mosques. Every phrase was edited to increase the shock mood. As the producers intended, I think people sat just about limp when the program went off. In a way, the public reaction was like what happened back in the 1930s when Orson Welles frightened America with a radio program describing as though it was actually happening an invasion by men from Mars. No one now jumped from any windows, but in New York City there was an instant avalanche of public reaction. It's my personal opinion that the 
Hate. Hate. Title was primarily responsible for the reaction. Hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, black and white, were exclaiming, Did you hear it? Did you see it? Preaching hate of white people. Here was one of the white man's most characteristic behavior patterns, where black men are concerned. He loves himself so much that he is startled if he discovers that his victims don't share his vainglorious self-opinion. In America for centuries, it had been just fine as long as the victimized, brutalized, and exploited black people had been grinning and begging and, yes, a massa, and Uncle Tommy. But now things were different. First came the white newspapers, feature writers and columnists, alarming, hate messengers, threat to the good relations between the races, black segregationists, black supremacists, and the like. And the newspaper's ink wasn't dry before the big national weekly news magazines started. Hate teachers, violence seekers, black racists, black fascists, anti-Christian, possibly communist inspired. It rolled out of the presses of the biggest devil in the history of mankind. And then the aroused white man made his next move. Since slavery, the American white man has always kept some hand-picked Negroes who fared much better than the black masses suffering and slaving out in the hot fields. The white man had these house and yard Negroes for his special servants. He threw them more crumbs from his rich table, he even let them eat in his kitchen. He knew that he could always count on them to keep good massa happy in his self-image of being so good and righteous. Good massa always heard just what he wanted to hear from these house and yard blacks. You're such a good fine massa, or old oh, massa, those old black nigger field hands out there, they're happy just like they are. Why, massa, they're not intelligent enough for you to try and do any better for the massa. Well, slavery times house and yard negroes had become more sophisticated. That was all. When now the white man picked up his telephone and dialed his house and yard negroes, why, he didn't even need to instruct the trained black puppets. They'd seen the television program, had read the newspapers. They were already composing their lines. They knew what to do. I'm not going to call any names, but if you make a list of the biggest Negro leaders, so-called, in 1960, then you've named the ones who began to attack us field Negroes who were sounding insane talking that way about good massa. By no means do these Muslims represent the Negro masses. That was the first worry, to reassure good massa that he had no reason to be concerned about his field hands in the ghettos. An irresponsible hate cult, an unfortunate Negro image just when the racial picture is improving. They were stumbling over each other to get quoted. A deplorable reverse racism. Ridiculous pretenders to the ancient Islamic doctrine. Heretic anti-Christianity. The telephone in our then small Temple 7 restaurant nearly jumped off the wall. I had a receiver against my ear five hours a day. I was listening and jotting in my notebook as press, radio, and television people called, all of them wanting the Muslim reaction to the quoted attacks of these black leaders. Or I was on long distance to Mr. Muhammad in Chicago, reading from my notebook and asking for Mr. Muhammad's instructions. I couldn't understand how Mr. Muhammad could maintain his calm and patience hearing the things I told him. I could scarcely contain myself. My unlisted home telephone number somehow got out. My wife, Betty, put down the phone after taking one message, and it was ringing again. It seemed that wherever I went, telephones were ringing. The calls naturally were directed to me, New York City being the major news media headquarters, and I was the New York minister of Mr. Muhammad. Calls came long distance from San Francisco to Maine, from even London, Stockholm, Paris. I would see a Muslim brother at our restaurant, or Betty at home, trying to keep cool. They'd hand me the receiver, and I couldn't believe it either. One funny thing, in all that hectic period, something quickly struck my notice. The Europeans never pressed the hate question. Only the American white man was so plagued and obsessed with being hated. He was so guilty, it was clear to me, of hating Negroes. Mr. Malcolm X, why do you teach black supremacy and hate? A red flag waved for me. Something chemical happened inside me every time I heard that. When we Muslims had talked about the devil white man, he had been relatively abstract. Someone we Muslims rarely actually came into contact with. But now here was that devil in the flesh on the phone, with all of his calculating, cold-eyed, self-righteous tricks and nerve and gall. The voices questioning me became to me as breathing, living devils. And I tried to pour on pure fire in return. The white man so guilty of white supremacy can't hide his guilt by trying to accuse the Honorable Elijah Muhammad of teaching black supremacy and hate. All Mr. Muhammad is doing is trying to uplift the black man's mentality and the black man's social and economic condition in this country. The guilty, two-faced white man can't decide what he wants. 
Our slave foreparents would have been put to death for advocating so-called integration with the white man. Now when Mr. Muhammad speaks of separation, the white man calls us hate teachers and fascists. The white man doesn't want the blacks. He doesn't want the blacks that are a parasite upon him. He doesn't want this black man whose presence and condition in this country expose the white man to the world for what he is. So why do you attack Mr. Muhammad? I'd have scathing in my voice. I felt it. For the white man to ask the black man if he hates him is just like the rapist asking the raped or the wolf asking the sheep, Do you hate me? The white man is in no moral position to accuse anyone else of hate. Why, when all of my ancestors are snake-bitten, and I'm snake-bitten, and I want my children to avoid snakes, what does that snake sound like accusing me of hate-teaching? Mr. Malcolm X, those devils would ask, why is your fruit of Islam being trained in judo and karate? An image of black men learning anything suggesting self-defense seemed to terrify the white man. I turned that question around. Why does judo or karate suddenly get so ominous because black men study it? Across America, the Boy Scouts, the YMCA, even the YWCA, the CYP, PAL, they all teach judo. It's all right, it's fine, until black men teach it. Even little grammar school classes, little girls are taught to defend themselves. How many of you are in your organization, Mr. Malcolm X? Right Reverend Bishop T. Chickenwing says you have only a handful of members. Whoever tells you how many Muslims there are doesn't know, and whoever does know will never tell you. The Bishop Chicken Wings were also often quoted about our anti-Christianity. I'd fire right back on that. Christianity is the white man's religion. The Holy Bible in the white man's hands and his interpretations of it have been the greatest single ideological weapon for enslaving millions of non-white human beings. Every country the white man has conquered with his guns, he has always paved the way and salved his conscience by carrying the Bible and interpreting it to call the people heathens and pagans. Then he sends his guns, then his missionaries behind the guns to mop up. White reporters, anger in their voices, would call us demagogues. And I would try to be ready after I've been asked the same question two or three times. Well, let's go back to the Greek, and maybe you will learn the first thing you need to know about the word demagogue. Demagogue means, actually, teacher of the people. And let's examine some demagogues. The greatest of all Greeks, Socrates, was killed as a demagogue. Jesus Christ died on the cross because the Pharisees of his day were upholding their law, not the spirit. The modern Pharisees are trying to heap destruction upon Mr. Muhammad, calling him a demagogue, a crackpot, and fanatic. What about Gandhi, the man that Churchill called a naked little fakir, refusing food in a British jail? But then a quarter of a billion people, a whole subcontinent, rallied behind Gandhi, and they twisted the British lion's tail. What about Galileo, standing before his inquisitor, saying, The earth does move. What about Martin Luther, nailing on a door his thesis against the all-powerful Catholic Church, which called him heretic? We, the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, are today in the ghettos, as once the sect of Christianity's followers were like termites in the catacombs and the grottos, and they were preparing the grave of the mighty Roman Empire. I can remember those hot telephone sessions with those reporters as if it were yesterday. The reporters were angry. I was angry. When I'd reach into history, they'd try to pull me back to the present. They would quit interviewing, quit their work, trying to defend their personal white devil selves. They would unearth Lincoln and his freeing of the slaves. I'd tell them things Lincoln said in speeches against the blacks. They would drag up the 1954 Supreme Court decision on school integration. That was one of the greatest magical feats ever performed in America, I'd tell them. Do you mean to tell me that nine Supreme Court judges who are past masters of legal phraseology couldn't have worked their decision to make it stick as law? No, it was trickery and magic that told Negroes they were desegregated. Hooray, hooray! And at the same time it told whites, Here are your loopholes. The reporters would try their utmost to raise some good white man whom I couldn't refute as such. I'll never forget how one practically lost his voice. He asked me, did I feel any white man had ever done anything for the black man in America? I told him, yes, I can think of two, Hitler and Stalin. The black man in America couldn't get a decent factory job until Hitler put so much pressure on the white man, and then Stalin kept up the pressure. But I don't care what points I made in the interviews, it practically never got printed the way I said it. I was learning under fire how the press, when it wants to, can twist and slant. If I had said, Mary had a little lamb, what probably would have appeared was Malcolm X lampoons Mary. Even so, my bitterness was less against the white press than it was against those Negro 
leaders who kept attacking us. Mr. Muhammad said he wanted us to try our best not to publicly counterattack the black leaders because one of the white man's tricks was keeping the black race divided and fighting against each other. Mr. Muhammad said that this had traditionally kept the black people from achieving the unity which was the worst need of the black race in America. But instead of abating, the black puppets continued ripping and tearing at Mr. Muhammad and the nation of Islam until it began to appear as though we were afraid to speak out against these important Negroes. That's when Mr. Muhammad's patience wore thin. And with his nod, I began returning their fire. Today's Uncle Tom doesn't wear a handkerchief on his head. This modern 20th century Uncle Thomas now often wears a top hat. He's usually well-dressed and well-educated. He's often the personification of culture and refinement. The 20th century Uncle Thomas sometimes speaks with a Yale or Harvard accent. Sometimes he's known as Professor, Doctor, Judge, and Reverend, even Right Reverend Doctor. This 20th century Uncle Thomas is a professional Negro. By that I mean his profession is being a Negro for the white man. Never before in America have these hand-picked so-called leaders been publicly blasted in this way. They reacted to the truth about themselves even more hotly than the devilish white man. Now their institutional indictments of us began. Instead of leaders speaking as themselves, for themselves, now their weighty name organizations attacked Mr. Muhammad. Black bodies with white heads, I call them what they were. Every one of those Negro progress organizations had the same composition. Black leaders were out in the public eye to be seen by the Negroes for whom they were supposed to be fighting the white man. But obscurely, behind the scenes, was a white boss, a president, or board chairman, or some other title, pulling the real strings. It was hot, hot copy, both in the white and the black press. Life, Look, Newsweek, and Time reported us. Some newspaper chains began to run not one story, but a series of three, four, or five exposures of the nation of Islam. The Reader's Digest, with its worldwide circulation of 24 million copies in 13 languages, carried an article titled, Mr. Muhammad Speaks, by the writer to whom I'm telling this book, and that led off other major monthly magazines' coverage of us. Before very long, radio and television people began asking me to defend our nation of Islam in panel discussions and debates. I was to be confronted by hand-picked scholars, both whites and some of those Ph.D. house and yard Negroes who had been attacking us. Every day I was more incensed with the general misrepresentation and distortion of Mr. Muhammad's teachings. I truly think that not once did it cross my mind that previously I never had been inside a radio or television station, let alone faced a microphone to audiences of millions of people. Prison debating had been my only experience speaking to anyone but Muslims. From the old hustling days, I knew that there were tricks to everything. In the prison debating, I'd learned tricks to upset my opponents, to catch them where they didn't expect to be caught. I knew there were bound to be tricks I didn't know anything about in arguing on the air. I knew that if I closely studied what the others did, I could learn things in a hurry to help me to defend Mr. Muhammad and his teachings. I'd walk into those studios. The devils and black Ph.D. puppets would be acting so friendly and integrated with each other, laughing and calling each other by first names and all that. It was such a big lie it made me sick in my stomach. They would even be trying to act friendly toward me. We all knowing they'd ask me they had to try and beat out my brains. They would offer me coffee. I would tell them, no thanks, to please just tell me where I was supposed to sit. Sometimes the microphone sat on the table before you. At other times a smaller, cylindrical microphone was hung on a cord around your neck. From the start, I liked those microphones better. I didn't have to keep constantly aware of my distance from the microphone on the table. The program hosts would start with some kind of dice-loading, non-religious introduction for me. It would be something like, And we have with us today the fiery, angry Chief Malcolm X of the New York Muslims. I made it my own introduction. At home or driving my car, I practiced until I could interrupt a radio or television host and introduce myself. I represent Mr. Elijah Muhammad, the spiritual head of the fastest-growing group of Muslims in the Western Hemisphere. We who follow him know that he's been divinely taught and sent to us by God himself. We believe that the miserable plight of America's 20 million black people is the fulfillment of divine prophecy. We also believe the presence today in America of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his teachings among the so-called Negroes, and his naked warning to America concerning her treatment of these so-called Negroes, is all the fulfillment of divine prophecy. I am privileged to be the minister of our Temple No. 7 here in New York City, which is a part of the Nation of Islam under the divine leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I would look around at those devils and their trained black parrots staring at me while I was catching my breath, and I had set my tone. 
they would outdo each other, leaping in on me, hammering at Mr. Muhammad, at me, and at the nation of Islam. Those integration mad Negroes, you know what they jumped on. Why couldn't Muslims see that integration was the answer to American Negroes' problems? I try to rip that to pieces. No sane black man really wants integration. No sane white man really wants integration. No sane black man really believes that the white man ever will give the black man anything more than token integration. No. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches that for the black man in America, the only solution is complete separation from the white man. Anyone who's ever heard me on radio or television programs knows that my technique is non-stop until what I want to get said is said. I was developing the technique then. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that since Western society is deteriorating, it has become overrun with immorality, and God is going to judge it and destroy it. And the only way the black people caught up in this society can be saved is not to integrate into this corrupt society, but to separate from it to a land of our own, where we can reform ourselves, lift up our moral standards, and try to be godly. The Western world's most learned diplomats have failed to solve this grave race problem. Her learned legal experts have failed. Her sociologists have failed. Her civil leaders have failed. Her fraternal leaders have failed. Since all of these have failed to solve this race problem, it is time for us to sit down and reason. I am certain that we will be forced to agree that it takes God himself to solve this grave racial dilemma. Every time I mentioned separation, some of them would cry that we Muslims were standing for the same thing that white racists and demagogues stood for. I would explain the difference. No, we reject segregation even more militantly than you say you do. We want separation, which is not the same. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that segregation is when your life and liberty are controlled, regulated, by someone else. To segregate means to control. Segregation is that which is forced upon inferiors by superiors, but separation is that which is done voluntarily by two equals for the good of both. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that as long as our people here in America are dependent upon the white man, we will always be begging him for jobs, food, clothing, and housing, and he will always control our lives, regulate our lives, and have the power to segregate us. The Negro here in America has been treated like a child. A child stays within the mother until the time of birth. When the time of birth arrives, the child must be separated, or it will destroy its mother and itself. The mother can't carry that child after its time. The child cries for and needs its own world. Anyone who has listened to me will have to agree that I believed in Elijah Muhammad and represented him 100%. I never tried to take any credit for myself. I was never in one of those panel discussions without some of them just waiting their chance to accuse me of inciting Negroes to violence. I didn't even have to do any special studying to prepare for that one. The greatest miracle Christianity has achieved in America is that the black man in white Christian hands has not grown violent. It is a miracle that 22 million black people have not risen up against their oppressors, in which they would have been justified by all moral criteria and even by the democratic tradition. It is a miracle that a nation of black people has so fervently continued to believe in a turn-the-other-cheek and heaven-for-you-after-you-die philosophy. It is a miracle that the American black people have remained a peaceful people while catching all the centuries of hell that they have caught here in white man's heaven. The miracle is that the white man's puppet Negro leaders, his preachers and the educated Negroes laden with degrees and others who have been allowed to wax fat off their black poor brothers have been able to hold the black masses quiet until now. I guarantee you one thing. Every time I was mixed up in those studios with those brainwashed, integration-mad black puppets and those tricky devils trying to rip and tear me down, as long as the little red light glowed on the air, I tried to represent Elijah Muhammad and the nation of Islam to the utmost. Dr. C. Eric Lincoln's book was published amid widening controversy about us Muslims at just about the time we were starting to put on our first big mass rallies. Just as the television Hate That Hate Produced title had projected that hate-teaching image of us, now Dr. Lincoln's book was titled The Black Muslims in America. The press snatched at that name. Black Muslims was in all the book reviews, which quoted from the book only what was critical of us and generally praised Dr. Lincoln's writing. The public mind fixed on black Muslims. From Mr. Muhammad on down, the name black Muslims distressed everyone in the nation of Islam. I tried for at least two years to kill off that black Muslims. 
Every newspaper and magazine writer and microphone I got close to. No, we are black people here in America. Our religion is Islam. We are properly called Muslims, but that black Muslim's name never got dislodged. Our mass rallies from the very beginning were astounding successes. Where once Detroit's struggling little Temple One proudly sent a ten automobile caravan to Chicago to hear Mr. Muhammad, now from East Coast temples, the older temples as well as the new ones that all of the massive publicity had helped to bring into being, as many as 150, 200, and even as many as 300 big charted buses rolled the highways to wherever Mr. Muhammad was going to speak. On each bus, two Fruit of Islam men were in charge. Big three-by-nine-foot painted canvas banners hung on the bus's sides to be read by the highway traffic and thousands of people at home and on the sidewalks of the towns the buses passed through. Hundreds more Muslims and curious Negroes drove their own cars, and Mr. Muhammad with his personal jet plane from Chicago. From the airport to the rally hall, Mr. Muhammad's motorcade had a siren-screaming police escort. Law agencies once had scoffed at our nation as black crackpots. Now they took special pains to safeguard against some white crackpots causing any incidents or accidents. America never seen such fantastic all-black meetings. To hear Elijah Muhammad, up to 10,000 and more black people poured from public and private transportation to overflow the big halls we rented, such as the St. Nicholas Arena in New York City, Chicago's Coliseum, and Washington, D.C.'s Uline Arena. The white man was barred from attendance, the first time the American black man had ever dreamed of such a thing. And that brought us new attacks from the white man and his black puppets, black segregationists, racists, accusing us of segregation. Across America, whites barring blacks was standard. Many hundreds arrived too late for us to seat them. We always had to wire up outside loudspeakers. An electric atmosphere excited the great shifting masses of black people. The long lines, three and four abreast, funneling to the meeting hall, were kept in strict order by Fruit of Islam men communicating by walkie-talkie. In anterooms just inside the halls, more Fruit of Islam men and white-gowned, veiled, mature Muslim sisters thoroughly searched every man, woman, and child seeking to enter. Any alcohol and tobacco had to be checked, and any objects which could possibly be used to attempt to harm Mr. Muhammad. He always seemed deathly afraid that someone would harm him, and he insisted that everyone be searched to forestall this. Today I understand better why. The hundreds of Fruit of Islam men represented contingents which had arrived early that morning from their temples in the nearest cities. Some were detailed as ushers, who seated the people by designated sections. The balconies in the rear half of the main floor were filled with black people of the general public. Ahead of them were the all-Muslim seating sections, the white-garbed, beautiful black sisters and the dark-suited, white-shirted brothers. A special section near the front was for black so-called dignitaries. Many of these had been invited. Among them were our black puppet and parrot attackers, the intellectuals and professional Negroes over whom Mr. Muhammad grieved so much. For these were the educated ones who should have been foremost in leading their poor black brothers out of the maze of misery and want. We wanted them to miss not a single syllable of the truths from Mr. Muhammad in person. The front two or three press rows were filled with the black reporters and cameramen representing the Negro press, or those who had been hired by the white man's newspapers, magazines, radio, and television. America's black writers should hold a banquet for Mr. Muhammad. Writing about the nation of Islam was the path to success for most of the black writers who now are recognized. Upon the speaker's platform, we ministers and other officials of the nation, entering from backstage, found ourselves chairs in the five or six rows behind the big chair reserved for Mr. Muhammad. Some of the ministers had come hundreds of miles to be present. We would be turning about in our chairs, beaming with smiles, wringing each other's hands and exchanging as salam alaikum and wa alaikum salam in our genuine deep rejoicing to see each other again. Always meeting us older hands in Mr. Muhammad's service for the first time, there were several new ministers of small new temples. My brothers Wilfred and Filbert were respectively now the ministers of the Detroit and Lansing temples. Minister Jeremiah X headed Atlanta's temple. Minister John X had Los Angeles' temple. The messenger's son, Minister Wallace Muhammad, had the Philadelphia temple. Minister Woodrow X had the Atlantic City temple. Some of our ministers had unusual backgrounds. The Washington, D.C. temple, Minister Lucius X, was previously a Seventh-day Adventist and a 32nd-degree Mason. Minister George X of the Camden, New Jersey Temple was a pathologist. Minister David X was previously the minister of a Richmond, Virginia Christian church. He and enough of his congregation had become Muslims so that the congregation split and the majority turned the church into our Richmond Temple. 
The Boston Temple's outstanding young minister, Louis X, previously a well-known and rising popular singer called The Charmer, had written our nation's popular first song titled, White Man's Heaven is Black Man's Hell. Minister Louis X had also authored our first play, Orgina, a Negro spelled backwards. Its theme was the all-black trial of a symbolic white man for his world crimes against non-whites. Found guilty, sentenced to death, he was dragged off shouting about all he had done for the Negro people. Younger even than our talented Louis X were some newer ministers, Minister Thomas J. X of the Hartford Temple being one example, and another the Buffalo Temple's minister, Robert J. X. I'd either originally established or organized for Mr. Muhammad most of the represented temples. Greeting each of these temples' brother ministers would bring back into my mind images of fishing for converts along the streets and from door to door wherever the black people were congregated. I remember the countless meetings in living rooms where maybe seven would be a crowd, the gradually building, building, on up to renting folding chairs for dingy little storefronts which Muslims scrubbed to spotlessness. We together on a huge hall speaking platform, and that vast audience before us miraculously manifested, as far as I was concerned, the incomprehensible power of Allah. For the first time, I truly understood something Mr. Muhammad had told me. He claimed that when he was going through the sacrificial trials of fleeing the black hypocrites from city to city, Allah had often sent him visions of great audiences who would one day hear the teachings. And Mr. Muhammad said the visions also buoyed him when he was locked up for years in the white man's prison. The great audience's restless whisperings would cease. At the microphone would be the nation's national secretary, John Ali, or the Boston Temple Minister, Louis X. They enlivened the all-black atmosphere, speaking of the new world open to the black man through the nation of Islam. Sister Tynetta Dynia would speak beautifully of the Muslim women's powerful, vital contributions, of the Muslim women's roles in our nation's efforts to raise the physical, mental, moral, social, and political condition of America's black people. Next, I would come to the microphone, specifically to condition the audience to hear Mr. Muhammad, who had flown from Chicago to teach us all in person. I would raise up my hand. as alaikum salam wa alaikum salam it was a roared response from the great audience's Muslim seating section. There was a general pattern that I would follow on these occasions. My black brothers and sisters, of all religious beliefs, or of no religious beliefs, we all have in common the greatest binding tie we could have. We all are black people. I'm not going to take all day telling you some of the greatnesses of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm just going to tell you now his greatest greatness. He is the first, the only black leader to identify to you and me who is our enemy. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the first black leader among us with the courage to tell us out here in public something which when you begin to think of it back in your homes you will realize we black people have been living with, we have been seeing, we have been suffering all of our lives. Our enemy is the white man. And why is Mr. Muhammad's teaching us this such a great thing? Because when you know who your enemy is, he can no longer keep you divided and fighting one brother against the other. Because when you recognize who your enemy is, he can no longer use trickery, promises, lies, hypocrisy, and his evil acts to keep you deaf, dumb, and blinded. When you recognize who your enemy is, he can no longer brainwash you. He can no longer pull wool over your eyes so that you never stop to see that you are living in pure hell on this earth while he lives in pure heaven right on this same earth. This enemy who tells you that you are both supposed to be worshipping the same white Christian God that you are told stands for the same things for all men. Oh yes, that devil is our enemy. I'll prove it. Pick up any daily newspaper. Read the false charges leveled against our beloved religious leader. It only points up the fact that the Caucasian race never wants any black man who is not their puppet or parrot to speak for our people. This Caucasian devil's slave master does not want or trust us to leave him, yet when we stay here among him, he continues to keep us at the very lowest level of his society. The white man has always loved it when he could keep us black men tucked away somewhere, always out of sight, around the corner. The white man has always loved the kind of black leaders whom he could ask, well, how's things with your people up there? 
But because Mr. Elijah Muhammad takes an uncompromising stand with the white man, the white man hates him. When you hear the white man hate him, you too, because you don't understand biblical prophecy, wrongly label Mr. Muhammad as a racist, a hate teacher, or of being anti-white and teaching black supremacy. The audience suddenly would begin a rustling of turning. Mr. Muhammad would be rapidly moving along up a center aisle from the rear, as once he had entered our humble little mosques. This man, whom we regarded as Islam's gentle, meek, brown-skinned lamb, stalwart, striding, close-cropped, Hand-picked fruit of Islam guards were a circle surrounding him. He carried his holy Bible, his holy Koran. The small dark pillbox atop his head was gold-embroidered with Islam's flag, the sun, moon, and stars. The Muslims were crying out their adoration and their welcome. Little lamb, assalaikum salam, praise be to Allah. Tears would be in more eyes than mine. He had rescued me when I was a convict. Mr. Muhammad had trained me in his home as if I was his son. I think that my life's peaks of emotion, until recently at least, were when suddenly the fruit of Islam guards would stop stiffly at attention, and the platform's several steps would be mounted alone by Mr. Muhammad, and his ministers, including me, sprang around him, embracing him, wringing both his hands. I would turn right back to the microphone, not to keep waiting those world's biggest black audiences who had come to hear him. My black brothers and sisters, no one will know who we are until we know who we are. We never will be able to go anywhere until we know where we are. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is giving us a true identity and a true position, the first time they have ever been known to the American black man. You can be around this man and never dream from his actions the power and the authority he has. Behind me, believe me when I tell you, I could feel Mr. Muhammad's power. He does not display and parade his power, but no other black leader in America has followers who will lay down their lives if he says so. And I don't mean all of this non-violent, begging the white man kind of dying, all of this sitting in, sliding in, wading in, eating in, diving in, and all the rest. My black brothers and sisters, you have come from your homes to hear. Now you are going to hear America's wisest black man, America's boldest black man, America's most fearless black man, this wilderness of North America's most powerful black man. Mr. Muhammad would come quickly to the stand, looking out over the vacuum-quiet audience, his gentle-looking face set for just a fleeting moment. Then, Assalaikum Salam, Wa Alaikum Salam. The Muslims roared it as they settled to listen. From experience, they knew that for the next two hours, Mr. Muhammad would wield his two-edged sword of truth. In fact, every Muslim worried that he overtaxed himself in the length of his speeches, considering his bronchial, asthmatic condition. I don't have a degree like many of you out there before me have, but history don't care anything about your degrees. The white man, he has filled you with the fear of him from ever since you were little black babies. So over you is the greatest enemy a man can have. And that is fear. I know some of you are afraid to listen to the truth. You've been raised on fear and lies. But I'm going to preach to you the truth until you are free of that fear. Your slave master, he brought you over here. And of your past, everything was destroyed. Today you do not know your true language. What tribe are you from? You would not recognize your tribe's name if you heard it. You don't know nothing about your true culture. You don't even know your family's real name. You are wearing a white man's name the white slave master who hates you. You are a people who think you know all about the Bible and all about Christianity. You even are foolish enough to believe that nothing is right but Christianity. You are the planet Earth's only group of people ignorant of yourself, ignorant of your own kind, of your true history, ignorant of your enemy. You know nothing at all but what your white slave master has chosen to tell you. And he has told you only that which will benefit himself and his own kind. He has taught you for his benefit that you are a neutral, shiftless, helpless, so-called Negro. I say so-called because you are not a Negro. There is no such thing as a race of Negroes. You are members of the Asiatic nation from the tribe of Shabazz. Negro is a false label forced on you by your slave master. He has been pushing things onto you and me and our kind ever since he brought the first slave shipload of us black people here. When Mr. Muhammad paused, the Muslims before him cried out, Little lamb, all praise is due to Allah. Teach, messenger, he would continue. The ignorance we of the black race here in America have, and the self-hatred we have, they are fine examples of what the white slave master has seen fit to teach to us. Do we show the plain common sense, 
like every other people on this planet Earth, to unite among ourselves? No. We are humbling ourselves, sitting in and begging in, trying to unite with the slave master. I don't seem able to imagine any more ridiculous sight. A thousand ways every day the white man is telling you, you can't live here, you can't enter here, you can't eat here, drink here, walk here, work here, you can't ride here, you can't play here, you can't study here. Haven't we yet seen enough to see that he has no plan to unite with you? You have tilled his fields, cooked his food, washed his clothes. You've cared for his wife and children when he was away. In many cases, you have even suckled him at your breast. You have been far and away better Christians than this slave master who taught you his Christianity. You have sweated blood to help him build a country so rich that he can today afford to give away millions even to his enemies. And when those enemies have gotten enough from him to then be able to attack him, you have been his brave soldiers, dying for him. And you've been always his most faithful servant during the so-called peaceful times. And still, this Christian American white man has not got it in him to find the human decency and enough sense of justice to recognize us and accept us, the black people who have done so much for him, as fellow human beings. Yeah, man, mm-hmm, teach, messenger. Yeah, tell him, you right, take your time up there, little messenger. Oh, yes. Others besides the Muslims would be shouting now. We Muslims were less extroverted than Christian Negroes. It would sound now like an old-fashioned camp meeting. So let us, the black people, separate ourselves from this white man slave master who despises us so much. You out here begging him for some so-called integration. But what is this slave master white rapist going about saying? He is saying he won't integrate because black blood will mongrelize his race. He says that. And look at us. Turn around in your seats and look at each other. This slave master white man already has integrated us until you can hardly find among us today any more than a very few who are the black color of our foreparents. God Almighty, the man's right. Teach, messenger. Hear him. Hear him. He has left such a little black in us, Mr. Muhammad would go on, that now he despises us so bad, meaning he despises himself for what he has done to us, that he tells us that legally, if we have got one drop of black blood in us, that means you are all black as far as his laws are concerned. Well, if that's all we've got left, we want to reclaim that one drop Mr. Muhammad's frail strength could be seen to be waning, but he would teach on. So let us separate from this white man, and for the same reason he says, in time to save ourselves from any more integration. Why shouldn't this white man who likes to think and call himself so good and so generous, this white man who finances even his enemies, why shouldn't he subsidize a separate state, a separate territory, for we black people who have been such faithful slaves and servants? a separate territory on which we can lift ourselves out of these white man's slums for us and his bread lines for us and even for those he is complaining that we cost him too much we can do something for ourselves we never have done what we could because we have been brainwashed so well by the slave master white man that we must come to him begging him for everything we want and need after perhaps ninety minutes behind mr muhammad Every minister would have to restrain himself from bolting up to his side to urge him that it was enough. He would be pressing his hands tightly against the edges of the speaker's stand to support himself. We black people don't know what we can do. You never can know what anything can do until it is set free to act by itself. If you have a cat in your house that you pamper and pet, you have to free that cat, set it on its own in the woods before you can see that the cat had it in him to shelter and feed itself. We, the black people here in America, we never have been free to find out what we really can do. We have knowledge and experience to pool to do for ourselves. All of our lives we have farmed. We can grow our own food. We can set up factories to manufacture our own necessities. We can build other kinds of businesses to establish trade and commerce and become independent as other civilized people are. We can throw off our brainwashing and our self-hate and live as brothers together. Some land of our own something for ourselves. Leave this white slave master to himself. Mr. Muhammad always stopped abruptly when he was unable to speak any longer. The standing ovation, a solid wall of sound, would go on unabating. Standing up there, flailing my arms, 
Finally, I could quiet the audiences as Fruit of Islam ushers began to pass along the seating rolls, the large waxed paper buckets we used to take up the collection. I would speak. You know, from what you've just heard, that no white money finances the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his program to advise him and contain him. Mr. Muhammad's program and his followers are not integrated. Mr. Muhammad's program and organization are all black. We are the only black organization that only black people support. These so-called Negro progress organizations, while they insult your intelligence, claiming they are fighting in your behalf to get you the equal rights you are asking for, claiming they are fighting the white man who refuses to give you your rights. Why, the white man supports those organizations. If you belong, you pay your two or three or five dollars a year. But who gives those organizations those two and three and five thousand dollar donations? The white man. He feeds those organizations, so he controls those organizations. He advises them, so he contains them. Use your common sense. Aren't you going to advise and control and contain anyone that you support, like your child? The white man would love to support Mr. Elijah Muhammad, because if Mr. Muhammad had to rely on his support, he could advise Mr. Muhammad. My black brothers and sisters, it is only because your money, black money, supports Mr. Muhammad that he can hold these all-black meetings from city to city, telling us black men the truth. That's why we're asking for your all-black support. Nearly all bills, and far from all one-dollar bills either, filled the waxed buckets. The buckets were swiftly emptied, then refilled, as the fruit of Islam ushers covered the entire audience. The audience atmosphere was almost as if the people had gone limp. The collections always covered the rally expenses, and anything beyond that helped to continue building the nation of Islam. After several big rallies, Mr. Muhammad directed that we would admit the white press. Fruit of Islam men thoroughly searched them, as everyone else was searched, their notebooks, their cameras, camera cases, and whatever else they carried. Later, Mr. Muhammad said that any whites who wanted to hear the truth could attend our public rallies until a small separate section for whites was filled. Most whites who came were students and scholars. I would watch their congealed and reddened faces staring up at Mr. Muhammad. The white man knows that his acts have been those of a devil. I would watch also the faces of the professional black men, the so-called intellectuals who attacked us. They possessed the academic know-how. They possessed the technical and the scientific skills that could help to lead their mass of poor black brothers out of our condition. But all these intellectual and professional black men could seem to think of was humbling themselves and begging, trying to integrate with the so-called liberal white man was telling them, in time, everything's going to work out one day. Just wait and have patience. These intellectual and professional Negroes couldn't use what they knew for the benefit of their own black kind simply because even among themselves they were disunited. United among themselves, united with their own kind, they could have benefited black people all over the world. I would watch the faces of those intellectual and professional Negroes growing grave and set as the truth hit home to them. We were watched. Our telephones were tapped. Still right today, on my home telephone, if I said, I'm going to bomb the Empire State Building, I guarantee you in five minutes it would be surrounded. When I was speaking publicly sometimes, I'd guess which were FBI faces in the audience, or other types of agents. Both the police and the FBI intently and persistently visited and questioned us. I do not fear them, Mr. Muhammad said. I have all that I need. The truth. Many a night I drifted off to sleep, filled with wonder at how the two-edged sword teachings so hurt, confused, concerned, and upset the government full of men trained highly in all of the modern sciences. I felt that it never could have been unless the most learned one, Allah himself, had given the little fourth grade trained messenger something. Black agents were sent to infiltrate us. But the white man's secret spy often proved, first of all, a black man. I can't say all of them, of course. There's no way to know. But some of them, after joining us and hearing, seeing, and feeling the truth for every black man, revealed their roles to us. Some resigned from the white man's agencies and came to work in the nation of Islam. A few kept their jobs to counter-spy, telling us the white man's statements and plans about our nation. This was how we learned that after wanting to know what happened within our temples, the white law agency's second major concern was the thing that I believe still ranks today as a big worry among America's penologists the steadily increasing rate at which black convicts embrace Islam. Generally, while still in prison, our convict converts preconditioned themselves to meet our nation's moral laws, as it had happened with me 
when they left prison, they entered a temple fully qualified to become registered Muslims. In fact, convict converts usually were better prepared than were numerous prospective Muslims who never had been inside a prison. We were not nearly so easy to enter as a Christian church. One did not merely declare himself a follower of Mr. Muhammad, then continue leading the same old sinful, immoral life. The Muslim first had to change his physical and moral self to meet our strict rules. To remain a Muslim, he had to maintain those rules. Few temple meetings were held, for instance, without the minister looking down upon some freshly shaved, bald domes of new Muslim brothers in the audience. They had just banished from their lives forever that phony, lie count, metallic-looking hair, or the process, as some call it these days. It grieves me that I don't care where you go. You see this symbol of ignorance and self-hate on so many Negroes' heads. I know it's bound to hurt the feelings of some of my good count non-Muslim friends. But if you study closely any count or process Negro, you usually find he is an ignorant Negro. Whatever show or front he affects, his hair lie cooked to be white-looking, fairly shouts to everyone who looks at his head, I'm ashamed to be a Negro. He will discover, just as I did, that he will be much improved mentally whenever he discovers enough black self-pride to have that mess clipped off and then wear the natural hair that God gives black men to wear. No Muslim smokes. That was another of our rules. Some prospective Muslims found it more difficult to quit tobacco than others found quitting the dope habit. But black men and women quit more easily when we got them to consider seriously how the white man's government cared less about the public's health than about continuing the tobacco industry's billions in tax revenue. What does a serviceman pay for a carton of cigarettes? A prospective Muslim convert would be asked. It helped him to see that every regularly priced carton he bought meant that the white man's government took around two dollars of a black man's hard-earned money for taxes, not for tobacco. You may have read somewhere, a lot has been written concerning it, about the Nation of Islam's phenomenal record of dope addiction cures of long-time junkies. In fact, the New York Times carried a story about how some of the social agencies have asked representatives of the Muslim program for clinical suggestions. The Muslim program began with recognizing that color and addiction have a distinct connection. It is no accident that in the entire Western Hemisphere, the greatest localized concentration of addicts is in Harlem. Our cure program's first major ingredient was the painfully patient work of Muslims who previously were junkies themselves. In the ghetto's dope jungle, the Muslim ex-junkies would fish out addicts who knew them back in those days. Then, with an agonizing patience that might span anywhere from a few months to a year, our ex-junkie Muslims would conduct the addicts through the Muslim six-point therapeutic process. The addict first was brought to admit to himself that he was an addict. Secondly, he was taught why he used narcotics. Third, he was shown that there was a way to stop addiction. Fourth, the addict's shattered self-image and ego were built up until the addict realized that he had within the self-power to end his addiction. Fifth, the addict voluntarily underwent a cold turkey break with drugs. Sixth, finally cured, now an ex-addict completes the cycle by fishing up other addicts whom he knows and supervising their salvaging. This sixth stage always instantly eliminated what so often defeats the average social agencies, the characteristic addict's hostility and suspicion. The addict who has fished up knew personally that the Muslim approaching him very recently had the same $15 to $30 a day habit. The Muslim may be this addict's buddy. They had plied the same dope jungle. They even may have been thieves together. The addict had seen the Muslim drifting off to sleep leaning against a building or stepping as high over a matchstick as if it were a dog. And the Muslim approaching the addict uses the same old junky jungle language. Like the alcoholic, the junkie can never start to cure himself until he recognizes and accepts his true condition. The Muslim sticks like a leech, drumming at his old junky buddy. You're hooked, man. It might take months before the addict comes to grips with this. The curative program is never really underway until this happens. The next cure phase is the addict's realization of why he takes dope. Still working on his man, right in the old jungle locale, in dives that you wouldn't believe existed, the Muslim often collects audiences of a dozen junkies. They listen only because they know the clean-cut, proud Muslim had earlier been like them. Every addict takes junk to escape something, the Muslim explains. He explains that most black junkies really are trying to narcotize themselves against being a black man in the white man's America. 
But actually, the Muslim says, the black man taking dope is only helping the white man to prove that the black man is nothing. The Muslim talks confidentially and straight. Daddy, you know I know how you feel. Wasn't I right out here with you? Scratching like a monkey, smelling all bad, living mad, hungry, stealing and running and hiding from Whitey? Man, what's a black man buying Whitey's dope for but to make Whitey richer? Killing yourself. The Muslim can tell when his quarry is ready to be shown that the way for him to quit dope is through joining the nation of Islam. The addict is brought into the local Muslim restaurant. They may occasionally be exposed to some other social situations, among proud, clean Muslims who show each other mutual affection and respect instead of the familiar hostility of the ghetto streets. For the first time in years, the addict hears himself called genuinely brother, sir, and mister. No one cares about his past. His addiction may casually be mentioned, but if so, it is spoken of as merely an especially tough challenge that he must face. Everyone whom this addict meets is confident that he will kick his habit. As the addict's new image of himself builds, inevitably he begins thinking that he can break the habit. For the first time, he is feeling the effects of black self-pride. That's a powerful combination for a man who has been existing in the mud of society. In fact, once he is motivated, no one can change more completely than the man who has been at the bottom. I call myself the best example of that. Finally, vitally, this addict will decide for himself that he wants to go on cold turkey. This means to endure the physical agonies of abruptly quitting dope. When this time comes, ex-addict Muslims will arrange to spend the necessary days in around-the-clock shifts, attending the addict who intends to purge himself on the way to becoming a Muslim. When the addict's withdrawal sets in, and he is screaming, cursing, and begging, just one shot, man, the Muslims are right there talking junky jargon to him. Baby, knock that monkey off your back. Kick that habit. Kick quite off your back. The addict, writhing in pain, his nose and eyes running, is pouring sweat from head to foot. He's trying to knock his head against the wall, flailing his arms, trying to fight his attendants. He is vomiting, suffering diarrhea. Don't hold nothing back. Let Whitey go, baby. You're going to stand tall, man. I can see you now in the food of Islam. When the awful ordeal is ended, when the grip of dope is broken, the Muslims comfort the weak ex-addict, feeding him soups and broths to get him on his feet again. He will never forget these brothers who stood by him during this time. He will never forget that it was the Nation of Islam's program which rescued him from the special hell of dope. And that black brother, or the sister whom Muslim sisters attend, rarely ever will return to the use of narcotics. Instead, the ex-addict, when he is proud, clean, renewed, can scarcely wait to hit the same junky jungle he was in to fish out somebody and salvage him. If some white man, or approved black man, created a narcotics cure program as successful as the one conducted under the aegis of the Muslims, why, there would be government subsidy and praise and spotlights and headlines. But we were attacked instead. Why shouldn't the Muslims be subsidized to save millions of dollars a year for the government and the cities? I don't know what addicts' crimes cost nationally, but it is said to be billions a year in New York City. An estimated $12 million a year is lost to thieves in Harlem alone. An addict doesn't work to supply his habit, which may cost anywhere from 10 to $50 a day. How could he earn that much? No, the addict steals. He hustles in other ways. He preys upon other human beings like a hawk or a vulture, as I did. Very likely as a school dropout, the same as I was. An army reject, psychologically unsuited to a job even if he was offered one, the same as I was. Women addicts boost, shoplift, or they prostitute themselves. Muslim sisters talk hard to black prostitutes who are struggling to quit using dope in order to qualify morally to become registered Muslims. You are helping the white man to regard your body as a garbage can. Numerous exposés of the Nation of Islam have implied that Mr. Muhammad's followers were chiefly ex-cons and junkies. In the early years, yes, the converts from society's lowest levels were a sizable part of the nation's broad base of membership. Always, Mr. Muhammad instructed us, go after the black man in the mud. Often, he said, those converted made the best Muslims. But gradually, we recruited other black people, the good Christians whom we fished from their churches. Then an increase began in the membership percentage of educated and trained Negroes. For each rally attracted to the local temple a few more of that particular city's so-called middle-class Negroes, the type who previously had scoffed at us black Muslims as demagogues and hate teachers, black racists, and all the rest of the names. The Muslim truths listened to, thought about, reaped for us a growing quota of young black men and women. For those with training and talents, the nation of Islam had plenty of positions where those abilities were needed. 
There were some registered Muslims who would never reveal their membership except to other Muslims because of their positions in the white man's world. There were, I know, a few who because of their positions were known only to their ministers and to Mr. Elijah Muhammad. In 1961, our nation flourished. Our newspaper, Muhammad Speaks, full back page carried an architect's drawing of a $20 million Islamic center proposed to be built in Chicago. Every Muslim was making personal financial contribution toward the center. It would include a beautiful mosque, school, library, and hospital, and a museum documenting the black man's glorious history. Mr. Muhammad visited the Muslim countries, and upon his return, he directed that we would begin calling our temples mosques. There was a sharp climb now, too, in the number of Muslim-owned small businesses. Our businesses sought to demonstrate to the black people what black people could do for themselves if they would only unify, trade with each other, exclusively where possible, and hire each other, and in so doing keep black money within the black communities just as other minorities did. Recordings of Mr. Muhammad's speeches were now regularly being broadcast across America over small radio stations. In Detroit and Chicago, school-age Muslim children attended our two universities of Islam, through high school in Chicago and through junior high in Detroit. Starting from kindergarten, they learned of the black man's glorious history, and from the third grade, they studied the black man's original language, Arabic. Mr. Muhammad's eight children now were all deeply involved in key capacities in the nation of Islam. I took a deep personal pride in having had something to do with that, at least in some cases, years before. When Mr. Muhammad had sent me out in his service as a minister, I began to feel it was a shame that his children worked as some of them then did for the white man in factories, construction work, driving taxis, things like that. I felt that I should work for Mr. Muhammad's family as sincerely as I worked for him. I urged Mr. Muhammad to let me put on a special drive within our few small mosques to raise funds which would enable those of his children working for the white man to be instead employed within our nation. Mr. Muhammad agreed. The special fund drive did prove successful, and his children gradually did begin working for the nation. Emmanuel, the oldest, today runs the dry cleaning plant. Sister Ethel Muhammad Sharif is the Muslim sister's supreme instructor. Her husband, Raymond Sharif, is supreme captain of the Fruit of Islam. Sister Lati Muhammad supervises the two universities of Islam. Nathaniel Muhammad assists Emmanuel in the dry cleaning plant. Herbert Muhammad now publishes Muhammad Speaks, the nation's newspaper that I began. Elijah Muhammad Jr. is the Fruit of Islam Assistant Supreme Captain. Wallace Muhammad was the Philadelphia Mosque Minister until finally he was suspended from the nation along with me, for reasons I will go into. The youngest child, Akbar Muhammad, the family student, attends the University of Cairo at El Azhar. Akbar also has broken with his father. I believe that it was too strenuous a marathon of long speeches that Mr. Muhammad made at our big rallies which abruptly badly aggravated his long bothersome bronchial asthmatic condition. Just in conversation, Mr. Muhammad would suddenly begin coughing, and the coughing temper would increase until it racked his slight body. Mr. Muhammad almost doubled up sometimes. Soon he had to take to his bed. As hard as he tried not to, as deeply as it grieved him, he had to cancel several long scheduled appearances at big city rallies. End of Side 7 Side 8 the Autobiography of Malcolm X, continuing on page 264. Thousands were disappointed to have to hear me instead, or other poor substitutes for Mr. Muhammad in person. Members of the nation were deeply concerned. Doctors recommended a dry climate. The nation bought Mr. Muhammad a home in Phoenix, Arizona. One of the first times I visited Mr. Muhammad there, I stepped off a plane into flashing and whirring cameras until I wondered who was behind me. Then I saw the cameraman's guns. They were from the Arizona Intelligence Division. The wire of our nation of Islam brought all Muslims the joyful news that the Arizona climate did vastly relieve the messenger's suffering. Since then he has spent most of each year in Phoenix. Despite the fact that Mr. Muhammad, convalescing, could no longer work the daily long hours he had previously worked in Chicago, he was now more than ever burdened with heavy decision-making and administrative duties. In every respect the nation was expanded both internally and externally. Mr. Muhammad simply could no longer allot as much time as previously to considering and deciding which public speaking, radio, and television requests he felt I should accept, as well as to some organizational matters which I had always brought to him for advice or decision. Mr. Muhammad evidenced the depth of his trust in me. In those areas I have described, he told me to make the decisions myself. He said that my guidelines should be whatever I felt was wise, whatever was in the general good interests of our nation of Islam. Brother Malcolm... I want you to become well known, Mr. Muhammad told me one day, because if you are well known, it will make me better known, he went on. But Brother Malcolm, 
there is something you need to know. You will grow to be hated when you become well known, because usually people get jealous of public figures. Nothing that Mr. Muhammad ever said to me was more pathetic. Chapter 15 Icarus The more places I represented Mr. Muhammad on television and radio and at colleges and elsewhere, the more letters came from people who had heard me. I'd say that 95% of the letters were from white people. Only a few of the letters fell into the Dear Nigger X category or the Death Threats. Most of my mail exposed to me the white man's two major dreads. The first one was his own private belief that God wrathfully is going to destroy this civilization. And the white man's second most pervading dread was his image of the black man entering the body of the white woman. An amazing percentage of the white letter writers agreed entirely with Mr. Muhammad's analysis of the problem, but not with his solution. One odd ambivalence was how some letters, otherwise all but championing Mr. Muhammad, would recoil at the expression, white devils. I tried to explain this in subsequent speeches. Unless we call one white man by name a devil, we are not speaking of any individual white man. We are speaking of the collective white man's historical record. We are speaking of the collective white man's cruelties and evils and greeds that have seen him act like a devil toward the non-white man. Any intelligent, honest, objective person cannot fail to realize that this white man's slave trade and his subsequent devilish actions are directly responsible for not only the presence of this black man in America, but also for the condition in which we find this black man here. You cannot find one black man, I do not care who he is, who has not been personally damaged in some way by the devilish acts of the collective white man. Nearly every day some attack on the black Muslims would appear in some newspapers. Increasingly a focal target was something that I had said. Malcolm X as a demagogue. I would go furious reading any harsh attack upon Mr. Muhammad. I didn't care what they said about me. Those social workers and sociologists, they tried to take me apart, especially the black ones for some reason. Of course I knew the reason. The white man signed their paychecks. If I wasn't polarizing the community, according to this bunch, I had erroneously appraised the racial picture, or in some statement I had overgeneralized, or when I had made some absolutely true point Malcolm X conveniently manipulated. Once one of my Mosque 7 Muslim brothers who worked with teenagers in a well-known Harlem community center showed me a confidential report. Some black senior social worker had been given a month off to investigate the black Muslims in the Harlem area. Every paragraph sent me back to the dictionary. I guess that's why I've never forgotten one line about me. Listen to this. The dynamic interstices of the Harlem subculture have been oversimplified and distorted by Malcolm X to meet his own needs. Which of us, I wonder, knew more about that Harlem ghetto subculture? I, who had hustled for years in those streets, or that black snob status symbol educated social worker? But that's not important. What's important to my way of thinking about it is that among America's 22 million black people, so relatively few have been lucky enough to attend a college. And here was one of those who had been lucky. Here was, to my way of thinking, one of those educated Negroes who never had understood the true intent or purpose or application of education. It was one of those stagnant educations, never used except for parading a lot of big words. Do you realize this is one of the major reasons why America's white man has so easily contained and oppressed America's black man? Because until just lately, among the few educated Negroes, scarcely any applied their education, as I am forced to say the white man does, in searching and creative thinking to further themselves and their own kind in this competitive, materialistic, dog-eat-dog, white man's world. For generations, the so-called educated Negroes have led their black brothers by echoing the white man's thinking, which naturally has been to the exploit of white man's advantage. The white man, give him his due, has an extraordinary intelligence, an extraordinary cleverness. His world is full of proof of it. You can't name a thing the white man can't make. You can hardly name a scientific problem he can't solve. Here he is now solving the problems of sending men exploring into outer space and returning them safely to Earth. But in the arena of dealing with human beings, the white man's working intelligence is hobbled. His intelligence will fail him altogether if the humans happen to be non-white. The white man's emotions superseded his intelligence. He will commit against non-whites the most incredible spontaneous emotional acts. So psyche-deep is his white superiority complex. Where was the A-bomb dropped to save American lives? Can the white man be so naive as to think the clear import of this ever will be lost upon the non-white two-thirds of the Earth's population? Before that bomb was dropped, right over here in the United States, 
What about the 100,000 loyal, naturalized, and native-born Japanese-American citizens who were herded into camps behind barbed wire? But how many German-born naturalized Americans were herded behind barbed wire? They were white. Historically, the non-white complexion has evoked and exposed the devil in the very nature of the white man. What else but a controlling, emotional devil so blinded American white intelligence that it couldn't foresee that millions of black slaves, freed, then permitted even limited education, would one day rise up as a terrifying monster within white America's midst? The white man's brains that today explore space should have told the slave master that any slave, if he is educated, will no longer fear his master. History shows that an educated slave always begins to ask and next demand equality with his master. Today, in many ways, the black man sees the collective white man in America better than that white man can see himself. And the 22 million blacks realize increasingly that physically, politically, economically, and even to some degree socially, the aroused black man can create a turmoil in white America's vitals, not to mention America's international image. I'm not intended to stray off. I've been telling how in 1963 I was trying to cope with the white newspaper, radio, and television reporters who were determined to defeat Mr. Muhammad's teachings. I developed a mental image of reporters as human ferrets, steadily sniffing, darting, probing for some way to trick me, somehow to corner me in our interview exchanges. Let some civil rights leader make some statement displeasing to the white public power structure, and the reporters, in an effort to whip him back into line, would try to use me. I'll give an example. I'd get a question like this. Mr. Malcolm X, you've often gone on record as disapproving of the sit-ins and similar Negro protest actions. What is your opinion of the Montgomery boycott that Dr. King is leading? Now, my feeling was that although the civil rights leaders kept attacking us Muslims, still they were black people, still they were our own kind, and I would be most foolish to let the white man maneuver me against the civil rights movement. When I was asked about the Montgomery boycott, I'd carefully review what led up to it. Mrs. Rosa Parks was riding home on a bus, and at some bus stop, the white cracker bus driver ordered Mrs. Parks to get up and give her a seat to some white passenger who had just got on the bus. I'd say, now just imagine that. This good, hard-working, Christian-believing black woman, she's paid her money, she's in her seat, just because she's black, she's asked to get up. I mean, sometimes even for me, it's hard to believe the white man's arrogance. Or I might say, no one will ever know exactly what emotional ingredient made this relatively trivial incident a fuse for those Montgomery Negroes. There had been centuries of the worst kind of outrages against southern black people, lynchings, rapings, shootings, beatings. But you know, history has been triggered by trivial-seeming incidents. Once a little nobody Indian lawyer was put off a train and fed up with injustice, he twisted a knot in the British lion's tail. His name was Mahatma Gandhi. Or I might copy a trick I'd seen lawyers use, both in life and on television. It was the way that lawyers would slip in before a jury something otherwise inadmissible. Sometimes I think I really might have made it as a lawyer, as I once told that eighth grade teacher in Mason, Michigan, I wanted to be when he advised me to become a carpenter. I would slide right over the reporter's question to drop into his lap a logical extension, hot potato for him. Well, sir, I see the same boycott reasoning for Negroes asked to join the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Why should we go off to die somewhere to preserve a so-called democracy that gives a white immigrant of one day more than it gives the black man with 400 years of slaving and serving in this country? Whites would prefer 50 local boycotts to having 22 million Negroes start thinking about what I had just said. I don't have to tell you that it never got printed the way I said it. It would be turned inside out if it got printed at all. And I could detect when the white reporters had gotten their heads together. They quit asking me certain questions. If I'd developed a good point, though, I'd bait a hook to get it said when I went on radio or television. I'd seem to slip and mention some recent so-called civil rights advance. You know, where some giant industry had hired ten showpiece Negroes. Some restaurant chain had begun making more money by serving Negroes. Some southern university had enrolled a black freshman without bayonets. Like that. When I slipped... The program host would leap on that bait. Ah, indeed, Mr. Malcolm X, you can't deny that's an advance for your race. I jerked the pole then. I can't turn around without hearing about some civil rights advance. White people seem to think the black man ought to be shouting hallelujah. 
four hundred years the white man has had his foot-long knife in the black man's back, and now the white man starts to wiggle the knife out maybe six inches, the black man's supposed to be grateful? Why, if the white man jerked the knife out, it's still going to leave a scar. Similarly, just let some mayor or some city council somewhere boast of having no Negro problem. That would get off the newsroom teletypes, and it would soon be jammed right in my face. I'd say they didn't need to tell me where this was because I knew that all it meant was that relatively very few Negroes were living there. That's true the world over, you know. Take democratic England. When 100,000 black West Indians got there, England stopped the black migration. Finland welcomed a Negro U.S. ambassador. Well, let enough Negroes follow him to Finland. Or in Russia, when Khrushchev was in power. He threatened to cancel the visas of black African students whose anti-discrimination demonstration said to the world, Russia, too. The deep south white press generally blacked me out. But they front-paged what I felt about northern white and black freedom riders going south to demonstrate. I called it ridiculous. Their own northern ghettos right at home had enough rats and roaches to kill to keep all of the freedom riders busy. I said that ultra-liberal New York had more integration problems than Mississippi. If the northern freedom riders wanted more to do, they could work on the roots of such ghetto evils as the little children out in the streets at midnight, with apartment keys on strings around their necks to let themselves in, and their mothers and fathers drunk, drug addicts, thieves, prostitutes. Or the northern freedom riders could light some fires under northern city halls, unions, and major industries to give more jobs to Negroes to remove so many of them from the relief and welfare roles, which created laziness, and which deteriorated the ghettos into steadily worse places for humans to live. It was all... It is all, the absolute truth. But what did I want to say it for? Snakes couldn't have turned on me faster than the liberal. Yes, I will pull off that liberal's halo that he spends such efforts cultivating. The North's liberals have been for so long pointing accusing fingers at the South and getting away with it that they have fits when they are exposed as the world's worst hypocrites. I believe my own life mirrors this hypocrisy. I know nothing about the South. I am a creation of the northern white man and of his hypocritical attitude toward the Negro. The white southerner was always given his due by Mr. Muhammad. The white southerner, you can say one thing. He is honest. He bears his teeth to the black man. He tells the black man to his face that southern whites never will accept phony integration. The southern white goes further to tell the black man that he means to fight him every inch of the way against even the so-called tokenism. The advantage of this is the southern black man never has been under any illusions about the opposition he is dealing with. You can say for many southern white people that, individually, they have been paternalistically helpful to many individual Negroes. But the northern white man, he grins with his teeth, and his mouth has always been full of tricks and lies of equality and integration. When one day all over America a black hand touched the white man's shoulder, and the white man turned... And there stood the Negro saying, Me too. Why, that northern liberal shrank from that black man with as much guilt and dread as any southern white man. Actually, America's most dangerous and threatening black man is the one who has been kept sealed up by the northerner in the black ghettos. The northern white power structure system to keep talking democracy while keeping the black man out of sight somewhere, around the corner. The word integration was invented by a northern liberal. The word has no real meaning. I ask you, in the racial sense in which it's used so much today, whatever integration is supposed to mean, can it precisely be defined? The truth is that integration is an image. It's a foxy northern liberal smokescreen that confuses the true wants of the American black man. Here in these 50 racist and neo-racist states of North America, this word integration has millions of white people confused and angry, believing wrongly that the black masses want to live mixed up with the white man. That is the case only with the relative handful of these integration-mad Negroes. I'm talking about these token integrated Negroes who flee from their poor downtrodden black brothers from their own self-hate which is what they're really trying to escape I'm talking about these Negroes you will see who can't get enough of nuzzling up to the white man these chosen few Negroes are more white minded more anti-black than even the white man is human rights respect as human beings that's what America's black masses want that's the true problem the black masses want not to be shrunk from as though they are plague-ridden. They want not to be walled up in slums, in the ghettos, like animals. They want to live in an open, free society where they can walk with their heads up like men and women. 
Few white people realize that many black people today dislike and avoid spending any more time than they must around white people. This integration image, as it is popularly interpreted, has millions of vain, self-exalted white people convinced that black people want to sleep in bed with them. And that's a lie. Or you can't tell the average white man that the Negro man's prime desire isn't to have a white woman. Another lie. Like a black brother recently observed to me, Look, you ever smell one of them wet? The black masses prefer the company of their own kind. Why, even these fancy bourgeois Negroes, when they get back home from the fancy integrated cocktail parties, what do they do but kick off their shoes and talk about those white liberals they just left as if the liberals were dogs? And the white liberals probably do the very same thing. I can't be sure about the whites. I'm never around them in private. But the bourgeois Negroes know I'm not lying. I'm telling it like it is. You never have to worry about me biting my tongue if something I know as truth is on my mind. Raw, naked truth exchanged between the black man and the white man is what a whole lot more of is needed in this country. To clear the air of the racial mirages, clichés, and lies that this country's very atmosphere has been filled with for 400 years. In many communities, especially small communities, white people have created a benevolent image of themselves as having had so much good will toward our Negroes. Every time any local Negro begins suddenly letting the local whites know the truth, that the black people are sick of being hind, tit, second class, disfranchised. That's when you hear uttered so sadly. Unfortunately now, because of this, our whites of goodwill are starting to turn against the Negroes. It's so regrettable. Progress was being made, but now our communications between the races have broken down. What are they talking about? There never was any communication. Until after World War II, there wasn't a single community in the entire United States where the white man heard from any local Negro leaders the truth of what Negroes felt about the conditions that the white community imposed upon Negroes. You need some proof? Well, then, why was it that when Negroes did start revolting across America, virtually all of white America was caught up in surprise and even shock? I would hate to be general of an army as badly informed as the American white man has been about the Negro in this country. This is the situation which permitted Negro combustion to slowly build up to the revolution point without the white man realizing it. All over America, the local Negro leader, in order to survive as a leader, kept reassuring the local white man, in effect, everything's all right, everything's right in hand, boss. When the leader wanted a little something for his people, uh, boss, some of the people talking about, we sure need a better school, boss. And if the local Negroes hadn't been causing any trouble, the benevolent white man might nod and give them a school or some jobs. The white men belonging to the power structures in thousands of communities across America know that I'm right. They know that I'm describing what has been the true pattern of communications between the local whites of goodwill and the local Negroes. It has been a pattern created by domineering, ego-ridden whites. Its characteristic design permitted the white man to feel noble about throwing crumbs to the black man, instead of feeling guilty about the local community system of cruelly exploiting Negroes. But I want to tell you something. This pattern, this system that the white man created of teaching Negroes to hide the truth from him behind a facade of grinning, yes sir, bossing, foot shuffling and head scratching, that system has done the American white man more harm than an invading army would do to him. Why do I say this? Because all this has steadily helped this American white man to build up deep in his psyche absolute conviction that he is superior. And how many, many communities have thus white men who didn't finish high school regarded condescendingly university-educated local Negro leaders, principals of schools, teachers, doctors, other professionals. The white man system has been imposed upon non-white peoples all over the world. This is exactly the reason why wherever people who are anything but white live in this world today, the white man's governments are finding themselves in deeper and deeper trouble and peril. Let's just face truth. Fact. Whether or not the white man of the world is able to face truth and facts about the true reasons for his troubles, that's what essentially will determine whether or not he will now survive. Today we are seeing this revolution of the non-white peoples, who just a few years ago would have frozen in horror at the mighty white nation so much as lifted an eyebrow. What it is, simply, is that black and brown and red and yellow peoples have, after hundreds of years of exploitation and imposed inferiority and general misuse, become 
finally do or die sick and tired of the white man's heel on their necks. How can the white American government figure on selling democracy and brotherhood to non-white peoples if they read and hear every day what's going on right here in America and see the better than a thousand words photographs of the American white man denying democracy and brotherhood even to America's native-born non-whites? The world's non-whites know how this Negro here has loved the American white man and slaved for him, tended to him, nursed him. This Negro has jumped into uniform and gone off and died when this America was attacked by enemies, both white and non-white. Such a faithful, loyal, non-white as this? And still, America bombs him and sets dogs on him and turns fire hoses on him and jails him by the thousands and beats him bloody and inflicts upon him all manner of other crimes. Of course, these things known and refreshed every day for the rest of the world's non-whites, are a vital factor in these burnings of ambassadors' limousines, these stonings, defilings, and wreckings of embassies and legations, these shouts of, white man, go home, these attacks on white Christian missionaries, and these bombings and tearing down of flags. Is it clear why I have said that the American white man's malignant superiority complex has done him more harm than an invading army? The American black man should be focusing his every effort toward building his own businesses and decent homes for himself. As other ethnic groups have done, let the black people, wherever possible, however possible, patronize their own kind, hire their own kind, and start in those ways to build up the black race's ability to do for itself. That's the only way the American black man is ever going to get respect. One thing the white man never can give the black man is self-respect. The black man never can become independent and recognized as a human being who is truly equal with other human beings until he has what they have, and until he is doing for himself what others are doing for themselves. The black man in the ghettos, for instance, has to start self-correcting his own material, moral, and spiritual defects and evils. The black man needs to start his own program to get rid of drunkenness, drug addiction, prostitution. The black man in America has to lift up his own sense of values. Only a few thousand Negroes, relatively a very tiny number, are taking any part in integration. Here again, it's those few bourgeois Negroes rushing to throw away their little money in the white man's luxury hotels, his swanky nightclubs and big, fine, exclusive restaurants. The white people patronizing those places can afford it. But these Negroes you see in those places can't afford it. Certainly most of them can't. Why, what does some Negro, one installment payment away from disaster, look like? somewhere downtown out to dine, grinning at some head waiter who has more money than the Negro. Those bourgeois Negroes out draping big tablecloth-sized napkins over their knees and ordering quail under glass and stewed snails. Why, Negroes don't even like snails. What they're doing is proving they're integrated. If you want to get right down to the real outcome of this so-called integration, what you've got to arrive at is intermarriage. I'm right with the southern white man who believes that you can't have so-called integration, at least not for long, without intermarriage increasing. And what good is this for anyone? Let's again face reality. In a world as color hostile as this, man or woman, black or white, what do they want with a mate of the other race? Certainly white people have served enough notice of their hostility to any blacks in their families and neighborhoods, and the way most Negroes feel today, a mixed couple probably finds that black families, black communities, are even more hostile than white ones. So what's bound to face integrated marriages, except being unwelcomed, unwanted, misfits in whichever world they try to live in. What we arrive at is that integration socially is no good for either side. Integration ultimately would destroy the white race and destroy the black race. The white man's integrating with black women has already changed the complexion and characteristics of the black race in America. What's been proved by the blacks whose complexions are whiter than many white people? I'm told that there are in America today between two and five million white Negroes who are passing in white society. Imagine their torture, living in constant fear that some black person they have known might meet and expose them. Imagine every day living a lie. Imagine hearing their own white husbands, their own white wives, even their own white children talking about those Negroes. I would doubt if anyone in America has heard Negroes more bitter against the white man than some of those I have heard. But I will tell you that without any question, the most bitter anti-white diatribes that I have ever heard have come from passing Negroes, living as whites, among whites, exposed every day to what white people say among themselves regarding Negroes, things that a recognized Negro never would hear. 
Why, if there was a racial showdown, these Negroes passing within white circles would become the black side's most valuable spy and ally. Europe's brown babies, now young men and women who are starting to marry and produce families of their own, have their experiences throughout their lives scarred as racial freaks proved anything positive for integration? Integration is called assimilation if white ethnic groups alone are involved. It's fought against tooth and nail by those who want their heritage preserved. Look at how the Irish threw the English out of Ireland. The Irish knew the English would engulf them. Look at the French Canadians fanatically fighting to keep their identity. In fact, history's most tragic result of a mixed, therefore diluted and weakened ethnic identity has been experienced by a white ethnic group, the Jew in Germany. He had made greater contributions to Germany than Germans themselves had. Jews had won over half of Germany's Nobel Prizes. Every culture in Germany was led by the Jew. He published the greatest newspaper. Jews were the greatest artists, the greatest poets, composers, stage directors. But those Jews made a fatal mistake assimilating. From World War I to Hitler's rise, the Jews in Germany had been increasingly intermarrying. Many changed their names and many took other religions. Their own Jewish religion, their own rich Jewish ethnic and cultural roots, they anesthetized and cut off until they began thinking of themselves as Germans. And the next thing they knew, there was Hitler, rising to power from the beer halls with his emotional Aryan master race theory. And right at hand for a scapegoat was the self-weakened, self-deluded German Jew. Most mysterious is how did those Jews, with all of their brilliant minds, with all of their power in every aspect of Germany's affairs, how did those Jews stand almost as if mesmerized, watching something which did not spring upon them overnight, but which was gradually developed, a monstrous plan for their own murder? Their self-brainwashing had been so complete that not long after, in the gas chambers, a lot of them were still gasping. It can't be true. If Hitler had conquered the world, as he meant to, that is a shuddery thought for every Jew alive today. The Jew never will forget that lesson. Jewish intelligence, eyes, watch every neo-Nazi organization. Right after the war, the Jews Haganah mediating bodies stepped up the long-time negotiations with the British. But this time, the Stern Gang was shooting the British. And this time, the British acquiesced and helped them to wrest Palestine away from the Arabs, the rightful owners, and then the Jews set up Israel, their own country. The one thing that every race of man in the world respects and understands. Not long ago, the black man in America was fed a dose of another form of the weakening, lulling, and deluding effects of so-called integration. It was that farce on Washington, I call it. The idea of a mass of blacks marching on Washington was originally the brainchild of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, A. Philip Randolph. For twenty or more years, the march on Washington idea had floated around among Negroes, and spontaneously, suddenly now, that idea caught on. Overall, rural southern Negroes, small-town Negroes, northern ghetto Negroes, even thousands of previously Uncle Tom Negroes began talking march. Nothing since Joe Lewis had so coalesced the masses of Negroes. Groups of Negroes were talking of getting to Washington any way they could, in rickety old cars, on buses, hitchhiking, walking even if they had to. They envisioned thousands of black brothers converging together upon Washington to lie down in the streets, on airport runways, on government lawns, demanding of the Congress and the White House some concrete civil rights action. This was a national bitterness, militant, unorganized, and leaderless. Predominantly it was young Negroes, defiant of whatever might be the consequences, sick and tired of the black man's neck under the white man's heel. The white man had plenty of good reasons for nervous worry. The right spark, some unpredictable emotional chemistry, could set off a black uprising, the government knew that thousands of milling, angry blacks not only could completely disrupt Washington, but they could erupt in Washington. The White House speedily invited in the major civil rights Negro leaders. They were asked to stop the planned march. They truthfully said they hadn't begun it. They had no control over it. The idea was national, spontaneous, unorganized, and leaderless. In other words, it was a black powder keg. Any student of how integration can weaken the black man's movement was about to observe a master lesson. The White House, with a fanfare of international publicity, approved, endorsed, and welcomed a march on Washington. The big civil rights organizations right at this time have been publicly squabbling about donations. The New York Times had broken the story. 
the NAACP had charged that other agencies' demonstrations, highly publicized, had attracted a major part of the civil rights donations, while the NAACP got left holding the bag, supplying costly bail and legal talent for the other organization's jailed demonstrators. It was like a movie. The next scene was the Big Six Civil Rights Negro Leaders meeting in New York City with the white head of a big philanthropic agency. They were told that their money wrangling in public was damaging their image, and a reported $800,000 was donated to a United Civil Rights Leadership Council that was quickly organized by the Big Six. Now, what had instantly achieved black unity? The white man's money. What string was attached to the money? Advice. Not only was there this donation, but another comparable sum was promised for some time later on, after the march, obviously if all went well. The original angry march in Washington was now about to be entirely changed. Massive international publicity projected the Big Six as March on Washington leaders. It was news to those angry grassroots Negroes steadily adding steam to their march plans. They probably assumed that now those famous leaders were endorsing and joining them. Invited next to join the march were four famous white public figures, one Catholic, one Jew, one Protestant, and one labor boss. The massive publicity now gently hinted that the Big Ten would supervise the march on Washington's mood and its direction. The four white figures began nodding. The word spread fast among so-called liberal Catholics, Jews, Protestants, and laborites. It was democratic to join this black march. And suddenly the previously March-nervous whites began announcing they were going. It was as if electrical current shot through the ranks of bourgeois Negroes. The very so-called middle class and upper class who had earlier been deploring the march in Washington talked by grassroots Negroes. But white people now were going to march. Why, some downtrodden, jobless, hungry Negro might have gotten trampled. Those integration-mad Negroes practically ran over each other trying to find out where to sign up. The angry blacks march suddenly had been made chic. Suddenly it had a Kentucky Derby image, for the status secret was a status symbol. Were you there? You can hear that right today. It had become an outing, a picnic. The morning of the march, any rickety carloads of angry, dusty, sweating, small-town Negroes would have gotten lost among the chartered jet planes, railroad cars, and air-conditioned buses. What originally was planned to be an angry riptide, one English newspaper aptly described now as the gentle flood. Talk about integrated... It was like salt and pepper, and by now there wasn't a single logistics aspect uncontrolled. The marchers had been instructed to bring no signs. Signs were provided. They had been told to sing one song, We Shall Overcome. They had been told how to arrive, when, where to arrive, where to assemble, when to start marching, the route to march. First aid stations were strategically located, even where to faint. Yes, I was there. I observed that circus. Who ever heard of angry revolutionists all harmonizing, we shall overcome some day, while tripping and swaying along arm in arm with the very people they were supposed to be angrily revolting against? Who ever heard of angry revolutionists swinging their bare feet together with their oppressor in lily pad park pools with gospels and guitars and I have a dream speeches? And the black masses in America were, and still are, having a nightmare. These angry revolutionists even followed their final instructions to leave early. With all of those thousands upon thousands of angry revolutionists, so few stayed over that the next morning the Washington Hotel Association reported a costly loss in empty rooms. Hollywood couldn't have topped it. In a subsequent press poll, not one congressman or senator with a previous record of opposition to civil rights said he had changed his views. What did anyone expect? How is a one-day integrated picnic going to counter-influence these representatives of prejudice rooted deep in the psyche of the American white man for 400 years? The very fact that millions, black and white, believed in this monumental farce is another example of how much this country goes in for the surface glossing over, the escape ruse, surfaces, instead of truly dealing with its deep-rooted problems. What that march in Washington did do was lull Negroes for a while. But inevitably, the black masses started realizing that they had been smoothly hoaxed again by the white man. And inevitably, the black man's anger rekindled, deeper than ever, and they began bursting out in different cities in the long, hot summer of 1964, unprecedented racial crises. 
About a month before the farce on Washington, the New York Times reported me, according to its poll conducted on college and university campuses, as the second most sought-after speaker at colleges and universities. The only speaker ahead of me was Senator Barry Goldwater. I believe that what had generated such college popularity for me was Dr. Lincoln's book, The Black Muslims in America. It had been made required reading in numerous college courses. Then a long, candid interview with me was carried by Playboy magazine, whose circulation on college campuses is the biggest of any magazines. And many students, having studied first the book and then the Playboy interview, wanted to hear in person this so-called fiery black Muslim. When the New York Times poll was published, I'd spoken at well over 50 colleges and universities, like Brown, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Rutgers, in the Ivy League, and others throughout the country. Right now, I have invitations from Cornell, Princeton, and probably a dozen others, as soon as my time and their available dates can be scheduled together. Among Negro institutions, I've then been to Atlanta University and Clark College down in Atlanta, to Howard University in Washington, D.C., and to a number of others with small student bodies. Except for all black audiences, I like the college audiences best. The college sessions sometimes ran two to four hours. They often ran overtime. Challenges, queries, and criticisms were fired at me by the usually objective and always alive and searching minds of undergraduate and graduate students and their faculties. The college sessions never failed to be exhilarating. They never failed in helping me to further my own education. I never experienced one college session that didn't show me ways to improve upon my presentation and defense of Mr. Muhammad's teachings. Sometimes in a panel or debate appearance, I find a jam-packed audience to hear me alone facing six or eight student and faculty scholars heads of departments such as sociology, psychology, philosophy, history, and religion, and each of them coming at me in his specialty. At the outset, always I'd confront such panels with something such as, Gentlemen, I finished the eighth grade in Mason, Michigan. My high school was the black ghetto of Roxbury, Massachusetts. My college was in the streets of Harlem, and my master's was taken in prison. Mr. Muhammad has taught me that I never need fear any man's intellect who tries to defend or to justify the white man's criminal record against the non-white man, especially the white man and the black man here in North America. It was like being on a battlefield with intellectual and philosophical bullets. It was an exciting battling with ideas. I got so I could feel my audience's temperaments. I've talked with other public speakers. They agree that this ability is native to any person who has the mass appeal gift who can get through to and move people. It's a psychic radar. As a doctor with his finger against a pulse is able to feel the heart rate, when I'm up there speaking, I can feel the reaction to what I'm saying. I think I could be speaking blindfolded, and after five minutes, I could tell you if sitting out there before me was an all-black or an all-white audience. Black audiences and white audiences feel distinguishably different. Black audiences feel warmer. There's almost a musical rhythm for me, even in their silent response. Question and answer periods are another area where, by now, again blindfolded, I can often tell you the ethnic source of a question. The most easily recognizable of these to me are a Jew in any audience situation and a bourgeois Negro in integrated audiences. My clue to the Jew's question and challenges is that among all other ethnic groups, his expressed thinking, his expressed concerns are the most subjective. And the Jew is usually hypersensitive. I mean, you can't even say Jew without him accusing you of anti-Semitism. I don't care what a Jew is professionally, doctor, merchant, housewife, student, or whatever. First, he or she thinks Jew. Now, of course, I can understand the Jew's hypersensitivity. For 2,000 years, religious and personal prejudice against Jews have been vented and exercised as strong as white prejudices against the non-white. But I know that America's five and a half million Jews two million of them are concentrated in New York, look at it very practically, whether they know it or not, that all of the bigotry and hatred focused upon the black man keeps off the Jew a lot of heat that will be on him otherwise. For an example of what I'm talking about, in every black ghetto, Jews own the major businesses. Every night, the owners of those businesses go home with that black community's money, which helps the ghetto to stay poor. But I doubt that I have ever uttered this absolute truth before an audience without being hotly challenged and accused by a Jew of anti-Semitism. Why? I will bet that I have told 500 such challenges that Jews as a group would never watch some other minority systematically siphoning out their community's resources without doing something about it. I have told them that if I tell the simple truth, it doesn't mean that I am anti-Semitic. It means merely that I am anti-exploitation. The white liberal may be a little taken aback to know that from all Negro audiences, I never have had one challenge, never one question that defended the white man. 
That has been true even when a lot of those black bourgeoisie and integration mad Negroes were among the blacks. All Negroes among themselves admit the white man's criminal record. They may not know as many details as I do, but they know the general picture. But let me tell you something significant. This very same bourgeois Negro, who, among Negroes, would never make a fool of himself in trying to defend the white man, watch that same Negro in a mixed black and white audience, knowing he's overheard by his beloved Mr. Charlie. Why, you should hear those Negroes attack me, trying to justify or forgive the white man's crimes. These Negroes are people who bring me nearest to breaking one of my principal rules, which is never to let myself become over-emotional and angry. Why, sometimes I felt I ought to jump down off that stand and get physical with some of those brainwashed white man's tools, parrots, puppets. At the colleges, I've developed some stock put-downs for them. You must be a law student, aren't you? They have to say either yes or no. And I say, I thought you were. You defend this criminal white man harder than he defends his guilty self. One particular university's token integrated black Ph.D. associate professor I never will forget. He got me so mad I couldn't see straight. As badly as our 22 millions of educationally deprived black people need the help of any brains he has, there he was looking like some fly in the buttermilk among white colleagues, and he was trying to eat me up. He was ranting about what a divisive demagogue and what a reverse racist I was. I was racking my head to spear that fool. Finally, I held up my hand, and he stopped. Do you know what white racists call black PhDs? He said something like, I believe that I happen not to be aware of that, you know, one of these ultra-proper talking Negroes. And I laid the word down on him loud. Nigger. Speaking in these colleges and universities was good for the nation of Islam, I would report to Mr. Muhammad, because the devilish white man's best minds were developed and influenced in the colleges and universities. But for some reason that I could never understand until much later, Mr. Muhammad never really wanted me to speak at these colleges and universities. I was to learn later, from Mr. Muhammad's own sons, that he was envious because he felt unequipped to speak at colleges himself. But nevertheless, on Mr. Muhammad's behalf at this time, I was finding these highly intelligent audiences amazingly open-minded and objective in their receptions of the raw, naked truths that I would tell them. Time and time again, the black, the brown, the red, and the yellow races have witnessed and suffered the white man's small ability to understand the simple notes of the spirit. The white man seems tone-deaf to the total orchestration of humanity. Every day his newspaper's front pages show us the world that he has created. God's wrathful judgment is close upon this white man, stumbling and groping blindly in wickedness and evil and spiritual darkness. Look! Remaining today are only two giant white nations. America and Russia, each of them with mistrustful, nervous satellites. America is propping up most of the remaining white world. The French, the Belgians, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and other white nations have weakened steadily as non-white Asians and Africans have recovered their lands. America is subsidizing what is left of the prestige and strength of the once mighty Britain. The sun has set forever on that monocled, pith-helmeted resident colonialist, sipping tea with his delicate lady in the non-white colonies, being systematically robbed of every valuable resource. Britain's superfluous royalty and nobility now exist by charging tourists to inspect the once baronial castles, and by selling memoirs, perfumes, autographs, titles, and even themselves. The whole world knows that the white man cannot survive another war. If either of the two giant white nations pushes the button, white civilization will die. And we see again that not ideologies, but race and color is what binds human beings. Is it accidental that as red Chinese visit African and Asian countries, Russia and America draw steadily closer to each other? The collective white man's history has left the non-white peoples no alternative either but to draw closer to each other. Characteristically, as always, the devilish white man lacks the moral strength and courage to cast off his arrogance. He wants today to buy friends among the non-whites. He tries characteristically to cover up his past record. He does not possess the humility to admit his guilt, to try and atone for his crimes. The white man has perverted the simple message of love that the prophet Jesus lived and taught when he walked upon this earth. Audiences seemed surprised when I spoke about Jesus. I would explain that we Muslims believe in the prophet Jesus. He was one of the three most important prophets of the religion of Islam, the others being Muhammad and Moses. In Jerusalem, there are Muslim shrines built to the prophet Jesus. I would explain that it was our belief that Christianity did not perform what Christ taught. 
I never fail to cite that even Billy Graham, challenged in Africa, had himself made the distinction. I believe in Christ, not Christianity. I never will forget one little blonde co-ed after I'd spoken at her New England college. She must have caught the next plane behind that one I took to New York. She found the Muslim restaurant in Harlem. I just happened to be there when she came in. Her clothes, her carriage, her accent all showed deep south white breeding and money. At that college I told how the antebellum white slave master even devilishly manipulated his own woman. He convinced her that she was too pure for his base animal instincts. With this noble ruse, he conned his own wife to look away from his obvious preference for the animal black woman. So the delicate mistress sat and watched the plantation's little mongrel-complexioned children, sired obviously by her father, her husband, her brothers, her sons. I said at that college that the guilt of American whites included their knowledge that in hating Negroes they were hating, they were rejecting, they were denying their own blood. Anyway, i never seen anyone I ever spoke before more affected than this little white college girl. She demanded, right up in my face, Don't you believe there are any good white people? I didn't want to hurt her feelings. I told her, People's deeds I believe in, miss, not their words. What can I do? she exclaimed. I told her, Nothing. She burst out crying and ran out and up Lenox Avenue and caught a taxi. Mr. Muhammad, each time I'd go to see him in Chicago or in Phoenix, would warm me with his expressions of his approval and confidence in me. He left me in charge of the Nation of Islam's affairs when he made an Umrah pilgrimage to the holy city Mecca. I believed so strongly in Mr. Muhammad that I would have hurled myself between him and an assassin. A chance event brought crashing home to me that there was something, one thing, greater than my reverence for Mr. Muhammad. It was the awesomeness of my reason to revere him. I was the invited speaker of the Harvard Law School Forum. I happened to glance through a window. Abruptly I realized that I was looking in the direction of the apartment house that was my old burglary gang's hideout. It rocked me like a tidal wave. Scenes from my once depraved life lashed through my mind. Living like an animal. Thinking like an animal. Awareness came surging up in me how deeply the religion of Islam had reached down into the mud to lift me up, to save me from being what I inevitably would have been, a dead criminal in a grave, or if still alive, a flint-hard, bitter, thirty-seven-year-old convict in some penitentiary or insane asylum. Or at best, I would have been an old, failing Detroit red, hustling, sealing enough for food and narcotics, and myself being stalked as prey by cruelly ambitious younger hustlers such as Detroit red had been. But Allah had blessed me to learn about the religion of Islam, which had enabled me to lift myself up from the muck and the mire of this rotting world. And there I stood, the invited speaker at Harvard. A story that I had read in prison when I was reading a lot of Greek mythology flicked into my head. The boy Icarus. Do you remember the story? Icarus' father made some wings that he fastened with wax. Never fly but so high with these wings, the father said. But soaring around this way, that way, Icarus flying pleased him so that he began thinking he was flying on his own merit. Higher he flew, higher, until the heat of the sun melted the wax holding those wings, and down came Icarus, tumbling. Standing there by that harbored window, I silently vowed to Allah that I never would forget that any wings I wore had been put on by the religion of Islam. That fact I never have forgotten. Not for one second. Chapter 16 Out In 1961, Mr. Muhammad's condition grew suddenly worse. As he talked with me when I visited him, when he talked with anyone, he would unpredictably begin coughing harder and harder until his body was racked and jerking in agonies that were painful to watch, and Mr. Muhammad would have to take to his bed. We, among Mr. Muhammad's officials and his family, kept the situation to ourselves while we could. Few other Muslims became aware of Mr. Muhammad's condition until there were last-minute cancellations of long-advertised personal appearances at some big Muslim rallies. Muslims knew that only something really serious would ever have stopped the messenger from keeping his promise to be with them at their rallies. Their questions had to be answered, and the news of our leader's illness swiftly spread through the nation of Islam. Anyone not a Muslim could not conceive what the possible loss of Mr. Muhammad would have meant among his followers. To us, 
the nation of Islam, was Mr. Muhammad. What bonded us into the best organization black Americans ever had was every Muslim's devout regard for Mr. Muhammad as black America's moral, mental, and spiritual reformer. Stated another way, we Muslims regarded ourselves as moral and mental and spiritual examples for other black Americans because we followed the personal example of Mr. Muhammad. Black communities discussed with respect how Muslims were suspended if they lied, gambled, cheated, or smoked. For moral crimes, such as fornication or adultery, Mr. Muhammad personally would mete out sentences of from one to five years of isolation, if not complete expulsion from the nation. And Mr. Muhammad would punish his officials more readily than the newest convert in a mosque. He said that any defecting official betrayed both himself and his position as a leader and example for other Muslims. For every Muslim, in his rejection of immoral temptation, the beacon was Mr. Muhammad. All Muslims felt as one that without his light, we would all be in darkness. As I related, doctors recommended a dry climate to ease Mr. Muhammad's condition. Quickly we found up for sale in Phoenix, the home of the saxophone player Louis Jordan. The nation's treasury purchased the home, and Mr. Muhammad soon moved there. Only by being two people could I have worked harder in the service of the nation of Islam. I had every gratification that I wanted. I had helped bring about the progress and national impact such that none could call us liars when we called Mr. Muhammad the most powerful black man in America. I had helped Mr. Muhammad and his other ministers to revolutionize the American black man's thinking, opening his eyes until he would never again look in the same fearful, worshipful way at the white man. I had participated in spreading the truths that had done so much to help the American black man rid himself of the mirage that the white race was made up of superior beings. I had been a part of the tapping of something in the black secret soul. If I harbored any personal disappointment whatsoever, it was that privately I was convinced that our nation of Islam could be an even greater force in the American black man's overall struggle if we engaged in more action. By that I mean I thought privately that we should have amended or relaxed our general non-engagement policy. I felt that wherever black people committed themselves, in the Little Rocks and the Birminghams and other places, militantly disciplined Muslims should also be there for all the world to see and respect and discuss. It could be heard increasingly in the Negro communities. Those Muslims talk tough, but they never do anything unless somebody bothers Muslims. I moved around among outsiders more than most other Muslim officials. I felt the very real potentiality that, considering the mercurial moods of the black masses, this labeling of Muslims as talk only could see us, powerful as we were, one day suddenly separated from the Negroes' front-line struggle. But beyond that single personal concern, I couldn't have asked Allah to bless my efforts any more than he had. Islam in New York City was growing faster than anywhere in America. From the one tiny mosque to which Mr. Muhammad had originally sent me, I had now built three of the nation's most powerful and aggressive mosques, Harlem's 7A in Manhattan, Corona's 7B in Queens, and Mosque 7C in Brooklyn, and on a national basis I had either directly established or I had helped to establish most of the 100 or more mosques in the 50 states. I was crisscrossing North America sometimes as often as four times a week. Often what sleep I got was caught in the jet planes. I was maintaining a marathon schedule of press, radio, television, and public speaking commitments. The only way that I could keep up with my job for Mr. Muhammad was by flying with the wings that he had given me. As far back as 1961, when Mr. Muhammad's illness took that turn for the worse, I had heard chance negative remarks concerning me. I had heard veiled implications. I noticed other little evidences of the envy and of the jealousy which Mr. Muhammad had prophesied. For example, it was being said that Minister Malcolm is trying to take over the nation. It was being said that I was taking credit for Mr. Muhammad's teaching. It was being said that I was trying to build an empire for myself. It was being said that I loved playing coast-to-coast -coast Mr. Big Shot. When I heard these things, actually, they didn't anger me. They helped me to re-steal my inner resolve that such lies would never become true of me. I would always remember that Mr. Muhammad had prophesied this envy and jealousy. This would help me to ignore it, because I knew that he would understand if he ever should hear such talk. A frequent rumor among non-Muslims was, Malcolm X is making a pile of money. All Muslims at least knew better than that. Me? Making money? The FBI and the CIA and the IRS all combined can't turn up a thing I got beyond a car to drive and a seven-room house to live in. And by now the nation of Islam is jealously and greedily trying to take away even that house. I had access to money. Yes, Elijah Muhammad would authorize for me any amount that I ask for. 
But he knew, as every Muslim official knew, that every nickel and dime I ever got was used to promote the nation of Islam. My attitude toward money generated the only domestic quarrel that I have ever had with my beloved wife, Betty. As our children increased in number, so did Betty's hints to me that I should put away something for our family. But I refused, and finally we had this argument. I put my foot down. I knew I had in Betty a wife who would sacrifice her life for me if such an occasion ever presented itself to her. But still I told her that too many organizations have been destroyed by leaders who tried to benefit personally, often goaded into it by their wives. We nearly broke up over this argument. I finally convinced Betty that if anything ever happened to me, the nation of Islam would take care of her for the rest of her life and of our children until they were grown. I could never have been a bigger fool. In every radio or television appearance, in every newspaper interview, I always made it crystal clear that I was Mr. Muhammad's representative. Anyone who ever heard me make a public speech during this time knows that at least once a minute I said, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches, I would refuse to talk with any person who ever tried any so-called joke about my constant reference to Mr. Muhammad. Whenever anyone said or wrote, Malcolm X, the number two black Muslim, I would recoil. I've called up reporters and radio and television newscasters long distance and asked them never to use that phrasing again, explaining to them, all Muslims are number two, after Mr. Muhammad. And my briefcase was stocked with Mr. Muhammad's photographs. I gave them to photographers who snapped my picture. I would telephone editors asking them, please use Mr. Muhammad's picture instead of mine. When, to my joy, Mr. Muhammad agreed to grant interviews to white writers, I rarely spoke to a white writer, or a black one either whom I didn't urge to visit Mr. Muhammad in person in Chicago. Get the truth from the messenger in person. And a number of them did go there and meet and interview him. Both white people and Negroes, even including Muslims, would make me uncomfortable, always giving me so much credit for the steady progress that the nation of Islam was making. All praise is due to Allah, I told everybody. Anything creditable that I do is due to Mr. Elijah Muhammad. I believe that no man in the nation of Islam could have gained the international prominence I gained with the wings Mr. Muhammad had put on me, plus having the freedom that he granted me to take liberties and do things on my own, and still have remained as faithful and as selfless a servant to him as I was. I would say that it was in 1962 when I began to notice that less and less about me appeared in our nation's Muhammad Speaks. I learned that Mr. Muhammad's son, Herbert, now the paper's publisher, had instructed that as little as possible be printed about me. In fact, there was more in the Muslim paper about integrationist Negro leaders than there was about me. I could read more about myself in the European, Asian, and African press. I'm not griping about publicity for myself. I already have received more publicity than many world personages. But I resented the fact that the Muslims' own newspaper denied them news of important things being done in their behalf simply because it happened that I had done the things. I was conducting rallies, trying to propagate Mr. Muhammad's teachings, and because of jealousy and narrow-mindedness, finally I got no coverage at all. For by now an order had been given to completely black me out of the newspaper. For instance, I spoke to 8,000 students at the University of California, and the press there gave big coverage to what I said of the power and program of Mr. Muhammad. But when I got to Chicago, expecting at least a favorable response and some coverage, I met only a chilly reaction. The same thing happened when, in Harlem, I staged a rally that drew 7,000 people. At that time, Chicago headquarters was even discouraging me from staging large rallies. But the next week, I held another Harlem rally that was even bigger and more successful than the first one. And obviously, this only increased the envy of the Chicago headquarters. But I would put these things out of my mind as they occurred. At least as much as I humanly could, I put them out of my mind. I'm not trying to make myself seem right and noble. I'm telling the truth. I loved the nation and Mr. Muhammad. I lived for the nation and for Mr. Muhammad. It made other Muslim officials jealous because my picture was often in the daily press. They wouldn't remember that my picture was there because of my fervor in championing Mr. Muhammad. They wouldn't simply reason that as vulnerable as the nation of Islam was to distorted rumors and outright lies, we needed nothing so little as to have our public spokesman constantly denying the rumors. Common sense would have told any official that certainly Mr. Muhammad couldn't be running all over the country as his own spokesman, and whoever he appointed as his spokesman couldn't avoid a lot of press focus. Whenever I caught any resentful feelings hanging on in my mind, I would be ashamed of myself, considering it a sign of weakness in myself. I knew that at least Mr. Muhammad knew that my life was totally dedicated to representing him. But during 1963, I couldn't help being very hypersensitive to my critics and high posts within our nation. 
I quit selecting certain of my New York brothers and giving them money to go and lay groundwork for new mosques in other cities because sliding remarks were being made about Malcolm's ministers. In a time in America when it was of arch importance for a militant black voice to reach mass audiences, Life magazine wanted to do a personal story of me, and I refused. I refused again when a cover story was offered by Newsweek. I refused again when I could have been a guest on the top-rated Meet the Press television program. Each refusal was a general loss for the black man, and for the nation of Islam, each refusal was a specific loss, and each refusal was made because of Chicago's attitude. There was jealousy because I'd been requested to make these featured appearances. When a high-powered rifle slug tore through the back of the NAACP field secretary Medgar Evers in Mississippi, I wanted to say the blunt truths that needed to be said. When a bomb was exploded in a Negro Christian church in Birmingham, Alabama, snuffing out the lives of those four beautiful little black girls, I made comments, but not what should have been said about the climate of hate that the American white man was generating and nourishing. The more hate was permitted to lash out when there were ways it could have been checked, the more bold the hate became until at last was flaring out at even the white man's own kind, including his own leaders. In Dallas, Texas, for instance, the then Vice President and Mrs. Johnson were vulgarly insulted. And the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson, was spat upon and hit on the head by a white woman picket. Mr. Muhammad made me the nation's first national minister. At a late 1963 rally in Philadelphia, Mr. Muhammad, embracing me, said to that audience before us, This is my most faithful hard-working minister. He will follow me until he dies. He had never paid such a compliment to any Muslim. No praise from any other earthly person could have meant more to me. But this would be Mr. Muhammad's and my last public appearance together. Not long before, I'd been on the Jerry Williams radio program in Boston when someone handed me an item hot off the Associated Press machine. I read that a chapter of the Louisiana Citizens Council had just offered a $10,000 reward for my death. But the threat of death was much closer to me than somewhere in Louisiana. What I'm telling you is the truth. When I discovered who else wanted me dead, I'm telling you, it nearly sent me to Bellevue. In my twelve years as a Muslim minister, I'd always taught so strongly on the moral issues that many Muslims accused me of being anti-woman. The very keel of my teaching and my most bone-deep personal belief was that Elijah Muhammad in every aspect of his existence was a symbol of moral, mental, and spiritual reform among the American black people. For twelve years I had taught that within the entire nation of Islam my own transformation was the best example I knew of Mr. Muhammad's power to reform black men's lives. From the time I entered prison until I married, about twelve years later, because of Mr. Muhammad's influence upon me, I had never touched a woman. But around 1963, if anyone had noticed, I spoke less and less of religion. I taught social doctrine to Muslims and current events and politics. I stayed wholly off the subject of morality. And the reason for this was that my faith had been shaken in a way that I can never fully describe. For I discovered Muslims had been betrayed by Elijah Muhammad himself. I want to make this as brief as I can, only enough so that my position and my reactions will be understood. As to whether or not I should reveal this, there's no longer any need for any question in my mind. But now the public knows. To make it concise, I will quote from one wire service story as it appeared in newspapers and was reported over radio and television across the United States. Los Angeles, July 3rd, UPI. Elijah Muhammad, 67-year-old leader of the Black Muslim Movement, today faced paternity suits from two former secretaries who charged he fathered their four children. Both women are in their twenties. Miss Rosary and Miss Williams charged they had intimacies with Elijah Muhammad from 1957 until this year. Miss Rosary alleged he fathered her two children and said she was expecting a third child by him. The other plaintiff said he was the father of her daughter. As far back as 1955, I'd heard hints. But believe me when I tell you this, for me even to consider believing anything as insane sounding as any slightest implication of any immoral behavior of Mr. Muhammad, why, the very idea made me shake with fear. And so my mind simply refused to accept anything so grotesque as adultery mentioned in the same breath with Mr. Muhammad's name. Adultery. Why, any Muslim guilty of adultery was summarily ousted in disgrace. One of the nation's most closely kept scandals was that a succession of the personal secretaries of Mr. Muhammad had become pregnant. 
they were brought before Muslim courts and charged with adultery, and they confessed. Humiliated before the general body, they received sentences of from one to five years of isolation. That meant they would have no contact whatsoever with any other Muslims. I don't think I could say anything which better testifies to my depth of faith in Mr. Muhammad than that I totally and absolutely rejected my own intelligence. I simply refused to believe. I didn't want to allow to burn my brain, as I felt the brain of my brother Reginald had been burned for harboring evil thoughts about Mr. Elijah Muhammad. The last time I'd seen Reginald, one day he walked into the Mosque 7 restaurant. I saw him coming in the door. I went and met him. I looked into my own brother's eyes. I told him he wasn't welcome among Muslims. And he turned around and left. And I haven't seen him since. I did that to my own blood brother because years before, Mr. Muhammad had sentenced Reginald to isolation from all other Muslims. And I considered that I was a Muslim before I was Reginald's brother. No one in the world could have convinced me that Mr. Muhammad would betray the reverence bestowed upon him by all of the mosques full of poor, trusting Muslims, nickeling and diming up to faithfully support the nation of Islam, when many of these faithful were scarcely able to pay their own rents. But by late 1962, I learned reliably that numerous Muslims were leaving Mosque 2 in Chicago. The ugly rumor was spreading swiftly, even among non-Muslim Negroes. When I thought of how the press constantly sought ways to discredit the nation of Islam, I trembled to think of such a thing reaching the ears of some newspaper reporter, either black or white. I actually began to have nightmares. I saw headlines. I was burdened with a leaden fear as I kept speaking engagements all over America. Any time a reporter came anywhere near me, I could hear him ask, Is it true, Mr. Malcolm X, this report we hear that... And what was I going to say? There was never any specific moment when I admitted the situation to myself in the way that the human mind can do. Somehow I slid over admitting to myself the ugly fact, even as I began dealing with it. Both in New York and Chicago, non-Muslims whom I knew began to tell me indirectly they had heard, or they would ask me if I had heard. I would act as if I had no idea whatever of what they were talking about, and I was grateful when they chose not to spell out what they knew. I went around knowing that I looked to them like a total fool. I felt like a total fool out there every day preaching and apparently not knowing what was going on right under my nose in my own organization involving the very man I was praising so. To look like a fool, unearthed emotions I hadn't felt since my Harlem hustler days. The worst thing in the hustler's world was to be a dupe. I will give you an example. Backstage at the Apollo Theater in Harlem one day, the comedian Dick Gregory looked at me. Man, he said, Muhammad's nothing but a... I can't say the word he used. Bam! Just like that, my Muslim instinct said to attack Dick. But instead, I felt weak and hollow. I think Dick sensed how upset I was, and he let me get him off the subject. I knew Dick, a Chicagoan, was wise in the way of the streets and blunt-spoken. I wanted to plead with him not to say to anyone else what he had said to me. But I couldn't. It would have been my own admission. I can't describe the torments I went through. Always before, in any extremity, I caught the first plane to Mr. Elijah Muhammad. He'd virtually raised me from the dead. Everything I was that was creditable, he'd made me. I felt that no matter what, I could not let him down. There was no one I could turn to with this problem except Mr. Muhammad himself. Ultimately, that had to be the case. But first I went to Chicago to see Mr. Muhammad's second youngest son, Wallace Muhammad. I felt that Wallace was Mr. Muhammad's most strongly spiritual son, the son with the most objective outlook. Always, Wallace and I had shared an exceptional closeness and trust. And Wallace knew when he saw me why I had come to see him. I know, he said. I said I thought we should rally to help his father. Wallace said he didn't feel that his father would welcome any efforts to help him. I told myself that Wallace must be crazy. Next, I broke the rule that no Muslim is supposed to have any contact with another Muslim in the isolated state. I looked up, and I talked with three of the former secretaries to Mr. Muhammad. From their own mouths, I heard their stories of who had fathered their children. And from their own mouths, I heard that Elijah Muhammad had told them I was the best, the greatest minister he ever had but that someday I would leave him, turn against him. So I was dangerous. I learned from these former secretaries of Mr. Muhammad that while he was praising me to my face, he was tearing me apart behind my back. That deeply hurt me. Every day I was meeting the microphones, cameras, press reporters, and other commitments, including the Muslims of my own Mosque 7. I felt almost out of my mind. Finally, the thing crystallized for me. As long as I did nothing, I felt it was the same as being disloyal. I felt that as long as I sat down, 
I was not helping Mr. Muhammad when somebody needed to be standing up. So one night I wrote to Mr. Muhammad about the poison being spread about him. He telephoned me in New York. He said that when he saw me he would discuss it. I desperately wanted to find some way, some kind of a bridge over which I was certain the nation of Islam could be saved from self-destruction. I had faith in the nation. We weren't some group of Christian Negroes jumping and shouting and full of sins. I thought of one bridge that could be used if and when the shattering disclosure should become public. Loyal Muslims could be taught that a man's accomplishments in his life outweigh his personal human weaknesses. Wallace Muhammad helped me to review the Koran and the Bible for documentation. David's adultery with Bathsheba weighed less on history's scales, for instance, than the positive fact of David's killing Goliath. Thinking of Lot, we think not of incest, but of his saving the people from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Or our image of Noah isn't of his getting drunk, but of his building the ark and teaching people to save themselves from the flood. We think of Moses leading the Hebrews from bondage, not of Moses' adultery with the Ethiopian women. In all of the cases I reviewed, the positive outweighed the negative. I began teaching in New York Mosque 7 that a man's accomplishments in his life outweighed his personal human weaknesses. I taught that a person's good deeds outweigh his bad deeds. I never mentioned the previously familiar subjects of adultery and fornication, and I never mentioned immoral evils. By some miracle, the adultery talk which was so widespread in Chicago seemed to only leak a little in Boston, Detroit, and New York. Apparently it hadn't reached other mosques around the country at all. In Chicago, increasing numbers of Muslims were leaving Mosque too, I heard, and many non-Muslims who had been sympathetic to the nation were now outspokenly anti-Muslim. In February 1963, I officiated at the University of Islam graduation exercises. When I introduced various members of the Muhammad family, I could feel the cold chill toward them from the Muslims in the audience. Elijah Muhammad had me fly to Phoenix to see him in April 1963. We embraced, as always, and almost immediately he took me outside, where we began to walk by his swimming pool. He was the messenger of Allah. When I was a foul, vicious convict, so evil that other convicts had called me Satan. This man had rescued me. He was the man who had trained me, who had treated me as if I were his own flesh and blood. He was the man who had given me wings to go places, to do things I otherwise never would have dreamed of. We walked, with me caught up in a whirlwind of emotions. Well, son, Mr. Muhammad said, what is on your mind? Plainly, frankly, pulling no punches, I told Mr. Muhammad what was being said, and without waiting for any response from him, I said that with his son Wallace's help, I had found in the Koran and the Bible that which might be taught to Muslims, if it became necessary, as the fulfillment of prophecy. Son, I am not surprised, Elijah Muhammad said. You always have had such a good understanding of prophecy and of spiritual things. You recognize that's what all of this is. Prophecy. You have the kind of understanding that only an old man has. I'm David, he said. When you read about how David took another's wife, I'm that David. You read about Noah, who got drunk. That's me. You read about Lot, who went and laid up with his own daughters. I have to fulfill all of those things. I remembered that when an epidemic is about to hit somewhere, that community's people are inoculated against exposure with some of the same germs that are anticipated, and this prepares them to resist the oncoming virus. I decided I'd better prepare six other East Coast Muslim officials whom I selected. I told them, and then I told them why I had told them, that I felt they should not be caught by surprise and shock if it became their job to teach the Muslims in their mosques the fulfillment of prophecy. I found then that some had already heard it, one of them, Minister Lewis X of Boston, as much as seven months before. They had been living with the dilemma themselves. I never dreamed that the Chicago Muslim officials were going to make it appear that I was throwing gasoline on the fire instead of water. I never dreamed that they were going to try to make it appear that instead of inoculating against an epidemic, I had started it. The stage in Chicago even then was being set for Muslims to shift their focus off the epidemic and onto me. Hating me was going to become the cause for people of shattered faith to rally around. Non-Muslim Negroes who knew me well, and even some of the white reporters with whom I had some regular contact, were telling me almost wherever I went, Malcolm X, you're looking tired. You need a rest. They didn't know a fraction of it. Since I'd been a Muslim, this was the first time any white people really got to me in a personal way. 
I could tell that some of them were really honest and sincere. One of these, whose name I won't call, he might lose his job, said, Malcolm X, the whites need your voice worse than the Negroes. I remember so well his saying this because it prefaced the first time since I became a Muslim that I had ever talked with any white man at any length about anything except the nation of Islam and the American black man's struggle today. I can't remember how or why he somehow happened to mention the Dead Sea Scrolls. I came back with something like, Yes, those scrolls are going to take Jesus off the stained glass windows and the frescoes where he's been lily-white and put him back into the true mainstream of history where Jesus actually was non-white. The reporter was surprised, and I went on that the Dead Sea Scrolls were going to reaffirm that Jesus was a member of that brotherhood of Egyptian seers called the Essene, a fact already known from Philo, the famous Egyptian historian of Jesus' time. And the reporter and I got off on about two good hours of talking in the areas of archaeology, history, and religion. It was so pleasant. I almost forgot the heavy worries on my mind for that brief respite. I remember we wound up agreeing that by the year 2000, every school child will be taught the true color of great men of antiquity. I have said that I expected headlines momentarily. I hadn't expected the kind which came. No one needs to be reminded of who got assassinated in Dallas, Texas, on November 22, 1963. Within hours after the assassination, I am telling nothing but the truth. Every Muslim minister received from Mr. Elijah Muhammad a directive. In fact, two directives. Every minister was ordered to make no remarks at all concerning the assassination. Mr. Muhammad instructed that if pressed for comment, we should say, No comment. End of Side 8 Side 9, the autobiography of Malcolm X, continuing on page 300. During that three-day period, where there was no other news to be heard except relating to the murdered president, Mr. Muhammad had a previously scheduled speaking engagement in New York at the Manhattan Center. He cancelled his coming to speak, and as we were unable to get back the money already paid for the rental of the center, Mr. Muhammad told me to speak in his stead. And so I spoke. Many times since then I've looked at the speech notes I used that day, which had been prepared at least a week before the assassination. The title of my speech was God's Judgment of White America. It was on the theme, familiar to me, of As you sow, so shall you reap, or how the hypocritical American white man was reaping what he had sowed. The question and answer period opened, I suppose, inevitably, with someone asking me, What do you think about President Kennedy's assassination? What is your opinion? Without a second thought I said what I honestly felt that it was, as I saw it, a case of the chickens coming home to roost. I said that the hate in white men had not stopped with the killing of defenseless black people, but that hate, allowed to spread unchecked, finally had struck down this country's chief of state. I said it was the same thing as it happened with Medgar Evers, with Patrice Lumumba, with Madame Nu's husband. The headlines and the news broadcasts promptly had it. Black Muslims Malcolm X, chickens come home to roost. It makes me feel weary to think of it all now. All over America, all over the world, some of the world's most important personages were saying in various ways and in far stronger ways than I did that America's climate of hate had been responsible for the president's death. But when Malcolm X said the same thing, it was ominous. My regular monthly visit to Mr. Muhammad was due the next day. Somehow on the plane I expected something. I've always had this strong intuition. Mr. Muhammad and I embraced each other in greeting. I sensed some ingredient missing from his usual amiability, and I was suddenly tense, to me also very significant. For years I had prided myself that Mr. Muhammad and I were so close that I knew how he felt by how I felt. If he was nervous, I was nervous. If I was relaxed, then I knew he was relaxed. Now I felt the tension. First we talked of other things, sitting in his living room. Then he asked me, Did you see the papers this morning? I said, Yes, sir, I did. That was a very bad statement, he said. The country loved this man. The whole country is in mourning. That was very ill-timed. A statement like that can make it hard on Muslims in general. And then, as if Mr. Muhammad's voice came from afar, I heard his words, I'll have to silence you for the next ninety days so that the Muslims everywhere can be disassociated from the blunder. I was numb, but I was a follower of Mr. Muhammad. Many times I'd said to my own assistants, that anyone in a position to discipline others must be able to take disciplining himself. I told Mr. Muhammad, Sir, I agree with you, and I submit, 100%.
I flew back to New York psychologically preparing myself to tell my Mosk 7 assistants that I had been suspended, or silenced. But to my astonishment, upon arrival, I learned that my assistants already had been informed. What astonished me even more, a telegram had been sent to every New York City newspaper and radio and television station. It was the most quick and thorough publicity job that I'd ever seen the Chicago officials initiate. Every telephone where I could possibly be reached was ringing. London, Paris, AP, UPI, every television and radio network, and all of the newspapers were calling. I told them all, I disobeyed Mr. Muhammad. I submit completely to his wisdom. Yes, I expect to be speaking again after 90 days. Malcolm X silenced. It was headlines. My first worry was that if a scandal broke for the nation of Islam within the next 90 days, I would be gagged when I could be the most experienced Muslim in dealing with the news media that would make the most of any scandal within the nation. I learned next that my silencing was even more thorough than I thought. I was not only forbidden to talk with the press, I was not even to teach in my own Mosque 7. Next, an announcement was made throughout the nation of Islam that I would be reinstated within 90 days if he submits. This made me suspicious for the first time. I had completely submitted, but deliberately Muslims were being given the impression that I had rebelled. I hadn't hustled in the streets for years for nothing. I knew when I was being set up. Three days later, the first word came to me that a Mosque 7 official who had been one of my most immediate assistants was telling certain Mosque 7 brothers, if you knew what the minister did, you'd go out and kill him yourself. And then I knew. As any official in the nation of Islam would instantly have known, any death talk for me could have been approved of, if not actually initiated, by only one man. My head felt like it was bleeding inside. I felt like my brain was damaged. I went to see Dr. Leona A. Turner, who has been my family doctor for years, who practices in East Elmhurst, Long Island. I asked her to give me a brain examination. She did examine me. She said I was under great strain, and I needed rest. Cassius Clay and I are not together today, but always I must be grateful to him that at just this time, when he was in Miami training to fight Sonny Liston, Cassius invited me, Betty, and the children to come there as his guests, as a sixth wedding anniversary present to Betty and me. I had met Cassius Clay in Detroit in 1962. He and his brother Rudolph came into the students' luncheonette next door to the Detroit Mosque, where Elijah Muhammad was about to speak at a big rally. Every Muslim present was impressed by the bearing and the obvious genuineness of the striking, handsome pair of prize fighter brothers. Cassius came up and pumped my hand, introducing himself as he later presented himself to the world. I'm Cassius Clay. He acted as if I was supposed to know who he was, so I acted as though I did. Up to that moment, though, I'd never even heard of him. Ours were two entirely different worlds. In fact, Elijah Muhammad instructed us Muslims against all forms of sports. As Elijah Muhammad spoke, the two Clay brothers practically led the applause, further impressing everyone with their sincerity, since a Muslim rally was about the world's last place to seek fight fans. Thereafter, now and then I heard how Kasha showed up in Muslim mosques and restaurants in various cities, and if I happened to be speaking anywhere within reasonable distance of wherever Kasha's was, he would be present. I liked him. Some contagious quality about him made him one of the very few people I ever invited to my home. Betty liked him. Our children were crazy about him. Cassius was simply a likable, friendly, clean-cut, down-to-earth youngster. I noticed how alert he was even in little details. I suspected that there was a plan in his public clowning. I suspected, and he confirmed to me, that he was doing everything possible to con and to psych Sonny Liston into coming into the ring angry, poorly trained, and overconfident, expecting another of his vaunted one-round knockouts. Not only was Cassius receptive to advice, he solicited it. Primarily, I impressed upon him to what a great extent a public figure's success depends upon how alert and knowledgeable he is to the true natures and to the true motives of all of the people who flock around him. I warned him about the foxes, his expression for the aggressive, cute young females who flocked after him. I told Cassius that instead of foxes, they really were wolves. This was Betty's first vacation since we'd married, and our three girls romped and played with the heavyweight contender. I don't know what I might have done if I'd stayed in New York during that crucial time besieged by insistently ringing telephones and by the press and by all of the other people so anxious to gloat, to speculate, and to commiserate. I was in a state of emotional shock. I was like someone who for twelve years had had an inseparable, beautiful marriage. And then suddenly one morning at breakfast the marriage partner thrust across the table some divorce papers. I felt as though something in nature had failed, like the sun or the stars. It was that incredible a phenomenon to me, something too stupendous to conceive, I'm not sparing myself. Around Cassius Clay's fight camp, around the Hampton House Motel where my family was staying, I talked with my own wife and with other people, 
And actually, I was only mouthing words that really meant nothing to me. Whatever I was saying at any time was being handled by a small corner of my mind. The rest of my mind was filled with a parade of a thousand and one different scenes from the past twelve years. Scenes in the Muslim mosques. Scenes with Mr. Muhammad. Scenes with Mr. Muhammad's family. Scenes with Muslims individually, as my audiences, and at our social gatherings. And scenes with a white man in audiences, and the press. I walked. I talked. I functioned. At the Cassius Clay fight camp, I told the various sports writers repeatedly what I gradually had come to know within myself was a lie, that I would be reinstated within 90 days. But I could not yet let myself psychologically face what I knew, that already the nation of Islam and I were physically divorced. Do you understand what I mean? A judge's signature on a piece of paper can grant to a couple a physical divorce. But for either of them, or maybe for both of them, if they've been a very close marriage team, to actually become psychologically divorced from each other might take years. But in the physical divorce, I could not evade the obvious strategy and plotting coming out of Chicago to eliminate me from the nation of Islam, if not from this world. And I felt that I perceived the anatomy of the plotting. Any Muslim would have known that my chickens coming home to roost statement had been only an excuse to put into action the plan for getting me out. And step one had been already taken. The Muslims were given the impression that I had rebelled against Mr. Muhammad. I could now anticipate step two. I would remain suspended, and later I would be isolated, indefinitely. Step three would be either to provoke some Muslim ignorant of the truth to take it upon himself to kill me as a religious duty, or to isolate me so that I would gradually disappear from the public scene. The only person who knew was my wife. I never would have dreamed that I would ever depend so much upon any woman for strength as I now leaned upon Betty. There was no exchange between us. Betty said nothing, being the caliber of wife that she is, with the depth of understanding that she has. But I could feel the envelopment of her comfort. I knew that she was as faithful a servant of Allah as I was, and I knew that whatever happened, she was with me. The death talk was not my fear. Every second of my twelve years with Mr. Muhammad, I'd been ready to lay down my life for him. The thing to me worse than death was the betrayal. I could conceive death. I couldn't conceive death. Betrayal, not of the loyalty which I had given to the nation of Islam and to Mr. Muhammad. During the previous twelve years, if Mr. Muhammad had committed any civil crime punishable by death, I would have said and tried to prove that I did it, to save him, and I would have gone to the electric chair as Mr. Muhammad's servant. There, as Cassius Clay's guest in Miami, I tried desperately to push my mind off my troubles and onto the nation's troubles. I still struggled to persuade myself that Mr. Muhammad had been fulfilling prophecy because I actually had believed that if Mr. Muhammad was not God, then he surely stood next to God. What began to break my faith was that, try as I might, I couldn't hide, I couldn't evade, that Mr. Muhammad, instead of facing what he'd done before his followers as a human weakness or as fulfillment of prophecy, which I sincerely believe that Muslims would have understood, or at least they would have accepted, Mr. Muhammad had instead been willing to hide, to cover up what he'd done. That was my major blow. That was how I first began to realize that I had believed in Mr. Muhammad more than he believed in himself. And that was how, after twelve years of never thinking for as much as five minutes about myself, I became able finally to muster the nerve and the strength to start facing the facts, to think for myself. Briefly, I left Florida to return Betty and the children to our Long Island home. I learned that the Chicago Muslim officials were further displeased with me because of the newspaper reports of me in the Cassius Clay camp. They felt that Cassius hadn't a prayer of a chance to win. They felt the nation would be embarrassed through my linking the Muslim image with him. I don't know if the champion today cares to remember that most newspapers in America were represented at the pre-fight camp, except Muhammad Speaks. Even though Cassius was a Muslim brother, the Muslim newspaper didn't consider his fight worth covering. I flew back to Miami feeling that it was Allah's intent for me to help Cassius prove Islam's superiority before the world through proving that mind can win over brawn. I don't have to remind you how people everywhere scoffed at Cassius Clay's chances of beating Liston. This time, I brought from New York with me some photographs of Floyd Patterson and Sonny Liston in their fight camps, with white priests as their spiritual advisors. Cassius Clay, being a Muslim, didn't need to be told how white Christianity had dealt with the American black man. This fight is the truth, I told Cassius. It's the cross and the crescent fighting in a prize ring for the first time. It's a modern crusade, a Christian and a Muslim facing each other with television to beam it off Telstar for the whole world to see what happens. I told Cassius, 
Do you think a lie has brought about all this, intending for you to leave the ring as anything but the champion? You may remember that at the weighing in, Cassius was yelling such things as, It is prophesied for me to be successful. I cannot be beaten. Sonny Liston's handlers and advisers had him fighting harder to integrate than he was training to meet Cassius. Liston finally had managed to rent a big, fine house over in a rich wall-to-wall -wall white section. To give you an idea, the owner of the neighboring house was the New York Yankees baseball club owner, Dan Topping. In the early evenings, when Cassius and I would sometimes walk where the black people lived, those Negroes' mouths would hang open in surprise that he was among them, instead of whites, as most black champions preferred. Again and again, Cassius startled those Negroes, telling them, You're my own kind. I get my strength from being around my own black people. What Sonny Liston was about to meet, in fact, was one of the most awesome frights that ever can confront any person. One who worships Allah and who is completely without fear. Among over 8,000 other seat holders in Miami's big convention hall, I received seat number seven. Seven has always been my favorite number. It has followed me throughout my life. I took this to be Allah's message confirming to me that Cassius Clay was going to win. Along with Cassius, I really was more worried about how his brother Rudolph was going to do, fighting his first pro fight in the preliminaries. While Rudolph was winning a four-round decision over a Florida Negro named Chip Johnson, Cassius stood at the rear of the auditorium watching calmly, dressed in a black tuxedo. After all of his months of antics, after the weighing-in act that Cassius had put on, this calmness should have tipped off some of the sports writers who were predicting Clay's slaughter. Then Cassius disappeared, dressing to meet Liston. As we had agreed... I joined him in a silent prayer for Allah's blessings. Finally, he and Liston were in their corners in the ring. I folded my arms and tried to appear the coolest man in the place, because a television camera can show you looking like a fool yelling at a prize fight. Except for whatever chemical it was that got into Cassius' eyes and blinded him temporarily in the fourth and fifth rounds, the fight went according to his plan. He evaded Liston's powerful punches. The third round automatically began the tiring of the aging Liston, who was overconfidently trained to go only two rounds. Then, desperate, Liston lost. The secret of one of fight history's greatest upsets was that months before that night, Clay had outthought Liston. There probably never has been as quiet a new champion party. The boyish king of the ring came over to my motel. He ate ice cream, drank milk, talked with football star Jimmy Brown and other friends and some reporters. Sleepy, Cassius took a quick nap on my bed. Then he went back home. We had breakfast together the next morning, just before the press conference when Cassius calmly made the announcement which burst into international headlines that he was a black Muslim. But let me tell you something about that. Cassius never announced himself a member of any black Muslims. The press reporters made that out of what he told them, which was this. I believe in the religion of Islam, which means I believe there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his apostle. This is the same religion that is believed in by over 700 million dark-skinned peoples throughout Africa and Asia. Nothing in all of the furor which followed was more ridiculous than Floyd Patterson announcing that as a Catholic he wanted to fight Cassius Clay to save the heavyweight crown from being held by a Muslim. It was such a sad case of a brainwashed black Christian ready to do battle for the white man who wants no part of him. Not three weeks later, the newspapers reported that in Yonkers, New York, Patterson was offering to sell his $140,000 house for a $20,000 loss. He had integrated into a neighborhood of whites who had made his life miserable. None were friendly. Their children called his children niggers. One neighbor trained his dog to deface Patterson's property. Another erected a fence to hide the Negroes from sight. I tried... It just didn't work, Patterson told the press. The first direct order for my death was issued through a Mosque 7 official who previously had been a close assistant. Another previously close assistant of mine was assigned to do the job. He was a brother with a knowledge of demolition. He was asked to wire my car to explode when I turned the ignition key. But this brother had happened had seen too much of my total loyalty to the nation to carry out his order. Instead, he came to me. I thanked him for my life. I told him what was really going on in Chicago. He was stunned almost beyond belief. This brother was close to others in the Mosque 7 circle who might subsequently be called upon to eliminate me. He said he would take it upon himself to enlighten each of them enough so that they wouldn't allow themselves to be used. This first direct death order was how, finally, I began to arrive at my psychological divorce from the nation of Islam. I began to see wherever I went on the streets, in business places, on elevators, sidewalks, in passing cars, the faces of Muslims whom I knew, 
and I knew that any of them might be waiting the opportunity to try and put a bullet into me. I was racking my brain. What was I going to do? My life was inseparably committed to the American black man's struggle. I was generally regarded as a leader. For years, I'd attacked so many so-called black leaders for their shortcomings. Now I had to honestly ask myself what I could offer, how I was genuinely qualified to help the black people win their struggle for human rights. I had enough experience to know that in order to be a good organizer of anything which you expect to succeed, including yourself, you must almost mathematically analyze cold facts. I had, as one asset, I knew, an international image. No amount of money could have bought that. I knew that if I said something newsworthy, people would read or hear of it, maybe even around the world, depending upon what it was. More immediately, in New York City, where I would naturally base any operation, I had a large, direct personal following of non-Muslims. This had been building up steadily ever since I had led Muslims in the dramatic protest to the police when our brother Hinton was beaten up. Hundreds of Harlem Negroes had seen, and hundreds of thousands of them had later heard how we had shown that almost anything could be accomplished by black men who would face the white man without fear. All of Harlem had seen how, from then on, the police gave Muslims respect. This was during the time that the deputy chief inspector of the 28th Precinct had said of me, no one man should have that much power. Over the ensuing years, I had various kinds of evidence that a high percentage of New York City's black people responded to what I said, including a great many who would not publicly say so. For instance, time and again when I spoke at street rallies, I would draw ten and twelve times as many people as most other so-called Negro leaders. I knew that in any society, a true leader is one who earns and deserves the following he enjoys. True followers are bestowed by themselves, out of their own volition and emotions. I knew that the great lack of most of the big-named Negro leaders was their lack of any true rapport with the ghetto Negroes. How could they have rapport when they spent most of their time integrating with white people? I knew that the ghetto people knew that I never left the ghetto in spirit, and I never left it physically any more than I had to. I had a ghetto instinct. For instance, I could feel if tension was beyond normal in a ghetto audience, and I could speak and understand the ghetto's language. There was an example of this that always flew to my mind every time I heard some of the big-name Negro leaders declaring they spoke for the ghetto black people. After a Harlem street rally, one of these downtown leaders and I were talking when we were approached by a Harlem hustler. To my knowledge, I'd never seen this hustler before. He said to me, approximately, Hey, baby, I dig you holding this all-original scene at the track. I'm going to lay a vine under the Jews' balls for a dime. Got to give you a play. Got the shorts out here trying to scuffle up on some bread. Well, my man, I'll get on. Got to go peck a little and cop me some Z's. And the hustler went on up 7th Avenue. I would never have given it another thought except that this downtown leader was standing, staring after that hustler, looking as if he just heard Sanskrit. He asked me what had been said, and I told him. The hustler had said he was aware that the Muslims were holding an all-black bazaar at Rockland Palace, which is primarily a dance hall. The hustler intended to pawn a suit for $10 to attend and patronize the bazaar. He had very little money, but he was trying hard to make some. He was going to eat, then he would get some sleep. The point I'm making is that, as a leader, I could talk over the ABC, CBS, or NBC microphones at Harvard or at Tuskegee. I could talk with the so-called middle-class Negro and with the ghetto blacks, whom all the other leaders just talked about. And because I'd been a hustler, I knew better than all whites knew, and better than nearly all of the black leaders knew, that actually the most dangerous black man in America was the ghetto hustler. Why do I say this? The hustler out there in the ghetto jungles has less respect for the white power structure than any other Negro in North America. The ghetto hustler is internally restrained by nothing. He has no religion, no concept of morality, no civic responsibility, no fear. Nothing. To survive, he is out there constantly preying upon others, probing for any human weakness like a ferret. The ghetto hustler is forever frustrated, restless, and anxious for some action. Whatever he undertakes... He commits himself to it fully, absolutely. What makes the ghetto hustler yet more dangerous is his glamour image to the school dropout youth in the ghetto. These ghetto teenagers see the hell caught by their parents struggling to get somewhere or see that they've given up struggling in the prejudiced, intolerant white man's world. The ghetto teenagers make up their own minds they would rather be like the hustlers whom they see dressed sharp and flashing money and displaying no respect for anybody or anything. So the ghetto youth become attracted to the hustler worlds of dope, thievery, prostitution, and general crime and immorality. It scared me the first time I really saw the danger of these ghetto teenagers, if they're ever sparked to violence. One sweltering summer afternoon, I attended a Harlem street rally which contained a lot of these teenagers in the crowd. I'd been invited by some 
responsible Negro leaders who normally never spoke to me. I knew they just used my name to help them draw a crowd. The more I thought about it on the way there, the hotter I got. And when I got on the stand, I just told that crowd on the street that I wasn't really wanted up there, that my name had been used, and I walked off the speaker's stand. Well, what did I want to do that for? Why, those young teenage Negroes got upset and started milling around and yelling, upsetting the older Negroes in the crowd. The first thing you know, traffic was blocked in four directions by a crowd whose mood quickly grew so ugly that I really got apprehensive. I got up on top of a car and began waving my arms and yelling at them to quiet down. They did quiet, and then I asked them to disperse, and they did. This was when it began being said that I was America's only Negro who could stop a race riot or start one. I don't know if I could do either one, but I know one thing. It had taught me in a very few minutes to have a whole lot of respect for the human combustion that is packed among the hustlers and their young admirers who live in the ghettos where the northern white man has sealed off the Negro away from whites for a hundred years. The long, hot summer of 1964 in Harlem, in Rochester, and in other cities has given an idea of what could happen. And that's all. Only an idea. For all of those riots were kept contained within where the Negroes lived, you let any of these bitter, seething ghettos all over America receive the right igniting incident and become really inflamed and explode and burst out of their boundaries into where whites live. In New York City, you let enraged blacks pour out of Harlem across Central Park and fan down the tunnels of Madison and Fifth and Lexington and Park Avenues, or take Chicago's south side, an older, even worse slum. You let those Negroes swarm downtown. You let Washington, D.C.'s festering blacks head down Pennsylvania Avenue. Detroit has already seen a peaceful massing of more than a hundred thousand blacks. Think about that. You name the city. Black social dynamite is in Cleveland, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Los Angeles. The black man's anger is there, fermenting. I've strayed off into some of the incidents and situations which have taught me to respect the danger in the ghettos. I had been trying to explain how I honestly evaluated my own qualifications to be worthy of presenting myself as an independent leader among black men. In the end, I reasoned that the decision already had been made for me. The ghetto masses already had entrusted me with an image of leadership among them. I knew the ghetto instinctively extends that trust only to one who had demonstrated that he would never sell them out to the white man. I not only had no such intention, to sell out was not even in my nature. I felt a challenge to plan and build an organization that could help to cure the black man in North America of the sickness which has kept him under the white man's heel. The black man in North America was mentally sick in his cooperative, sheep-like acceptance of the white man's culture. The black man in North America was spiritually sick because for centuries he had accepted the white man's Christianity, which asked the black so-called Christian to expect no true brotherhood of man, but to endure the cruelties of the white so-called Christians. Christianity made black men fuzzy, nebulous, confused in their thinking. It had taught the black man to think if he had no shoes and was hungry, we're going to get shoes and milk and honey and fish fries in heaven. The black man in North America was economically sick, and that was evident in one simple fact. As a consumer, he got less than his share, and as a producer, gave least. The black American today shows us the perfect parasite image. The black tick under the delusion that he is progressing because he rides on the udder of the fat, three-stomached cow that is white America. For instance, annually, the black man spends over three billion dollars for automobiles, but America contains hardly any franchise black automobile dealers. For instance, 40 percent of the expensive imported Scotch whiskey consumed in America goes down the throats of the status-sick black man. But the only black-owned distilleries are in bathtubs or in the woods somewhere. Or, for instance, a scandalous shame, in New York City, with over a million Negroes, there aren't 20 black-owned businesses employing over 10 people. It's because black men don't own and control their own community's retail establishments that they can't stabilize their own community. The black man in North America was sickest of all politically. He let the white man divide him into such foolishness as considering himself a black Democrat, a black Republican, a black conservative, or a black liberal, when a 10 million black vote bloc could be the deciding balance of power in American politics because the white man's vote is almost always evenly divided. The polls are one place where every black man could fight the black man's cause with dignity and with the power and the tools that the white man understands and respects and fears and cooperates with. Listen, let me tell you something. If a black bloc committee told Washington's worst nigger hater, we represent 10 million votes, why that nigger hater would leap up 
Well, how are you? Come on in here. Why, if the Mississippi black man voted in a block, Eastland would pretend to be more liberal than Jacob Javits, or Eastland would not survive in his office. Why else is it that racist politicians fight to keep black men from the polls? Whenever any group can vote in a block and decide the outcome of elections, and it fails to do this, then that group is politically sick. Immigrants once made Tammany Hall the most powerful single force in American politics. In 1880, New York City's first Irish Catholic mayor was elected, and by 1960, America had its first Irish Catholic president. America's black man voting as a block could wield an even more powerful force. U.S. politics is ruled by special interest blocks and lobbies. What group has a more urgent special interest? What group needs a block, a lobby, more than the black man? Labor owns one of Washington's largest non-government buildings, situated where they can literally watch the White House, and no political move is made that doesn't involve how Labor feels about it. A lobby got big oil its depletion allowance. The farmer, though his lobby, is the most government-subsidized special interest group in America today, because a million farmers vote, not as Democrats or Republicans, liberals, conservatives, but as farmers. Doctors have the best lobby in Washington. Their special interest influence successfully fights the Medicare program that's wanted and needed by millions of other people. Why, there's a beet growers lobby, a wheat lobby, a cattle lobby, a China lobby. Little countries no one ever heard of have their Washington lobbies representing their special interests. The government has departments to deal with the special interest groups that make themselves heard and felt. A department of agriculture cares for the farmer's needs. There is a Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. There is a Department of the Interior, in which the Indians are included. Is the farmer, the doctor, the Indian, the greatest problem in America today? No. It is the black man. There ought to be a Pentagon-sized Washington Department dealing with every segment of the black man's problems. Twenty-two million black men. They have given America 400 years of toil. They have bled and died in every battle since the Revolution. They were in America before the pilgrims and long before the mass immigrations. And they are still today at the bottom of everything. Why, 22 million black people should tomorrow give a dollar apiece to build a skyscraper lobby building in Washington, D.C. Every morning, every legislator should receive a communication about what the black man in America expects and wants and needs. The demanding voice of the black lobby should be in the ears of every legislator who votes on any issue. The cornerstones of this country's operation are economic and political strength and power. The black man doesn't have the economic strength, and it will take time for him to build it. But right now, the American black man has the political strength and power to change his destiny overnight. It was a big order. The organization I was creating in my mind one which would help to challenge the American black man to gain his human rights and to cure his mental, spiritual, economic, and political sicknesses. But if you ever intend to do anything worthwhile, you have to start with a worthwhile plan. Substantially, as I saw it, the organization I hoped to build would differ from the Nation of Islam in that it would embrace all faiths of black men, and it would carry into practice what the Nation of Islam had only preached. Rumors were swirling, particularly in East Coast cities. What was I going to do? Well, the first thing I was going to have to do was to attract far more willing heads and hands than my own. Each day, more militant action brothers who had been with me in Mosque 7 announced their break from the Nation of Islam to come with me. And each day I learned, in one or another way, of more support from non-Muslim Negroes, including a surprising lot of the middle and upper-class black bourgeoisie who were sick of the status symbol charade. There was a growing clamor, when are you going to call a meeting to get organized? To hold a first meeting... I arranged to rent the Carver Ballroom of the Hotel Teresa, which is at the corner of 125th Street and 7th Avenue, which might be called one of Harlem's fuse box locations. The Amsterdam News reported the planned meeting, and many readers inferred that we were establishing our beginning mosque in the Teresa. Telegrams and letters and telephone calls came to the hotel for me from across the country. Their general tone was that this was a move that people had waited for. People I'd never heard of expressed confidence in me in moving ways. Numerous people said that the Nation of Islam's stringent moral restrictions had repelled them, and they wanted to join me. A doctor who owned a small hospital telephoned long distance to join. Many others sent contributions, even before our policies had been publicly stated. Muslims wrote from other cities that they would join me, their remarks being generally along the lines that Islam is too inactive. 
the nation is moving too slow. Astonishing numbers of white people called and wrote, offering contributions or asking could they join. The answer was no, they couldn't join. Our membership was all black. But if their consciences dictated, they could financially help our constructive approach to America's race problems. Speaking engagement requests came in, 22 of them in one particular Monday morning's mail. It was startling to me that an unusual number of the requests came from groups of white Christian ministers. I called a press conference. The microphones stuck up before me. The flashbulbs popped. The reporters, men and women, white and black, representing media that reached around the world, sat looking at me with their pencils and open notebooks. I made the announcement. I'm going to organize and head a new mosque in New York City known as the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. This will give us a religious base and the spiritual force necessary to rid our people of the vices that destroy the moral fiber of our community. Muslim Mosque Incorporated will have its temporary headquarters in the Hotel Teresa in Harlem. It will be the working base for an action program designed to eliminate the political oppression, the economic exploitation, and the social degradation suffered daily by 22 million Afro-Americans. Then the reporters began firing questions at me. It was not all as simple as it may sound. I went few places without constant awareness that any number of my former brothers felt they would make heroes of themselves in the nation of Islam if they killed me. I knew how Elijah Muhammad's followers thought. I had taught so many of them to think. I knew that no one would kill you quicker than a Muslim if he felt that's what Allah wanted him to do. There was one further major preparation that I knew I needed. I'd had it in my mind for a long time as a servant of Allah. But it would require money that I didn't have. I took a plane to Boston. I was turning again to my sister Ella. Though at times I'd made Ella angry at me, beneath it all, since I'd first come to her as a teenaged hick from Michigan, Ella had never once really wavered from my corner. Ella, I said, I want to make the pilgrimage to Mecca. Ella said, how much do you need? Chapter 17 Mecca The pilgrimage to Mecca, known as Hajj, is a religious obligation that every orthodox Muslim fulfills, if humanly able, at least once in his or her lifetime. The Holy Quran says it, Pilgrimage to the Kaaba is a duty men owe to God. Those who are able make the journey. Allah said, And proclaim the pilgrimage among men. They will come to you on foot and upon each lean camel. They will come from every deep ravine. At one or another college or university, usually in the informal gatherings after I had spoken, perhaps a dozen generally white-complexioned people would come up to me, identifying themselves as Arabian, Middle Eastern or North African Muslims who happened to be visiting, studying, or living in the United States. They had said to me that, my white indicting statements notwithstanding, they felt that I was sincere in considering myself a Muslim, and they felt if I was exposed to what they always called true Islam, I would understand it and embrace it. Automatically, as a follower of Elijah Muhammad, I had bridled whenever this was said. But in the privacy of my own thoughts after several of these experiences, I did question myself. If one was sincere in professing a religion, why should he balk at broadening his knowledge of that religion? Once in a conversation I broached this with Wallace Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad's son. He said that, yes, certainly a Muslim should seek to learn all that he could about Islam. I'd always had a high opinion of Wallace Muhammad's opinion. Those orthodox Muslims whom I'd met, one after another, had urged me to meet and talk with a Dr. Mahmoud Yusuf Shawabi. He was described to me as an eminent learned Muslim, a University of Cairo graduate, a University of London PhD, a lecturer on Islam, a United Nations advisor and the author of many books. He was a full professor of the University of Cairo, on leave from there to be in New York as the director of the Federation of Islamic Associations in the United States and Canada. Several times, driving in that part of town, I had resisted the impulse to drop in at the FIA building, a brownstone at one Riverside Drive. Then one day, Dr. Shawabi and I were introduced by a newspaper man. He was cordial. He said he had followed me in the press, I said I'd been told of him, and we talked for 15 or 20 minutes. We both had to leave to make appointments we had, when he dropped on me something whose logic never would get out of my head. He said, No man has believed perfectly until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. Then there was my sister Ella herself. I couldn't get over what she'd done. I've said before, this is a strong, big, black Georgia-born woman. Her domineering ways had gotten her put out of the nation of Islam's Boston Mosque 11. 
They took her back, and then she left on her own. Ella had started studying under Boston Orthodox Muslims. Then she founded a school where Arabic was taught. She couldn't speak it. She hired teachers who did. That's Ella. She deals in real estate, and she was saving up to make the pilgrimage. Nearly all night we talked in her living room. She told me there was no question about it. It was more important that I go. I thought about Ella the whole flight back to New York. A strong woman. She'd broken the spirits of three husbands, more driving and dynamic than all of them combined. She'd played a very significant role in my life. No other woman ever was strong enough to point me in directions. I pointed women in directions. I had brought Ella into Islam, and now she was financing me to Mecca. Allah always gives you signs when you are with him that he is with you. When I applied for a visa to Mecca at the Saudi Arabian consulate, the Saudi ambassador told me that no Muslim converted in America could have a visa for the Hajj pilgrimage without the signed approval of Dr. Mahmoud Shawabi. But that was only the beginning of the sign from Allah. When I telephoned Dr. Shawabi, he registered astonishment. I was just going to get in touch with you, he said. By all means, come right over. When I got to his office, Dr. Shawabi handed me the signed letter approving me to make the Hajj in Mecca. And then a book. It was The Eternal Message of Muhammad by Abd ar-Rahman Azam. The author had just sent the copy of the book to be given to me, Dr. Shawabi said, and he explained that this author was an Egyptian-born Saudi citizen, an international statesman, and one of the closest advisors of Prince Faisal, the ruler of Arabia. He has followed you in the press very closely. It was hard for me to believe. Dr. Shawabi gave me the telephone number of his son, Mohammed Shawabi, a student in Cairo, and also the number of the author's son, Omar Azam, who lived in Jeddah. Your last stop before Mecca. Call them both by all means. I left New York quietly, little realizing that I was going to return noisily. Few people were told I was leaving at all. I didn't want some State Department or other roadblocks put in my path at the last minute. Only my wife, Betty, and my three girls and a few close associates came with me to Kennedy International Airport. When the Lufthansa Airlines jet had taken off, my two seat row mates and I introduced ourselves. Another sign. Both were Muslims. One was bound for Cairo, as I was, and the other was bound for Jeddah, where I would be in a few days. All the way to Frankfurt, Germany, my seat mates and I talked, or I read the book I'd been given. When we landed in Frankfurt, the brother bound for Jeddah said his warm goodbye to me and the Cairo-bound brother. We had a few hours layover before we would take another plane to Cairo. We decided to go sightseeing in Frankfurt. In the men's room there at the airport, I met the first American abroad who recognized me, a white student from Rhode Island. He kept eyeing me. Then he came over. Are you X? I laughed and said I was. I had never heard it that way. He exclaimed, You can't be. Boy, I know no one will believe me when I tell them this. He was attending school, he said, in France. The brother Muslim and I both were struck by the cordial hospitality of the people in Frankfurt. We went into a lot of shops and stores, looking more than intending to buy anything. We'd walk in any store, every store, and it would be, Hello. People who never saw you before and knew you were strangers. And the same cordiality when we left, without buying anything. In America, you walk in a store and spend a hundred dollars and leave, and you're still a stranger. Both you and the clerks act as though you're doing each other a favor. Europeans act more human, or humane, whichever the right word is. My brother Muslim, who could speak enough German to get by, would explain that we were Muslims. And I saw something I'd already experienced when I was looked upon as a Muslim, and not as a Negro, right in America. People seeing you as a Muslim saw you as a human being, and they had a different look, different talk, everything. In one Frankfurt store, a little shop actually, the storekeeper leaned over his counter to us and waved his hand, indicating the German people passing by. This way one day, that way another day. My Muslim brother explained to me that what he meant was that the Germans would rise again. Back at the Frankfurt airport, we took a United Arab Airlines plane on to Cairo. Throngs of people, obviously Muslims from everywhere, bound on the pilgrimage, were hugging and embracing. They were of all complexions. The whole atmosphere was of warmth and friendliness. The feeling hit me that there really wasn't any color problem here. The effect was as though I had just stepped out of a prison. I told my brother Muslim friend that I wanted to be a tourist in Cairo for a couple of days before continuing to Jeddah. He gave me his number and asked me to call him, as he wanted to put me with a party of his friends who could speak English and would be going on the pilgrimage and would be happy to look out for me. So I spent two happy days sightseeing in Cairo. I was impressed by the modern schools, housing developments for the masses, and the highways, and the industrialization that I saw. I had read and heard that President Nasser's administration had built up one of the most highly industrialized countries on the African continent. I believe what most surprised me was that in Cairo, automobiles were being manufactured. 
and also buses. I had a good visit with Dr. Shawabi's son, Mohammed Shawabi, a 19-year-old who was studying economics and political science at Cairo University. He told me that his father's dream was to build a university of Islam in the United States. The friendly people I met were astounded when they learned I was a Muslim, from America. They included an Egyptian scientist and his wife, also on their way to Mecca for the Hajj, who insisted I go with them to dinner in a restaurant in Heliopolis, a suburb of Cairo. They were an extremely well-informed and intelligent couple. Egypt's rising industrialization was one of the reasons why the Western powers were so anti-Egypt. It was showing other African countries what they should do, the scientist said. His wife asked me, Why are people in the world starving when America has so much surplus food? What do they do, dump it in the ocean? I told her, Yes, but they put some of it in the holes of surplus ships and in subsidized granaries and refrigerated space and let it stay there with a small army of caretakers until it's unfit to eat. Then another army of disposal people get rid of it to make space for the next surplus batch. She looked at me in something like disbelief. Probably she thought I was kidding. But the American taxpayer knows it's the truth. I didn't go on to tell her that right in the United States there are hungry people. I telephoned my Muslim friend as he'd asked, and the Hajj party of his friends was waiting for me. I made it eight of us, and they included a judge and an official of the Ministry of Education. They spoke English beautifully and accepted me like a brother. I considered it another of Allah's signs that wherever I turned, someone was there to help me, to guide me. The literal meaning of Hajj in Arabic is to set out toward a definite objective. In Islamic law, it means to set out for Kaaba, the sacred house, and to fulfill the pilgrimage rites. The Cairo airport was where scores of Hajj groups were becoming murim, pilgrims, upon entering the state of Iran, the assumption of a spiritual and physical state of consecration. Upon advice, I arranged to leave in Cairo all of my luggage and four cameras, one a movie camera. I had bought in Cairo a small valise, just big enough to carry one suit, shirt, a pair of underwear sets, and a pair of shoes into Arabia. Driving to the airport with our Hajj group, I began to get nervous, knowing that from therein I was going to be watching others who knew what they were doing and trying to do what they did. Entering the state of Iran, we took off our clothes and put on two white towels. One, the Izar, was folded around the loins. The other, the Rida, was thrown over the neck and shoulders, leaving the right shoulder and arm bare. A pair of simple sandals, the Nal, left the ankle bones bare. Over the Izar waist wrapper, a money belt was worn, and a bag, something like a woman's big handbag, with a long strap, was for carrying the passport and other valuable papers, such as the letter I had from Dr. Shawabi. Every one of the thousands at the airport about to leave for Jeddah was dressed this way. You could be a king or a peasant, and no one would know. Some powerful personages who were discreetly pointed out to me had on the same thing I had on. Once thus dressed, we all had begun intermittently calling out, La Beika! La Beika! Here I come, O Lord! The airport sounded with the din of Murim, expressing their intention to perform the journey of the Hajj. Plane loads of pilgrims were taking off every few minutes, but the airport was jammed with more, and their friends and relatives waiting to see them off. Those not going were asking others to pray for them at Mecca. We were on our plane in the air when I learned for the first time that with the crush there was not supposed to have been space for me, but strings had been pulled and someone had been put off because they didn't want to disappoint an American Muslim. I felt mingled emotions of regret that I had inconvenienced and discomforted whoever was bumped off the plane for me, and with that an utter humility and gratefulness that I had been paid such an honor and respect. Packed in the plane were white, black, brown, red, and yellow people, blue eyes and blonde hair, and my kinky red hair, all together, brothers, all honoring the same God, Allah, all in turn giving equal honor to each other. From some in our group, the word was spreading from seat to seat that I was a Muslim from America, faces turned, smiling toward me in greeting. A box lunch was passed out, and as we ate that, the word that a Muslim from America was aboard got up into the cockpit. The captain of the plane came back to meet me. He was an Egyptian. His complexion was darker than mine. He could have walked in Harlem, and no one would have given him a second glance. He was delighted to meet an American Muslim. When he invited me to visit the cockpit, I jumped at the chance. The co-pilot was darker than he was. I can't tell you the feeling it gave me. I had never seen a black man flying a jet. That instrument panel. No one ever could know what all of those dials meant. Both of the pilots were smiling at me, treating me with the same honor and respect I had received ever since I left America. I stood there looking through the glass of the sky ahead of us. In America I had ridden in more planes than probably any other Negro, and I never had been invited up into the cockpit. 
And there I was, with two Muslim seatmates, one from Egypt, the other from Arabia, all of us bound for Mecca, with me up in the pilot's cabin. Brother, I knew Allah was with me. I got back to my seat. All of the way, about an hour's flight, we pilgrims were loudly crying out, La Baika, La Baika. The plane landed at Jeddah. It's a seaport town on the Red Sea, the arrival or disembarkation point for all pilgrims who come to Arabia to go to Mecca. Mecca is about 40 miles to the east, inland. The Jeddah airport seemed even more crowded than Cairo's had been. Our party became another shuffling unit in the shifting mass with every race on earth represented. Each party was making its way toward the long line waiting to go through customs. Before reaching customs, each Hajj party was assigned a Mutawaf, who would be responsible for transferring that party from Jeddah to Mecca. Some pilgrims cried, La Baika. Others, sometimes large groups, were chanting in unison a prayer that I would translate. I submit to no one but thee, O Allah. I submit to no one but thee. I submit to thee because thou hast no partner. All praise and blessings come from thee, and thou art alone in thy kingdom. The essence of the prayer is the oneness of God. Only officials were not wearing the iram garb, or the white skull caps, long white nightshirt-looking gown, and the little slippers of the mutawaf, those who guided each pilgrim party and their helpers. In Arabic, an mm sound before a verb makes a verbal noun, so mutawaf meant the one who guides the pilgrims on the tawaf, which is the circumambulation of the Kaaba in Mecca. I was nervous, shuffling in the center of our group in the line waiting to have our passports inspected. I had an apprehensive feeling. Look what I'm handing them. I'm in the Muslim world, right at the fountain. I'm handing them the American passport, which signifies the exact opposite of what Islam stands for. The judge in our group sensed my strain. He patted my shoulder. Love, humility, and true brotherhood was almost a physical feeling wherever I turned. Then our group reached the clerks who examined each passport and suitcase carefully and nodded to the pilgrim to move on. I was so nervous that when I turned the key in my bag and it didn't work, I broke open the bag, fearing that they might think I had something in the bag that I shouldn't have. Then the clerk saw that I was handing him an American passport. He held it. He looked at me and said something in Arabic. My friends around me began speaking rapid Arabic, gesturing and pointing, trying to intercede for me. The judge asked me in English for my letter from Dr. Shawabi, and he thrust it at the clerk, who read it. He gave the letter back, protesting. I could tell that. An argument was going on. About me. I felt like a stupid fool, unable to say a word. I couldn't even understand what was being said. But finally, sadly, the judge turned to me. I had to go before the Magama Sharia, he explained. It was the Muslim high court which examined all possibly non-authentic converts to the Islamic religion seeking to enter Mecca. It was absolute that no non-Muslim could enter Mecca. My friends were going to have to go on to Mecca without me. They seemed stricken with concern for me. And I was stricken. I found the words to tell them, Don't worry, I'll be fine. Allah guides me. They said they would pray hourly in my behalf. The white-garbed Mutawaf was urging them on to keep schedule in the airport's human crush. With all of us waving, I watched them go. It was then about three in the morning, a Friday morning. I never had been in such a jammed mass of people, but I never had felt more alone and helpless since I was a baby. Worse, Friday in the Muslim world is a rough counterpart of Sunday in the Christian world. On Friday, all the members of a Muslim community gather to pray together. The event is called Yawm al jumua the day of gathering. It meant that no courts were held on Friday. I would have to wait until Saturday at least. An official beckoned a young Arab Mutawaf's aide. In broken English, the official explained that I would be taken to a place right at the airport. My passport was kept at customs. I wanted to object, because it is a traveler's first law never to get separated from his passport. But I didn't. In my wrapped towels and sandals, I followed the aide in his skull cap, long white gown, and slippers. I guess we were quite a sight. People passing us were speaking all kinds of languages. I couldn't speak anybody's language. I was in bad shape. Right outside the airport was a mosque, and above the airport was a huge dormitory-like building, four tiers high. It was semi-dark, not long before dawn, and planes were regularly taking off and landing, their landing lights sweeping the runways, or their wing and tail lights blinking in the sky. Pilgrims from Ghana, Indonesia, Japan and Russia, to mention some, were moving to and from the dormitory where I was being taken. I don't believe that motion picture cameras ever have filmed a human spectacle more colorful than my eyes took in. 
We reached the dormitory and began climbing up to the fourth top tier, passing members of every race on earth, Chinese, Indonesians, Afghanistanians. Many, not yet changed into the Iram garb, still wore their national dress. It was like pages out of the National Geographic magazine. My guide on the fourth tier gestured me into a compartment that contained about fifteen people, mostly curled up on their rugs asleep. I could tell that some were women, covered head and foot. An old Russian Muslim and his wife were not asleep. They stared frankly at me. Two Egyptian Muslims and a Persian roused and also stared as my guide moved us over into a corner. With gestures, he indicated that he would demonstrate to me the proper prayer ritual postures. Imagine being a Muslim minister, a leader in Elijah Muhammad's Nation of Islam, and not knowing the prayer ritual. I tried to do what he did. I knew I wasn't doing it right. I could feel the other Muslims' eyes on me. Western ankles won't do what Muslim ankles have done for a lifetime. Asians squat when they sit. Westerners sit upright in chairs. When my guide was down in a posture, I tried everything I could to get down as he was, but there I was, sticking up. After about an hour, my guide left, indicating that he would return later. I never even thought about sleeping. Watched by the Muslims, I kept practicing prayer posture. I refused to let myself think how ridiculous I must have looked to them. After a while, though, I learned a little trick that would let me get down closer to the floor. But after two or three days, my ankle was going to swell. As the sleeping Muslims woke up when dawn had broken, they almost instantly became aware of me, and we watched each other while they went about their business. I began to see what an important role the rug played in the overall cultural life of the Muslims. Each individual had a small prayer rug, and each man and wife or large group had a larger communal rug. These Muslims prayed on their rugs there in the compartment. Then they spread a tablecloth over the rug and ate, so the rug became the dining room. Removing the dishes and cloth, they sat on the rug, a living room. Then they curl up and sleep on the rug, a bedroom. In that compartment, before I was to leave it, it dawned on me for the first time why the fence had paid such a high price for oriental rugs when I had been a burglar in Boston. It was because so much intricate care was taken to weave fine rugs in countries where rugs were so culturally versatile. Later in Mecca, I would see yet another use of the rug. When any kind of a dispute arose, someone who was respected highly and who was not involved would sit on a rug with the disputers around him, which made the rug a courtroom. In other instances, it was a classroom. One of the Egyptian Muslims particularly kept watching me out of the corner of his eye. I smiled at him. He got up and came over to me. Hello, he said. It sounded like the Gettysburg Address. I beamed at him. Hello. I asked his name. Name? Name? He was trying hard, but he didn't get it. We tried some words on each other. I'd guess his English vocabulary spanned maybe twenty words, just enough to frustrate me. I was trying to get him to comprehend anything. Sky, I'd point. He'd smile. Sky, I'd say again, gesturing for him to repeat it after me. He would. Airplane. Rug. Foot. Sandal. Eyes. Like that. Then an amazing thing happened. I was so glad I had some communication with a human being, I was just saying whatever came to mind. I said, Muhammad Ali Clay. All of the Muslims listening lighted up like a Christmas tree. You? You? My friend was pointing at me. I shook my head. No, no. Muhammad Ali Clay, my friend. Friend. They half understood me. Some of them didn't understand, and that's how I began to get around that I was Cassius Clay, world heavyweight champion. I was later to learn that apparently every man, woman, and child in the Muslim world had heard how Sonny Liston, who in the Muslim world had the image of a man eating ogre, had been beaten in Goliath David fashion by Cassius Clay, who then had told the world that his name was Muhammad Ali and his religion was Islam and Allah had given him his victory. Establishing the rapport was the best thing that could have happened in the compartment. My being an American Muslim changed the attitudes from merely watching me to wanting to look out for me. Now the others began smiling steadily. They came closer. They were frankly looking me up and down, inspecting me, very friendly. I was like a man from Mars. The Mutawaf's aide returned, indicating that I should go with him. He pointed from our tier down at the mosque, and I knew that he'd come to take me to make the morning prayer, El Sob, always before sunrise. I followed him down, and we passed pilgrims by the thousands, babbling languages, everything but English. I was angry with myself for not having taken the time to learn more of the orthodox prayer rituals before leaving America. In Elijah Muhammad's nation of Islam, we hadn't prayed in Arabic. 
About a dozen or more years before, when I was in prison, a member of the Orthodox Muslim movement in Boston, named Abdul Hamid, had visited me and had later sent me prayers in Arabic. At that time I'd learned those prayers phonetically, but I hadn't used them since. I made up my mind to let the guy do everything first, and I would watch him. It wasn't hard to get him to do things first. He wanted to anyway. Just outside the mosque there was a long trough with rows of faucets. Ablutions had to proceed praying. I knew that. Even watching the Mutawaf's helper, I didn't get it right. There's an exact way that an orthodox Muslim washes, and the exact way is very important. I followed him into the mosque, just a step behind, watching. He did his prostration, his head to the ground. I did mine. Bismillahir Ramain Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. All Muslim prayers began that way. After that, I may not have been mumbling the right thing, but I was mumbling. I don't mean to have any of this sound joking. It was far from a joke with me. No one who happened to be watching could tell that I wasn't saying what the others said. After that sunrise prayer, my guide accompanied me back up to the fourth tier. By sign language, he said he would return within three hours, then he left. Our tier gave an excellent daylight view of the whole airport area. I stood at the railing, watching. Planes were landing and taking off like clockwork. Thousands upon thousands of people from all over the world made colorful patterns of movement. I saw groups leaving for Mecca in buses, trucks, cars. I saw some setting out to walk the forty miles. I wished that I could start walking. At least I knew how to do that. I was afraid to think what might lie ahead. Would I be rejected as a Mecca pilgrim? I wondered what the test would consist of, and when I would face the Muslim high court. The Persian Muslim in our compartment came up to me at the rail. He greeted me, hesitantly. Amer American? He indicated that he wanted me to come and have breakfast with him and his wife on their rug. I knew that it was an immense offer he was making. You don't have tea with a Muslim's wife. I didn't want to impose. I don't know if the Persian understood or not when I shook my head and smiled, meaning, no thanks. He brought me some tea and cookies anyway. Until then, I hadn't even thought about eating. Others made gestures. They would just come up and smile and nod at me. My first friend, the one who had spoken a little English, was gone. I didn't know it, but he was spreading the word of an American Muslim on the fourth tier. Traffic had begun to pick up, going past our compartment. Muslims in the Iram garb, or still in their national dress, walked slowly past, smiling. It would go on for as long as I was there to be seen, but I hadn't yet learned that I was the attraction. I've always been restless and curious. The Mutawaf's aide didn't return in the three hours he had said, and that made me nervous. I feared that he'd given up on me as beyond help. By then, too, I was really getting hungry. All of the Muslims in the compartment had offered me food, and I'd refused. The trouble was, I have to admit it, at that point I didn't know if I could go for their manner of eating. Everything was in one pot on the dining room rug, and I saw them just fall right in, using their hands. I kept standing at the tier railing, observing the courtyard below, and I decided to explore a bit on my own. I went down to the first tier. I thought then that maybe I shouldn't get too far, someone might come for me. So I went back up to our compartment. In about forty-five minutes I went back down. I went further this time, feeling my way. I saw a little restaurant in the courtyard. I went straight in there. It was jammed and babbling with languages. Using gestures, I bought a whole roasted chicken and something like thick potato chips. I got back out in the courtyard and I tore up that chicken, using my hands. Muslims were doing the same thing all around me. I saw men at least seventy years old bringing both legs up under them until they made a human knot of themselves, eating with as much aplomb and satisfaction as though they'd been in a fine restaurant with waiters all over the place. All ate as one and slept as one. Everything about the pilgrimage atmosphere accented the oneness of man under one God. I made during the day several trips up to the compartment and back out in the courtyard, each time exploring a little further than before. Once I nodded at two black men standing together. I nearly shouted when one spoke to me in British accented English. Before their party approached, ready to leave for Mecca, we were able to talk enough to exchange that I was American and they were Ethiopians. I was heartsick. I'd found two English-speaking Muslims at last, and they were leaving. The Ethiopians had both been schooled in Cairo, and they were living in Riyadh, the political capital of Arabia. I was later going to learn, to my surprise, that in Ethiopia, with 18 million people, 10 million are Muslims. Most people think Ethiopia is Christian, but only its government is Christian. The West has always helped to keep the Christian government in power. I just said my sunset prayer, El Maghrib, I was lying on my cot in the fourth tier compartment, feeling blue and alone, when out of the darkness came a sudden light. It was actually a sudden thought. 
On one of my venturings in the yard, full of activity below, I had noticed four men, officials, seated at a table with a telephone. Now I thought about seeing them there, and with telephone, my mind flashed to the connection that Dr. Shawabi in New York had given me, the telephone number of the son of the author of the book which had been given to me. Omar Azam lived right there in Jeddah. In a matter of a few minutes, I was downstairs and rushing to where I'd seen the four officials. One of them spoke functional English. I excitedly showed him the letter from Dr. Shawabi. He read it. Then he read it aloud to the other three officials. A Muslim from America. I could almost see it capture their imaginations and curiosity. They were very impressed. I asked the English-speaking one if he would please do me the favor of telephoning Dr. Omar Azam at the number I had. He was glad to do it. He got someone on the phone and conversed in Arabic. Dr. Omar Azam came straight to the airport. With the four officials beaming, he wrung my hand in welcome, a young, tall, powerfully built man. I'd say he was six foot three. He had an extremely polished manner. In America, he would have been called a white man. But it struck me hard and instantly from the way he acted. I had no feeling of him being a white man. Why didn't you call before, he demanded of me. He showed some identification to the four officials, and he used their phone. Speaking in Arabic, he was talking with some airport officials. Come, he said. In something less than half an hour, he had got me released, my suitcase and passport had been retrieved from customs, and we were in Dr. Azam's car, driving through the city of Jeddah, with me dressed in the Iram two towels and sandals. I was speechless at the man's attitude, and at my own physical feeling of no difference between us as human beings. I had heard for years of Muslim hospitality, but one couldn't quite imagine such warmth. I asked questions. Dr. Azam was a Swiss-trained engineer. His field was city planning. The Saudi Arabian government had borrowed him from the United Nations to direct all the reconstruction work being done on Arabian holy places. And Dr. Azam's sister was the wife of Prince Faisal's son. I was in a car with the brother-in-law of the son of the ruler of Arabia. Nor was that all that Allah had done. My father will be so happy to meet you, said Dr. Azam, the author who had sent me the book. I asked questions about his father. Abd ir Rahman Azam was known as Azam Pasha, or Lord Azam, until the Egyptian Revolution, when President Nasser eliminated all Lord and Noble titles. He should be at my home when we get there, Dr. Azam said. He spends much time in New York with his United Nations work, and he has followed you with great interest. I was speechless. It was early in the morning when we reached Dr. Azam's home. His father was there, his father's brother, a chemist, and another friend, all up that early, waiting. Each of them embraced me as though I were a long-lost child. I'd never seen these men before in my life, and they treated me so good. I'm going to tell you that I had never been so honored in my life, nor had I ever received such true hospitality. A servant brought tea and coffee and disappeared. I was urged to make myself comfortable. No women were anywhere in view. In Arabia, you could easily think there were no females. Dr. Abd Iraman Azam dominated the conversation. Why hadn't I called before? They couldn't understand why I hadn't. Was I comfortable? They seemed embarrassed that I'd spent the time at the airport, that I'd been delayed in getting to Mecca. No matter how I protested that I felt no inconvenience, that I was fine, they would not hear it. You must rest, Dr. Azam said. He went to use the telephone. I didn't know what this distinguished man was doing. I had no dream. When I was told that I would be brought back for dinner that evening, and that meanwhile I should get back in the car, how could I have realized that I was about to see the epitome of Muslim hospitality? Abdi Rahman Azam, when at home, lived in a suite at the Jeddah Palace Hotel. Because I'd come to them with a letter from a friend, he was going to stay at his son's home and let me use his suite until I could get on to Mecca. When I found out, there was no use protesting. I was in the suite. Young Dr. Azam was gone. There was no one to protest to. The three-room suite had a bathroom that was as big as a double at the New York Hilton. It was suite number 214. There was even a porch outside, affording a beautiful view of the ancient Red Sea city. There had never before been in my emotions such an impulse to pray, and I did, prostrating myself on the living room rug. Nothing in either of my two careers as a black man in America had served to give me any idealistic tendencies. My instincts automatically examined the reasons, the motives of anyone who did anything they didn't have to do for me. Always in my life, if there was any white person, I could see a selfish motive. But there in that hotel that morning, a telephone call and a few hours away from the cot on the fourth floor tier of the dormitory was one of the few times I had been so awed that I was totally without resistance. That white man, at least he would have been considered white in America, related to Arabia's ruler, to whom he was a close advisor, 
truly an international man with nothing in the world to gain, had given up his suite to me for my transient comfort. He had nothing to gain. He didn't need me. He had everything. In fact, he had more to lose than gain. He had followed the American press about me. If he did that, he knew there was only stigma attached to me. I was supposed to have horns. I was a racist. I was anti-white. And he, from all appearances, was white. I was supposed to be a criminal. Not only that, but everyone was even accusing me of using his religion of Islam as a cloak for my criminal practices and philosophies. Even if he had had some motive to use me, he knew that I was separated from Elijah Muhammad and the nation of Islam, my power base, according to the press in America. The only organization that I had was just a few weeks old. I had no job. I had no money. Just to get over there, I'd had to borrow money from my sister. That morning was when I first began to reappraise the white man. It was when I first began to perceive that white man, as commonly used, means complexion only secondarily. Primarily, it described attitudes and actions. In America, white man meant specific attitudes and actions toward the black man and toward all other non-white men. But in the Muslim world, I had seen that men with white complexions were more genuinely brotherly than anyone else had ever been. That morning was the start of a radical alteration in my whole outlook about white men. I should quote from my notebook here. I wrote this about noon in the hotel. My excitement, sitting here, waiting to go before the Hajj committee, is indescribable. My window faces to the sea, westward. The streets are filled with the incoming pilgrims from all over the world. The prayers are to Allah, and verses from the Koran are on the lips of everyone. Never have I seen such a beautiful sight, nor witnessed such a scene, nor felt such an atmosphere. Although I am excited, I feel safe and secure, thousands of miles from the totally different life that I have known. Imagine that twenty-four hours ago, I was in the fourth-floor room over the airport, surrounded by people with whom I could not communicate, feeling uncertain about the future and very lonely. And then one phone call, following Dr. Shawabi's instructions. I have met one of the most powerful men in the Muslim world. I will soon sleep in his bed at the Jeddah Palace. I know that I am surrounded by friends whose sincerity and religious zeal I can feel. I must pray again to thank Allah for this blessing. And I must pray again that my wife and children back in America will always be blessed for their sacrifices, too. I did pray. Two more prayers, as I told my notebook. Then I slept for about four hours until the telephone rang. It was young Dr. Azam. In another hour, he would pick me up to return me there for dinner. I tumbled words over one another, trying to express some of the thanks I felt for all of their actions. He cut me off. Masha'Allah, which means, it is as Allah has pleased. I seized the opportunity to run down into the lobby to see it again before Dr. Azam arrived. When I opened my door, just across the hall from me, a man in some ceremonial dress, who obviously lived there, was also headed downstairs, surrounded by attendants. I followed them down, then through the lobby. Outside, a small caravan of automobiles was waiting. My neighbor appeared through the Jeddah Palace Hotel's front entrance, and people rushed and crowded him, kissing his hand. I found out who he was, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Later in the hotel, I would have the opportunity to talk with him for about a half hour. He was a cordial man of great dignity. He was well up on world affairs and even the latest events in America. I will never forget the dinner at the Azam home. I quote my notebook again. I couldn't say in my mind that these were white men. Why, the men acted as if they were brothers of mine. The elder Dr. Azam as if he were my father. His fatherly, scholarly speech. I felt like he was my father. He was, you could tell, a highly skilled diplomat with a broad range of mind. His knowledge was so worldly. He was as current on world affairs as some people are to what's going on in their living room. The more we talked, the more his vast reservoir of knowledge and its variety seemed unlimited. He spoke of the racial lineage of the descendants of Muhammad the Prophet, and he showed how they were both black and white. He also pointed out how color, the complexities of color, and the problems of color which exist in the Muslim world exist only where, and to the extent that, that area of the Muslim world has been influenced by the West. He said that if one encountered any differences based on attitude toward color, this directly reflected the degree of Western influence. I learned during dinner that while I was at the hotel, the Hajj Committee Court had been notified about my case, and that in the morning I should be there. And I was. The judge was Sheikh Mohammed Harkon. The court was empty except for me and a sister from India, formerly a Protestant who had converted to Islam and was, like me, trying to make the Hajj. 
She was brown-skinned with a small face that was mostly covered. Judge Harkin was a kind, impressive man. We talked. He asked me some questions having to do with my sincerity. I answered him as truly as I could. He not only recognized me as a true Muslim, but he gave me two books, one in English, the other in Arabic. He recorded my name in the Holy Register of True Muslims, and we were ready to part. He told me, I hope you will become a great preacher of Islam in America. I said that I shared that hope, and I would try to fulfill it. The Azam family were very elated that I was qualified and accepted to go to Mecca. I had lunch at the Jeddah Palace. Then I slept again for several hours until the telephone awakened me. It was Muhammad Abdul Aziz Maged, the deputy chief of protocol for Prince Faisal. A special car will be waiting to take you to Mecca right after your dinner, he told me. He advised me to eat heartily, as the Hajj rituals require plenty of strength. I was beyond astonishment by then. Two young Arabs accompanied me to Mecca. A well-lighted modern turnpike highway made the trip easy. Guards at intervals along the way took one look at the car, and the driver made a sign, and we were passed through, never even having to slow down. I was all at once thrilled, important, humble, and thankful. Mecca, when we entered, seemed as ancient as time itself. Our car slowed through the winding streets, lined by shops on both sides, and with buses, cars, and trucks, and tens of thousands of pilgrims from all over the earth were everywhere. The car halted briefly at a place where a Mutawaf was waiting for me. He wore the white skull cap and long night shirt garb that I'd seen at the airport. He was a short, dark-skinned Arab named Muhammad. He spoke no English whatever. We parked near the great mosque. We performed our ablution and entered. Pilgrims seemed to be on top of each other. There were so many, lying, sitting, sleeping, praying, walking. My vocabulary cannot describe the new mosque that was being built around the Kaaba. I was thrilled to realize that it was only one of the tremendous rebuilding tasks under the direction of young Dr. Azan, who had just been my host. The great mosque of Mecca, when it is finished, will surpass the architectural beauty of India's Taj Mahal. Carrying my sandals, I followed the Matawaf. Then I saw the Kaaba, a huge black stone house in the middle of the great mosque. It was being circumambulated by thousands upon thousands of praying pilgrims, both sexes and every size, shape, color, and race in the world. I knew the prayer to be uttered when the pilgrims' eyes first perceived the Kaaba. Translated, it is, O oh God, you are peace, and peace derives from you. So greet us, O oh Lord, with peace. Upon entering the mosque, the pilgrim should try to kiss the Kaaba if possible, but if the crowds prevent him getting that close, he touches it, and if the crowds prevent that, he raises his hand and cries out, Takbir! God is great. I could not get within yards. Takbir! My feeling there in the house of God was a numbness. My Mutawaf led me in the crowd of praying, chanting pilgrims, moving seven times around the Kaaba. Some were bent and wizened with age. It was a sight that stamped itself on the brain. I saw incapacitated pilgrims being carried by others. Faces were enraptured in their faith. The seventh time around I prayed to Raqqa, prostrating myself, my head on the floor. The first prostration I prayed the Koran verse, Say he is God, the one and only. The second prostration, Say, O you who are unbelievers, I worship not that which you worship. As I prostrated, the Mutawa fended pilgrims off to keep me from being trampled. The Mutawa and I next drank water from the well of Zemzem. Then we ran between the two hills, Safa and Marwa, where Hajar wandered over the same earth searching for water for her child, Ishmael. Three separate times after that, I visited the great mosque and circumambulated the Kaaba. The next day we set out after sunrise toward Mount Arafat, thousands of us, crying in unison, La Beika, La Beika, and Allah Akbar. Mecca is surrounded by the crudest-looking mountains I've ever seen. They seem to be made of the slag from a blast furnace. No vegetation is on them at all. Arriving about noon, we prayed and chanted from noon until sunset, and the Azr, afternoon, and Maghrib, sunset, special prayers were performed. Finally, we lifted our hands in prayer and thanksgiving, repeating Allah's words. There is no God but Allah. He has no partner. His are authority and praise. Good emanates from Him, and He has power over all things. Standing on Mount Arafat had concluded the essential rites of being a pilgrim to Mecca. 
no one who missed it could consider himself a pilgrim. The Iram had ended. We cast the traditional seven stones at the devil. Some had their hair and beards cut. I decided that I was going to let my beard remain. I wondered what my wife Betty and our little daughters were going to say when they saw me with a beard when I got back to New York. End of side nine. Side ten. The autobiography of Malcolm X. Continuing on page 337. New York seemed a million miles away. I hadn't seen a newspaper that I could read since I left New York. I had no idea what was happening there. A Negro rifle club that had been in existence for over 12 years in Harlem had been discovered by the police. It was being trumpeted that I was behind it. Elijah Muhammad's Nation of Islam had a lawsuit going against me to force me and my family to vacate the house in which we lived on Long Island. The major press, radio, and television media in America had representatives in Cairo hunting all over, trying to locate me, to interview me about the furor in New York that I had allegedly caused when I knew nothing about any of it. I only knew what I'd left in America and how it contrasted with what I'd found in the Muslim world. About twenty of us Muslims who had finished the Hajj were sitting in a huge tent on Mount Arafat. As a Muslim from America, I was the center of attention. They asked me what about the Hajj had impressed me the most. One of the several who spoke English asked. They translated my answers for the others. My answer to that question was not the one they expected, but it drove home my point. I said, the brotherhood. The people of all races, colors from all over the world coming together as one. It has proved to me the power of the one God. It may have been out of taste, but that gave me an opportunity, and I used it to preach them a quick little sermon on America's racism and its evils. I could tell the impact of this upon them. They had been aware that the plight of the black man in America was bad, but they had not been aware that it was inhuman, that it was a psychological castration. These people from elsewhere around the world were shocked. As Muslims, they had a very tender heart for all unfortunates and very sensitive feelings for truth and justice. And in everything I said to them, as long as we talked, they were aware of the yardstick that I was using to measure everything. That to me the earth's most explosive and pernicious evil is racism, the inability of God's creatures to live as one, especially in the Western world. I have reflected since that the letter I finally sat down to compose had been subconsciously shaping itself in my mind. The color blindness of the Muslim world's religious society and the color blindness of the Muslim world's human society. These two influences had each day been making a greater impact and an increasing persuasion against my previous way of thinking. The first letter was, of course, to my wife, Betty. I never had a moment's question that Betty, after initial amazement, would change her thinking to join mine. I had known a thousand reassurances that Betty's faith in me was total. I knew that she would see what I had seen, that in the land of Muhammad and the land of Abraham, I had been blessed by Allah with a new insight into the true religion of Islam and a better understanding of America's entire racial dilemma. After the letter to my wife, I wrote next essentially the same letter to my sister Ella, and I knew where Ella would stand. She had been saving to make the pilgrimage to Mecca herself. I wrote to Dr. Shawabi, whose belief in my sincerity had enabled me to get a passport to Mecca. All through the night, I copied similar long letters for others who were very close to me. Among them was Elijah Muhammad's son, Wallace Muhammad, who had expressed to me his conviction that the only possible salvation for the nation of Islam would be its accepting and projecting a better understanding of orthodox Islam. And I wrote to my loyal assistants at my newly formed Muslim Mosque Incorporated in Harlem, with a note appended, asking that my letter be duplicated and distributed to the press. I knew that when my letter became public knowledge back in America, many would be astounded, loved ones, friends, and enemies alike, and no less astounded would be millions whom I did not know, who had gained during my twelve years with Elijah Muhammad a hate image of Malcolm X. Even I was myself astounded, but there was precedent in my life for this letter. My whole life had been a chronology of changes. Here is what I wrote from my heart. Never have I witnessed such sincere hospitality and the overwhelming spirit of true brotherhood as is practiced by people of all colors and races here in this ancient holy land, the home of Abraham, Muhammad, and all the other prophets of the Holy Scriptures. For the past week I have been utterly speechless and spellbound by the graciousness I see displayed all around me by people of all colors. I have been blessed to visit the holy city of Mecca. I have made my seven circuits around the Kaaba, led by a young Mutawaf named Muhammad. 
I drank water from the well of Zemzem. I ran seven times back and forth between the hills of Mount Al-Safa and Al-Mawa. I prayed in the ancient city of Mina, and I prayed on Mount Arafat. There were tens of thousands of pilgrims from all over the world. They were of all colors, from blue-eyed blondes to black-skinned Africans. But we were all participating in the same ritual, displaying a spirit of unity and brotherhood that my experiences in America had led me to believe never could exist between the white and the non-white. America needs to understand Islam, because this is the one religion that erases from its society the race problem. Throughout my travels in the Muslim world, I have met, talked to, and even eaten with people who in America would have been considered white, but the white attitude was removed from their minds by the religion of Islam. I have never before seen sincere and true brotherhood practiced by all colors together, irrespective of their color. You may be shocked by these words coming from me, but on this pilgrimage, what I have seen and experienced has forced me to rearrange much of my thought patterns previously held and to toss aside some of my previous conclusions. This was not too difficult for me. Despite my firm convictions, I have been always a man who tries to face facts and to accept the reality of life as new experience and new knowledge unfolds it. I have always kept an open mind, which is necessary to the flexibility that must go hand in hand with every form of intelligent search for truth. During the past eleven days here in the Muslim world, I have eaten from the same plate, drunk from the same glass, and slept in the same bed or on the same rug, while praying to the same God, with fellow Muslims whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde, and whose skin was the whitest of white. And in the words, and in the actions, and in the deeds of the white Muslims, I felt the same sincerity that I felt among the black African Muslims of Nigeria, Sudan, and Ghana. We were truly all the same, brothers, because their belief in one God had removed the white from their minds, the white from their behavior, and the white from their attitude. I could see from this that perhaps if white Americans could accept the oneness of God, then perhaps, too, they could accept in reality the oneness of man and cease to measure and hinder and harm others in terms of their differences in color. With racism plaguing America like an incurable cancer, the so-called Christian white American heart should be more receptive to a proven solution to such a destructive problem. Perhaps it could be in time to save America from imminent disaster, the same destruction brought upon Germany by racism that eventually destroyed the Germans themselves. Each hour here in the Holy Land enables me to have greater spiritual insights into what is happening in America between black and white. The American Negro never can be blamed for his racial animosities. He is only reacting to 400 years of the conscious racism of the American whites. But as racism leads America up the suicide path, I do believe, from the experiences that I've had with them, that the whites of the younger generation, in the colleges and universities, will see the handwriting on the wall, and many of them will turn to the spiritual path of truth, the only way left to America to ward off the disaster that racism inevitably must lead to. Never have I been so highly honored. Never have I been made to feel more humble and unworthy. Who would believe the blessings that have been heaped upon an American Negro? A few nights ago, a man who would be called in America a white man, a United Nations diplomat, an ambassador, a companion of kings, gave me his hotel suite, his bed. By this man, His Excellency Prince Faisal, who rules this holy land, was made aware of my presence here in Jeddah. The very next morning, Prince Faisal's son, in person, informed me that by the will and decree of his esteemed father, I was to be a state guest. The deputy chief of protocol himself took me before the Hajj court. His Holiness Sheikh Mohammed Harkon himself okayed my visit to Mecca. His Holiness gave me two books on Islam, with his personal seal and autograph, and he told me that he prayed that I would be a successful preacher of Islam in America. A car, a driver, and a guide have been placed at my disposal, making it possible for me to travel about this holy land almost at will. The government provides air-conditioned quarters and servants in each city that I visit. 
never would I have even thought of dreaming that I would ever be a recipient of such honors, honors that in America would be bestowed upon a king, not a Negro. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. Sincerely, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X. Chapter 18 El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. Prince Faisal, the absolute ruler of Arabia, had made me a guest of the state. Among the courtesies and privileges which this brought to me, especially, shamelessly, I relished the chauffeured car which toured me around in Mecca with the chauffeur guide pointing out sites of particular significance. Some of the holy city looked as ancient as time itself. Other parts of it resembled a modern Miami suburb. I cannot describe with what feelings I actually pressed my hands against the earth where the great prophets had trod four thousand years before. The Muslim from America excited everywhere the most intense curiosity and interest. I was mistaken time and again for Cassius Clay. A local newspaper printed a photograph of Cassius and me together at the United Nations. Through my chauffeur guide interpreter, I was asked scores of questions about Cassius. Even children knew of him and loved him there in the Muslim world. By popular demand, the cinemas throughout Africa and Asia had shown his fight. At that moment in young Cassius' career, he had captured the imagination and the support of the entire dark world. My car took me to participate in special prayers at Mount Arafat and at Mina. The roads offered the wildest drives that I'd ever known. Nightmare traffic, brakes squealing, skidding cars and horns blowing. I believe that all of the driving in the Holy Land is done in the name of Allah. I had begun to learn the prayers in Arabic. Now my biggest prayer difficulty was physical. The unaccustomed prayer posture had caused my big toe to swell, and it pained me. But the Muslim world's customs no longer seemed strange to me. My hands now readily plucked up food from a common dish shared with brother Muslims. I was drinking without hesitation from the same glass as others. I was washing from the same little pitcher of water, and sleeping with eight or ten others on a mat in the open. I remember one night at Muzdalifa, with nothing but the sky overhead, I lay awake amid sleeping Muslim brothers, and I learned that pilgrims from every land, every color and class and rank, high officials and the beggar alike, all snored in the same language. I'll bet that in the parts of the Holy Land that I visited a million bottles of soft drinks were consumed, and ten million cigarettes must have been smoked, particularly the Arab Muslims smoked constantly, even on the Hajj pilgrimage itself. The smoking evil wasn't invented in Prophet Muhammad's days. If it had been, I believe he would have banned it. It was the largest Hajj in history, I was later told. Qasem Gulek of the Turkish Parliament, beaming with pride, informed me that from Turkey alone over 600 buses, over 50,000 Muslims had made the pilgrimage. I told him that I dreamed to see the day when shiploads and plane loads of American Muslims would come to Mecca for the Hajj. There was a color pattern in the huge crowds. Once I happened to notice this, I closely observed it thereafter. Being from America made me intensely sensitive to matters of color. I saw that people who looked alike drew together and most of the time stayed together. This was entirely voluntary, there being no other reason for it. But Africans were with Africans, Pakistanis were with Pakistanis, and so on. I tucked it into my mind that when I returned home I would tell Americans this observation, that where true brotherhood existed among all colors, where no one felt segregated, where there was no superiority complex, no inferiority complex, then voluntarily, naturally, people of the same kind felt drawn together by that which they had in common. It is my intention that by the time of my next Hajj pilgrimage, I will have at least a working vocabulary of Arabic. In my ignorant, crippled condition in the Holy Land, I have been lucky to have met patient friends who enabled me to talk by interpreting for me. Never before in my life had I felt so deaf and dumb as during the times when no interpreter was with me to tell me what was being said around me, or about me, or even to me by other Muslims, before they learned that the Muslim from America knew only a few prayers in Arabic, and beyond that he could only nod and smile. Behind my nods and smiles, though, I was doing some American-type thinking and reflection. I saw that Islam's conversions around the world could double and triple if the colorfulness and the true spiritualness of the Hajj pilgrimage were properly advertised and communicated to the outside world. I saw that the Arabs are poor at understanding the psychology of non-Arabs and the importance of public relations. The Arabs said, Insha'Allah, God willing. Then they waited for converts. Even by this means, Islam was on the march. But I knew that with improved public relations methods, the number of new converts turning to Allah could be turned into millions. Constantly, wherever I went, I was asked questions about America's racial discrimination. Even with my background, I was astonished at the degree to which the major single image of America seemed to be discrimination. 
in a hundred different conversations in the Holy Land with Muslims high and low, and from around the world. And later, when I got to black Africa, I don't have to tell you never once did I bite my tongue or miss a single opportunity to tell the truth about the crimes, the evils, and the indignities that are suffered by the black man in America. Through my interpreter, I lost no opportunity to advertise the American black man's real plight. I preached it on the mountain at Arafat. I preached it in the busy lobby of the Jeddah Palace Hotel. I would point it one after another to bring it closer to home. You, 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 because of your dark skin in America, you too would be called Negro. You could be bombed and shot and cattle prodded and fire hosed and beaten because of your complexions. As some of the poorest pilgrims heard me preach, so did some of the holy world's most important personages. I talked at length with the blue-eyed, blonde-haired Hussein Amini, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. We were introduced on Mount Arafat by Qasem Gulek of the Turkish Parliament. Both were learned men. Both were especially well-read on America. Qasem Gulek asked me why I had broken with Elijah Muhammad. I said that I preferred not to elaborate upon our differences in the interests of preserving the American black man's unity. They both understood and accepted that. I talked with the mayor of Mecca, Sheikh Abdullah Iraif, who, when he was a journalist, had criticized the methods of the Mecca municipality, and Prince Faisal made him the mayor to see if he could do any better. Everyone generally acknowledged that Sheikh Iraif was doing fine. A filmed feature, The Muslim from America, was made by Ahmed Hariyallah, and his partner, Esid Mohammed, of Tunis Television Station. In America once, in Chicago, Ahmed Hoyala had interviewed Elijah Muhammad. The lobby of the Jeddah Palace Hotel offered me frequent, sizable, informal audiences of important men from many different countries who were curious to hear the American Muslim. I met many Africans who had either spent some time in America or who had heard other Africans' testimony about America's treatment of the black man. I remember how before one large audience... One cabinet minister from black Africa, he knew more about worldwide current events than anyone else I've ever met, told of his occasionally traveling in the United States, north and south, deliberately not wearing his national dress. Just recalling the indignities he had met as a black man seemed to expose some raw nerve in this highly educated, dignified official. His eyes blazed in his passionate anger. His hands hacked the air. Why is the American black man so complacent about being trampled upon? Why doesn't the American black man fight to be a human being? A Sudanese high official hugged me. You champion the American black people. An Indian official wept in his compassion for my brothers in your land. I reflected many, many times to myself upon how the American Negro has been entirely brainwashed from ever seeing or thinking of himself as he should as a part of the non-white peoples of the world. The American Negro has no conception of the hundreds of millions of other non-whites concerned for him. He has no conception of their feeling of brotherhood for and with him. It was there in the Holy Land, and later in Africa, that I formed a conviction which I've had ever since, that a topmost requisite for any Negro leader in America ought to be extensive traveling in the non-white lands on this earth, and the travel should include many conferences with the ranking men of those lands. I guarantee that any honest, open-minded Negro leader would return home with more effective thinking about alternative avenues to solutions of the American black man's problem. Above all, the Negro leaders would find that many non-white officials of the highest standing, especially Africans, would tell them privately that they would be glad to throw their weight behind the Negro cause in the United Nations and in other ways. But these officials understandably feel that the Negro in America is so confused and divided that he doesn't himself know what his cause is. Again, it was mainly Africans who variously expressed to me that no one would wish to be embarrassed trying to help a brother who shows no evidence that he wants that help and who seems to refuse to cooperate in his own interests. The American black leader's most critical problem is lack of imagination. His thinking, his strategies, if any, are always limited, at least basically, to only that which is either advised or approved by the white man. And the first thing the American power structure doesn't want any Negroes to start is thinking internationally. I think the single worst mistake of the American black organizations and their leaders is that they fail to establish direct brotherhood lines of communication between the independent nations of Africa and the American black people. Why, every day the black African heads of state should be receiving direct accounts of the latest developments in the American black man's struggles, instead of the U.S. State Department's releases to Africans which always imply that the American black man's struggle is being solved. Two American authors, bestsellers in the Holy Land, had helped to spread and intensify the concern for the American black man. James Baldwin's books, translated, had made a tremendous impact, as had the book Black Like Me by John Griffin, 
If you're unfamiliar with that book, it tells how the white man Griffin blackened his skin and spent two months traveling as a Negro about America. Then Griffin wrote of the experiences that he met. A frightening experience, I heard exclaimed many times by people in the Holy World who had read the popular book. But I never heard it without opening their thinking further. Well, if it was a frightening experience for him as nothing but a make-believe Negro for sixty days, then you think about what real Negroes in America have gone through for four hundred years. One honor that came to me I prayed for. His Eminence, Prince Faisal, invited me to a personal audience with him. As I entered the room, tall, handsome Prince Faisal came from behind his desk. I never will forget the reflection I had at that instant that here was one of the world's most important men, and yet with his dignity one saw clearly his sincere humility. He indicated for me a chair opposite from his. Our interpreter was the deputy chief of protocol, Mohammed Abdulaziz Maged, an Egyptian-born Arab who looked like a Harlem Negro. Prince Faisal impatiently gestured when I began stumbling for words trying to express my gratitude for the great honor he had paid me in making me a guest of the state. It was only Muslim hospitality to another Muslim, he explained and I was an unusual Muslim from America. He asked me to understand above all that whatever he had done had been his pleasure, with no other motives whatever. A gliding servant served a choice of two kinds of tea as Prince Faisal talked. His son, Muhammad Faisal, had met me on American television while attending a Northern California university. Prince Faisal had read Egyptian writers' articles about the American black Muslims. If what these writers say is true, the black Muslims have the wrong Islam, he said. I explained my role of the previous twelve years of helping to organize and to build the nation of Islam. I said that my purpose for making the Hajj was to get an understanding of true Islam. That is good, Prince Faisal said, pointing out that there was an abundance of English translation literature about Islam, so that there was no excuse for ignorance and no reason for sincere people to allow themselves to be misled. The last of April, 1964, I flew to Beirut, the seaport capital of Lebanon. A part of me I left behind in the holy city of Mecca, and in turn I took away with me forever a part of Mecca. I was on my way now to Nigeria, then Ghana, but some friends I made in the Holy Land had urged and insisted that I make some stops en route, and I had agreed. For example, it had been arranged that I would first stop and address the faculty and the students at the American University of Beirut. In Beirut's Palm Beach Hotel, I luxuriated in my first long sleep since I had left America. Then I went walking, fresh from weeks in the Holy Land. Immediately my attention was struck by the mannerisms and attire of the Lebanese women. In the Holy Land there had been the very modest, very feminine Arabian women. And there was this sudden contrast of the half-French, half-Arab Lebanese women who projected in their dress and street manners more liberty, more boldness. I saw clearly the obvious European influence upon the Lebanese culture. It showed me how any country's moral strength or its moral weakness, is quickly measurable by the street attire and attitude of its women, especially its young women. Wherever the spiritual values have been submerged, if not destroyed, by an emphasis upon the material things, invariably the women reflect it. Witness the women, both young and old, in America, where scarcely any moral values are left. There seems in most countries to be either one extreme or the other. Truly a paradise could exist wherever material progress and spiritual values could be properly balanced. I spoke of the University of Beirut, the truth of the American black man's condition. I previously made the comment that any experienced public speaker can feel his audience's reactions. As I spoke, I felt the subjective and defensive reactions of the American white students present. But gradually their hostilities lessened as I continued to present the unassailable facts. But the students of African heritage... Well, I'll never get over how the African displays his emotions. Later, with astonishment, I heard that the American press carried stories that my Beirut speech caused a riot. What kind of a riot? I don't know how any reporter in good conscience could have cabled that across the ocean. The Beirut Daily Star front-page report of my speech mentioned no riot, because there was none. When I was done, the African students all but besieged me for autographs. Some of them even hugged me. Never have even American Negro audiences accepted me as I've been accepted time and again by the less inhibited, more down-to-earth Africans. From Beirut, I flew back to Cairo and there I took a train to Alexandria, Egypt. I kept my camera busy during each brief stopover. Finally, I was on a plane to Nigeria. During the six-hour flight, when I was not talking with the pilot, who had been a 1960 Olympic swimmer, 
I sat with a passionately political African. He almost shouted in his fervor. When people are in a stagnant state and are being brought out of it, there is no time for voting. His central theme was that no new African nation trying to decolonize itself needed any political system that would permit division and bickering. The people don't know what the vote means. It is the job of the enlightened leaders to raise the people's intellect. In Lagos, I was greeted by Professor Essien Udom of the Ibadan University. We were both happy to see each other. We'd met in the United States as he had researched the nation of Islam for his book, Black Nationalism. At his home that evening, a dinner was held in my honor, attended by other professors and professional people. As we ate, a young doctor asked me if I knew that New York City's press was highly upset about a recent killing in Harlem of a white woman, for which, according to the press, many were blaming me, at least indirectly. An elderly white couple who owned a Harlem clothing store had been attacked by several young Negroes, and the wife was stabbed to death. Some of these young Negroes, apprehended by the police, had described themselves as belonging to an organization they called Blood Brothers. These youths, allegedly, had said or implied that they were affiliated with black Muslims who had split away from the nation of Islam to join up with me. I told the dinner guests that it was my first word of any of it, but that I was not surprised when violence happened in any of America's ghettos where black men had been living packed like animals and treated like lepers. I said that the charge against me was typical white man scapegoat seeking that whenever something white men disliked happened in the black community, typically white public attention was directed not at the cause, but at a selected scapegoat. As for the blood brothers, I said I considered all Negroes to be my blood brothers. I said that the white man's efforts to make my name poison actually succeeded only in making millions of black people regard me like Joe Lewis. Speaking in the Ibadan University's Trenchard Hall, I urged that Africa's independent nations needed to see the necessity of helping to bring the Afro-Americans' case before the United Nations. I said that just as the American Jew is in political, economic, and cultural harmony with world Jewry, I was convinced that it was time for all Afro-Americans to join the world's pan-Africanists. I said that physically we Afro-Americans might remain in America, fighting for our constitutional rights, but that philosophically and culturally we Afro-Americans badly needed to return to Africa, and to develop a working unity in the framework of Pan-Africanism. Young Africans ask me politically sharper questions than one hears from most American adults. Then an astonishing thing happened when one old West Indian stood and began attacking me for attacking America. Shut up! Shut up! Students yelled, booing and hissing. The old West Indian tried to express defiance of them, and in a sudden rush a group of students sprang up and were after him. He barely escaped ahead of them. I never saw anything like it. Screaming at him, they ran him off the campus. Later I found out that the old West Indian was married to a white woman and he was trying to get a job in some white-influenced agency which had put him up to challenge me. Then I understood his problem. This wasn't the last time I'd see the Africans' almost fanatic expression of their political emotions. Afterward, in the Students' Union, I was plied with questions and I was made an honorary member of the Nigerian Muslim Students' Society. Right here in my wallet is my card. Alhaji Malcolm X, registration number M138. With the membership, I was given a new name, Omowale. It means in the Yoruba language, the son who has come home. I meant it when I told them I had never received a more treasured honor. Six hundred members of the Peace Corps were in Nigeria, I learned. Some white Peace Corps members who talked with me were openly embarrassed at the guilt of their race in America. Among the twenty Negro Peace Corps men I talked with, a very impressive fellow to me was Larry Jackson, a Morgan State College graduate from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, who had joined the Peace Corps in 1962. I made Nigerian radio and television program appearances. When I remember seeing black men operating their own communications agencies, a thrill still runs up my spine. The reporters who interviewed me included an American Negro from Newsweek magazine. His name was Williams. Traveling through Africa, he had recently interviewed Prime Minister Nkrumah, Talking with me privately, one group of Nigerian officials told me how skillfully the U.S. information agency sought to spread among Africans the impression that American Negroes were steadily advancing and that the race problem soon would be solved. One high official told me, our informed leaders and many, many others know otherwise. He said that behind the diplomatic front of every African U.N. official was recognition of the white man's gigantic duplicity and conspiracy to keep the world's peoples of African heritage separated both physically and ideologically, from each other. In your land, how many black people think about it that South and Central and North America contain over 
80 million people of African descent, he asked me. The world's course will change the day the African heritage peoples come together as brothers. I never had heard that kind of global black thinking from any black man in America. From Lagos, Nigeria, I flew on to Accra, Ghana. I think that nowhere is the black continent's wealth and the natural beauty of its people richer than in Ghana, which is so proudly the very fountainhead of Pan-Africanism. I stepped off the plane into a jarring note. A red-faced American white man recognized me. He had the nerve to come up grabbing my hand and telling me in a molasses drawl that he was from Alabama, and then he invited me to his home for dinner. My hotel's dining room when I went to breakfast was full of more of those whites, discussing Africa's untapped wealth as though the African waiters had no ears. It nearly ruined my meal, thinking how in America they sicked police dogs on black people and threw bombs in black churches while blocking the doors of their white churches, and now once again in the land where their forefathers had stolen blacks and thrown them into slavery was that white man. Right there at my Ghanaian breakfast table was where I made up my mind that as long as I was in Africa, every time I opened my mouth, I was going to make things hot for that white man, grinning through his teeth wanting to exploit Africa again. It had been her human wealth the last time, now he wanted Africa's mineral wealth. And I knew that my reacting as I did presented no conflict with the convictions of brotherhood which I'd gained in the Holy Land. The Muslims of white complexions who had changed my opinions were men who had showed me that they practiced genuine brotherhood. And I knew that any American white man with a genuine brotherhood for a black man was hard to find, no matter how much he'd grinned. The author, Julian Mayfield, seemed to be the leader of Ghana's little colony of Afro-American expatriates. When I telephoned Mayfield, in what seemed no time at all, I was sitting in his home, surrounded by about 40 black American expatriates. They had been waiting for my arrival. There were business and professional people, such as the militant former Brooklynites, Dr. and Mrs. Robert E. Lee, both of them dentists, who had given up their United States citizenship. Such others as Alice Wyndham, Maya Angelou Marque, Victoria Garvin, and Leslie Lacey had even formed a Malcolm X committee to guide me through a whirlwind calendar of appearances and social events. In my briefcase, here are some of the African press stories which had appeared when it was learned that I was en route. Malcolm X's name is almost as familiar to Ghanaians as the southern dogs, fire hoses, cattle prods, people sticks, and the ugly, hate-contorted white faces. Malcolm X's decision to enter the mainstream of the struggle heralds a hopeful sign on the sickeningly dismal scene of brutalized, non-violent, passive resistance. An extremely important fact is that Malcolm X is the first Afro-American leader of national standing to make an independent trip to Africa since Dr. Du Bois came to Ghana. This may be the beginning of a new phase in our struggle. Let's make sure we don't give it less thought than the State Department is doubtless giving it right now. And another. Malcolm X is one of our most significant and militant leaders. We are in a battle. Efforts will be made to malign and discredit him. I simply couldn't believe this kind of reception 5,000 miles from America. The officials of the press had even arranged to pay my hotel expenses, and they would hear no objection that I made. They included T.D. Bafour, the editor-in-chief of the Ghanaian Times, G.T. Anim, the managing director of the Ghana News Agency, Kofi Batsa, the editor of Spark and the secretary-general of the Pan-African Union of Journalists, and Mr. Cameron Duodu, and others. I could only thank them all. Then, during the beautiful dinner which had been prepared by Julian Mayfield's pretty Puerto Rican wife, Anna Livia, she was in charge of Accra's district health program, I was plied with questions by the eagerly interested black expatriates from America who had returned to Mother Africa. I can only wish that every American black man could have shared my ears, my eyes, and my emotions throughout the round of engagements which had been made for me in Ghana. And my point in saying this is not the reception that I personally received as an individual of whom they had heard, but it was the reception tended to me as the symbol of the militant American black man, as I had the honor to be regarded. At a jam-packed press club conference, I believe the very first question was why had I split with Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. The Africans had heard such rumors as that Elijah Muhammad had built a palace in Arizona. I straightened out that falsehood, and I avoided any criticism. I said that our disagreement had been in terms of political direction and involvement in the extra-religious struggle for human rights. I said I respected the Nation of Islam for its having been a psychologically revitalizing movement and a source of moral and social reform, and that Elijah Muhammad's influence upon the American black man had been basic. I stressed to the assembled press the need for mutual communication and support between the Africans and Afro-Americans whose struggles were interlocked. 
I remember that in the press conference I used the word Negro, and I was firmly corrected. The word is not favored here, Mr. Malcolm X. The term Afro-American has greater meaning and dignity. I sincerely apologized. I don't think that I said Negro again as long as I was in Africa. I said that the 22 million Afro-Americans in the United States could become for Africa a great positive force, while in turn the African nations could and should exert positive force at diplomatic levels against America's racial discrimination. I said, all of Africa unites in opposition to South Africa's apartheid and to the oppression in the Portuguese territories. But you waste your time if you don't realize that Vavot and Salazar and Britain and France never could last a day if it were not for United States support. So until you expose the man in Washington, D.C., you haven't accomplished anything. I knew that the State Department's G. Menon Williams was officially visiting in Africa. I said, take my word for it. You'd be suspicious of all these American officials who come to Africa grinning in your faces when they don't grin in ours back home. I told them that my own father was murdered by whites in the state of Michigan where G. Menon Williams once was the governor. I was honored at the Ghana Club by more press representatives and dignitaries. I was the guest at the home of the late black American author Richard Wright's daughter, beautiful, slender, soft-voiced Julia, whose young French husband publishes a Ghanaian paper. Later in Paris, I was to meet Richard Wright's widow, Ellen, and a younger daughter, Rachel. I talked with ambassadors at their embassies. The Algerian ambassador impressed me as a man who was dedicated totally to militancy and to world revolution as the way to solve the problems of the world's oppressed masses. His perspective was attuned not just to Algerians, but to include the Afro-Americans and all others anywhere who were oppressed. The Chinese ambassador, Mr. Huang Ha, a most perceptive and also most militant man, focused upon the efforts of the West to divide Africans from the peoples of African heritage elsewhere. The Nigerian ambassador was deeply concerned about the Afro-Americans' plight in America. He had personal knowledge of their suffering, having lived and studied in Washington, D.C. Similarly, the most sympathetic Mali ambassador had been in New York of the United Nations. I breakfasted with Dr. McConnell of British Guiana. We discussed the need for the type of pan-African unity that would also include the Afro-Americans. And I had a talk in depth about Afro-American problems with Nana Nketsia, the Ghanaian Minister of Culture. Once, when I returned to my hotel, a New York City call was waiting for me from Mal Good of the American Broadcasting Company. Over the telephone, Mal Good asked me questions that I answered for his beeping tape recorder about the Blood Brothers in Harlem, the rifle clubs for Negroes, and other subjects with which I was being kept identified in the American press. In the University of Ghana's Great Hall, I addressed the largest audience that I would in Africa, mostly Africans, but also numerous whites. Before this audience, I tried my best to demolish the false image of American race relations that I knew was spread by the U.S. Information Agency. I tried to impress upon them all the true picture of the Afro-Americans' plight at the hands of the white man. I worked on those whites there in the audience. I've never seen so many whites so nice to so many blacks as you white people here in Africa. In America, Afro-Americans are struggling for integration. They should come here to Africa and see how you grin at Africans. You've really got integration here. But can you tell the Africans that in America you grin at the black people? No, you can't. And you don't honestly like these Africans any better either. But what you do like is the minerals Africa has under her soil. Those whites out in the audience turned pink and red. They knew I was telling the truth. I'm not anti-American, and I didn't come here to condemn America. I want to make that very clear, I told them. I came here to tell the truth. And if the truth condemns America, then she stands condemned. One evening I met most of the officials in Ghana, all of those with whom I'd previously talked, and more, at a party that was given for me by the Honorable Kofi Bako, the Ghanaian Minister of Defense and the leader of the National Assembly. I was told that this was the first time such an honor was accorded to a foreigner since Dr. W. E. B. Du Bois had come to Ghana. There was music, dancing, and fine Ghanaian food. Several persons at the party were laughing among themselves, saying that in an earlier party that day, U.S. Ambassador Mahomey was knocking himself out being exceptionally friendly and jovial. Some thought that he was making a strong effort to counteract the truth about America that I was telling every chance I got. Then an invitation came to me which exceeded my wildest dream. I would never have imagined that I would actually have an opportunity to address the members of the Ghanaian Parliament. I made my remarks brief, but I made them strong. How can you condemn Portugal and South Africa 
while our black people in America are being bitten by dogs and beaten with clubs. I said I felt certain that the only reason black Africans, our black brothers, could be so silent about what happened in America was that they had been misinformed by the American government's propaganda agencies. At the end of my talk I heard, Yes, we support the Afro-American, morally, physically, materially, if necessary, in Ghana or in all of black Africa. My highest single honor was an audience at the castle with Osegiefo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Before seeing him, I was searched most thoroughly. I respected the type of security the Ghanaians erect around their leader. It gave me that much more respect for independent black men. Then, as I entered Dr. Nkrumah's long office, he came out from behind his desk at the far end. Dr. Nkrumah wore ordinary dress, his hand was extended, and a smile was on his sensitive face. I pumped his hand. We sat on a couch and talked. I knew that he was particularly well informed on the Afro-American's plight, as for years he had lived and studied in America. We discussed the unity of Africans and peoples of African descent. We agreed that Pan-Africanism was the key also to the problems of those of African heritage. I could feel the warm, likable, and very down-to-earth qualities of Dr. Nkrumah. My time with him was up all too soon. I promised faithfully that when I returned to the United States, I would relay to Afro-Americans his personal warm regards. That afternoon, 39 miles away in Weneba, I spoke at the Kwame Nkrumah Ideological Institute, where 200 students were being trained to carry forward Ghana's intellectual revolution, and here again occurred one of those astounding demonstrations of the young African's political fervor. After I'd spoken, during the question and answer period, some young Afro-Americans stood up whom none there seemed to know. I am an American Negro, he announced himself. Vaguely, he defended the American white man. The African students booed and harassed him. Then instantly, when the meeting was over, they cornered this fellow with verbal abuse. Are you an agent of Rockefeller? Stop corrupting our children. The fellow had turned out to be a local secondary school teacher placed in the job by an American agency. Come to this institute for some orientation. Temporarily, a teacher rescued the fellow, but then the students rushed him and drove him away, shouting, Stooge! CIA! American agent! Chinese ambassador and Mrs. Huang Hua gave a state dinner in my honor. The guests included the Cuban and the Algerian ambassadors, and also it was here that I met Mrs. W. E. B. Du Bois. After the excellent dinner, three films were shown. One, a color film, depicted the People's Republic of China in celebration of its 14th anniversary. Prominently shown in this film was the militant former North Carolina Afro-American Robert Williams, who has since taken refuge in Cuba after his advocacy that the American black people should take up arms to defend and protect themselves. The second film focused upon the Chinese people's support for the Afro-American struggle. Chairman Mao Zedong was shown delivering his statement of that support, and the film offered sickening moments of graphic white brutality, police and civilian, to Afro-Americans who were demonstrating in various U.S. cities seeking civil rights. And the final film was a dramatic presentation of the Algerian Revolution. The Malcolm X Committee rushed me from the Chinese Embassy dinner to where a soiree in my honor had already begun, at the press club, it was my first sight of Ghanaians dancing the high life. A high and merry time was being had by everyone, and I was pressed to make a short speech. I stressed again the need for unity between Africans and Afro-Americans. I cried out of my heart, Now dance, sing, but as you do, remember Mandela, remember Sabokwe, remember Lumumba in his grave, remember South Africans now in jail. I said, You wonder why I don't dance? because I want you to remember 22 million Afro-Americans in the U.S. But I sure felt like dancing. The Ghanaians performed the high life as if possessed. One pretty African girl sang Blue Moon, like Sarah Vaughan. Sometimes the band sounded like Milk Jackson, sometimes like Charlie Parker. The next morning, Saturday, I heard that Cassius Clay and his entourage had arrived. There was a huge reception for him at the airport. I thought that if Cassius and I happened to meet, it would likely prove embarrassing for Cassius, since he had elected to remain with Elijah Muhammad's version of Islam. I would not have been embarrassed, but I knew that Cassius would have been forbidden to associate with me. I knew that Cassius knew I had been with him, and for him, and believed in him, when those who later embraced him felt that he had no chance. I decided to avoid Cassius, so as not to put him on the spot. A luncheon was given for me that afternoon by the Nigerian High Commissioner, his Excellency Alhaji Isa Wali, a short, bespectacled, extremely warm and friendly man who had lived in Washington, D.C. for two years. 
After lunch, His Excellency spoke to the guests of his American encounters with discrimination and the friendships he had made with Afro-Americans, and he reaffirmed the bonds between Africans and Afro-Americans. His Excellency held up before the luncheon guests a large and handsome issue of an American magazine, Horizon. It was open to an article about the Nation of Islam written by Dr. Mauro Berger of Princeton University. One full page was a photograph of me. The opposite full page was a beautiful color illustration of a black royal Nigerian Muslim, stalwart and handsome, of hundreds of years ago. When I look at these photographs, I know these two people are one, said His Excellency. The only difference is in their attire, and one was born in America and the other in Africa. So to let everyone know that I believe we are brothers, I am going to give to Alhaji Malcolm X a robe like that worn by the Nigerian in this photo. I was overwhelmed by the splendor of the beautiful blue robe and the orange turban which His Excellency then presented to me. I bent over so that he, a short man, could properly arrange the turban on my head. His Excellency Alhaji Isa Wali also presented me with a two-volume translation of the Holy Koran. After this unforgettable luncheon, Mrs. Shirley Graham Du Bois drove me to her home so that I could see and photograph the home where her famed late husband, Dr. W. E. B. Du Bois, had spent his last days. Mrs. Du Bois, a writer, was the director of Ghanaian television, which was planned for educational purposes. When Dr. Du Bois had come to Ghana, she told me, Dr. Nkrumah had set up the aging, great militant Afro-American scholar like a king, giving to Dr. Du Bois everything he could wish for. Mrs. Du Bois told me that when Dr. Du Bois was failing fast, Dr. Nkrumah had visited, and the two men had said goodbye, both knowing that one's death was near, and Dr. Nkrumah had gone away in tears. My final Ghanaian social event was a beautiful party in my honor given by His Excellency Mr. Armando Entralgo Gonzalez, the Cuban ambassador to Ghana. The next morning, it was Sunday, the Malcolm X Committee was waiting in my hotel to accompany me to the airport. As we left the hotel, we met Cassius Clay with some of his entourage returning from his morning walk. Cassius momentarily seemed uncertain. Then he spoke, something almost monosyllabic, like, How are you? It flashed through my mind how close we had been before the fight that had changed the course of his life. I replied that I was fine, something like that, and that I hoped he was, which I sincerely meant. Later on, I sent Cassius a message by wire, saying that I hoped that he would realize how much he was loved by Muslims wherever they were and that he would not let anyone use him and maneuver him into saying and doing things to tarnish his image. The Malcolm X Committee and I were exchanging goodbyes at the Accra airport when a small motorcade of five ambassadors arrived to see me off. I no longer had any words. In the plane, bound for Monrovia, Liberia, to spend a day, I knew that after what I had experienced in the Holy Land, the second most indelible memory I would carry back to America would be the Africa, seething with serious awareness of itself and of Africa's wealth and of her power and of her destined role in the world. From Monrovia, I flew to Dakar, Senegal. The Senegalese in the airport, hearing about the Muslim from America, stood in line to shake my hand, and I signed many autographs. Our people can't speak Arabic, but we have Islam in our hearts, said one Senegalese. I told them that exactly described their fellow Afro-American Muslims. From Dakar, I flew to Morocco, where I spent a day sightseeing. I visited the famous Kasbah, the ghetto which had resulted when the ruling white French wouldn't let the dark-skinned natives into certain areas of Casablanca. Thousands upon thousands of the subjugated natives were crowded into the ghetto in the same way that Harlem in New York City became America's Kasbah. It was Tuesday, May 19, 1964, my 39th birthday when I arrived in Algiers. A lot of water had gone under the bridge in those years. In some ways, I had had more experiences than a dozen men. The taxi driver, while taking me to the Hotel Aletti, described the atrocities the French had committed and personal measures that he'd taken to get even. I walked around Algiers, hearing rank-and-file expressions of hatred for America for supporting the oppressors of the Algerians. They were true revolutionists, not afraid of death. They had, for so long, faced death. The Pan American jet, which took me home, it was Flight 115, landed at New York's Kennedy Air Terminal on May 21st at 4.25 in the afternoon. We passengers filed off the plane and toured customs. When I saw the crowd of 50 or 60 reporters and photographers, I honestly wondered what celebrity I'd been on the plane with. 
but I was the villain they had come to meet. In Harlem especially, and also in some other U.S. cities, the 1964 long, hot summer's predicted explosions had begun. Article after article in the white man's press had cast me as a symbol, if not a causative agent, of the revolt and of the violence of the American black man wherever it had sprung up. In the biggest press conference that I had ever experienced anywhere, the camera bulbs flashed and the reporters fired questions. Mr. Malcolm X, what about those blood brothers reportedly affiliated with your organization, reportedly trained for violence, who have killed innocent white people? Mr. Malcolm X, what about your comment that Negroes should form rifle clubs? I answered the questions. I knew I was back in America again, hearing the subjective scapegoat-seeking questions of the white man. New York white youth were killing victims. That was a sociological problem. But when black youth killed somebody, the power structure was looking to hang somebody. When black men had been lynched or otherwise murdered in cold blood, it was always said, things would get better. When whites had rifles in their homes, the Constitution gave them the right to protect their home and themselves. But when black people even spoke of having rifles in their homes, that was ominous. I slipped in on the report as something they hadn't been expecting. I said that the American black man needed to quit thinking what the white man had taught him, which was that the black man had no alternative except to beg for his so-called civil rights. I said that the American black man needed to recognize that he had a strong, airtight case to take the United States before the United Nations on a formal accusation of denial of human rights and that if Angola and South Africa were precedent cases, then there would be no easy way that the U.S. could escape being censured right on its own home ground. Just as I'd known, the press wanted to get me off that subject. I was asked about my letter from Mecca. I was all set with a speech regarding that. I hope that once and for all, my Hajj to the holy city of Mecca has established our Muslim mosque's authentic religious affiliation with the 750 million Muslims of the orthodox Islamic world. And I know, once and for all, that the black Africans look upon America's 22 million blacks as long-lost brothers. They love us. They study our struggle for freedom. They were so happy to hear how we are awakening from our long sleep after so-called Christian white America had taught us to be ashamed of our African brothers and homeland. Yes, I wrote a letter from Mecca. You're asking me, didn't you say that now you accept white men as brothers? Well, my answer is that in the Muslim world, I saw, I felt, and I wrote home how my thinking was broadened. Just as I wrote, I shared true brotherly love with many white-complexioned Muslims who never gave a single thought to the race or to the complexion of another Muslim. My pilgrimage broadened my scope. It blessed me with a new insight. In two weeks in the Holy Land, I saw what I never had seen in 39 years here in America. I saw all races, all colors, blue-eyed blondes to black-skinned Africans in true brotherhood, in unity, living as one, worshipping as one. No segregationists, no liberals. They would not have known how to interpret the meaning of those words. In the past, yes, I have made sweeping indictments of all white people. I never will be guilty of that again. As I know now that some white people are truly sincere, that some truly are capable of being brotherly toward a black man. The true Islam has shown me that a blanket indictment of all white people is as wrong as when whites make blanket indictments against blacks. Yes, I have been convinced that some American whites do want to help cure the rampant racism which is on the path to destroying this country. It was in the holy world that my attitude was changed by what I experienced there and by what I witnessed there in terms of brotherhood, not just brotherhood toward me, but brotherhood between all men of all nationalities and complexions who were there. And now that I am back in America, my attitude here concerning white people has to be governed by what my black brothers and I experience here and what we witness here in terms of brotherhood. The problem here in America is that we meet such a small minority of individuals so-called good or brotherly white people. Here in the United States, notwithstanding those few good white people, it is the collective 150 million white people whom the collective 22 million black people have to deal with. Why, here in America, the seeds of racism are so deeply rooted in the white people collectively, their belief that they are superior in some way is so deeply rooted that these things are in the national white subconsciousness. Many whites are even actually unaware of their own racism until they face some test, and then their racism emerges in one form or another. Listen! 
The white man's racism toward the black man here in America is what has got him in such trouble all over this world with other non-white peoples. The white man can't separate himself from the stigma that he automatically feels about anyone, no matter who, who is not his color. And the non-white peoples of the world are sick of the condescending white man. That's why you've got all of this trouble in places like Vietnam, or right here in the Western Hemisphere. Probably 100 million people of African descent are divided against each other, taught by the white man to hate and to mistrust each other. In the West Indies, Cuba, Brazil, Venezuela, all of South America, Central America, all of those lands are full of people with African blood. On the African continent, even, the white man has maneuvered to divide the black African from the brown Arab, to divide the so-called Christian African from the Muslim African. Can you imagine what can happen, what would certainly happen, if all of these African heritage peoples ever realize their blood bonds, if they ever realize they all have a common goal, if they ever unite? The press was glad to get rid of me that day. I believe that the black brothers whom I just recently left in Africa would have felt that I did the subject justice. Nearly through the night, my telephone at home kept ringing. My black brothers and sisters around New York and in some other cities were calling to congratulate me on what they'd heard on the radio and television news broadcasts. And people, mostly white, were wanting to know if I would speak here or there. The next day I was in my car driving along the freeway. When at a red light, another car pulled alongside. A white woman was driving, and on the passenger side, next to me, was a white man. Malcolm X, he called out. And when I looked, he stuck his hand out of his car across at me, grinning. Do you mind shaking hands with a white man? Imagine that. Just as the traffic light turned green, I told him, I don't mind shaking hands with human beings. Are you one? Chapter 19 1965 I must be honest. Negroes, Afro-Americans, showed no inclination to rush to the United Nations and demand justice for themselves here in America. I really had known in advance that they wouldn't. The American white man is so thoroughly brainwashed the black man to see himself as only a domestic civil rights problem that it will probably take longer than I live before the Negro sees that the struggle of the American black man is international. And I'd known, too, that Negroes would not rush to follow me into the orthodox Islam which had given me the insight and perspective to see that the black man and white men truly could be brothers. America's Negroes, especially older Negroes, are too indelibly soaked in Christianity's double standard of oppression. So in the public invited meetings which I began holding each Sunday afternoon or evening in Harlem's well-known Ottoman ballroom as I addressed predominantly non-Muslim Negro audiences, I did not immediately attempt to press the Islamic religion, but instead to embrace all who sat before me. Not Muslim, nor Christian, Catholic, nor Protestant, Baptist, nor Methodist, Democrat, nor Republican, Mason, nor Elk. I mean the black people of America and the black people all over this earth because it is as this collective mass of black people that we have been deprived not only of our civil rights, but even of our human rights, the right to human dignity. On the streets, after my speeches, in the faces and the voices of the people I met, even those who would pump my hands and want my autograph, I would feel the wait-and-see attitude. I would feel, and I understood, their uncertainty about where I stood. Since the Civil War's freedom, the black man has gone down so many fruitless paths. His leaders very largely had failed him. The religion of Christianity had failed him. The black man was scarred. He was cautious. He was apprehensive. I understood it better now than I had before. In the holy world, away from America's race problem, was the first time I ever had been able to think clearly about the basic divisions of white people in America, and how their attitudes and their motives related to and affected Negroes. In my thirty-nine years on this earth, the holy city of Mecca had been the first time I had ever stood before the creator of all and felt like a complete human being. In that peace of the holy world, in fact, the very night I mentioned, when I lay awake surrounded by snoring brother pilgrims, my mind took me back to personal memories I would have thought were gone forever, as far back, even, as when I was just a little boy, eight or nine years old. Out behind our house, out in the country from Lansing, Michigan, there was an old grassy Hector's Hill, we called it, which may still be there. I remembered there in the holy world how I used to lie on the top of Hector's Hill and look up at the sky at the clouds moving over me, and daydream, all kinds of things. And then, in a funny contrast of recollections, I remembered how years later, when I was in prison, I used to lie on my cell bunk. This would be especially when I was in solitary, what we convicts called the hole. And I would picture myself talking to large crowds. I don't have any idea why such previsions came to me. But they did. 
To tell that to anyone then would have sounded crazy. Even I didn't have myself the slightest inkling. In Mecca, too, I'd played back for myself the twelve years I'd spent with Elijah Muhammad as if it were a motion picture. I guess it would be impossible for anyone ever to realize fully how complete was my belief in Elijah Muhammad. I believed in him not only as a leader in the ordinary human sense, but also I believed in him as a divine leader. I believed he had no human weaknesses or faults, and that therefore he could make no mistakes, and that he could do no wrong. There on a holy world hilltop, I realized how very dangerous it is for people to hold any human being in such esteem, especially to consider anyone some sort of divinely guided and protected person. My thinking had been opened up wide in Mecca. In the long letters I wrote to friends, I tried to convey to them my new insights into the American black man's struggle and his problems, as well as the depths of my search for truth and justice. I've had enough of someone else's propaganda, I'd written to these friends. I'm for truth, no matter who tells it. I'm for justice, no matter who it is for or against. I'm a human being, first and foremost, and as such I'm for whoever and whatever benefits humanity as a whole. Largely, the American white man's press refused to convey that I was now attempting to teach Negroes a new direction. With the 1964 long, hot summer steadily producing new incidents, I was constantly accused of stirring up Negroes. Every time I had another radio or television microphone at my mouth, when I was asked about stirring up Negroes or inciting violence, I'd get hot. It takes no one to stir up the sociological dynamite that stems from the unemployment, bad housing, and inferior education already in the ghettos. This explosively criminal condition has existed for so long it needs no fuse. It fuses itself. It spontaneously combusts from within itself. They called me the angriest Negro in America. I wouldn't deny that charge. I spoke exactly as I felt. I believe in anger. The Bible says there is a time for anger. They called me a teacher, a fomenter of violence. I would say point blank, that's a lie. I'm not for wanton violence. I'm for justice. I feel that if white people were attacked by Negroes, if the forces of law prove unable or inadequate or reluctant to protect those whites from those Negroes, then those white people should protect and defend themselves from those Negroes, using arms if necessary. And I feel that when the law fails to protect Negroes from whites' attack, then those Negroes should use arms, if necessary, to defend themselves. Malcolm X advocates armed Negroes. What was wrong with that? I'll tell you what was wrong. I was a black man talking about physical defense against the white man. The white man can lynch and burn and bomb and beat Negroes. That's all right. Have patience. The customs are entrenched. Things are getting better. Well, I believe it's a crime for anyone who is being brutalized to continue to accept that brutality without doing something to defend himself. If that's how Christian philosophy is interpreted, if that's what Gandhian philosophy teaches, well then, I will call them criminal philosophies. I tried in every speech I made to clarify my new position regarding white people. I don't speak against the sincere, well-meaning, good white people. I have learned that there are some. I have learned that not all white people are racists. I am speaking against, and my fight is against the white racists. I firmly believe that Negroes have the right to fight against these racists, by any means that are necessary. But the white reporters kept wanting me linked with that word, violence. I doubt if I had one interview without having to deal with that accusation. I am for violence if non-violence means we continue postponing a solution to the American black man's problem just to avoid violence. I don't go for non-violence if it also means a delayed solution. To me, a delayed solution is a non-solution. Or I'll say it another way. If it must take violence to get the black man his human rights in this country, I am for violence exactly as you know the Irish the Poles or Jews would be if they were flagrantly discriminated against. I am just as they would be in that case, and they would be for violence, no matter what the consequences, no matter who was hurt by the violence. White society hates to hear anybody, especially a black man, talk about the crime the white man has perpetrated on the black man. I've always understood that's why I've been so frequently called a revolutionist. It sounds as if I have done some crime. Well, it may be the American black man does need to become involved in a real revolution. The word for revolution in German is Umweltzung. What it means is a complete overturn, a complete change. The overthrow of King Farouk in Egypt and the succession of President Nasser is an example of a true revolution. It means the destroying of an old system and its replacement with a new system. 
Another example is the Algerian Revolution, led by Ben Bella. They threw out the French, who had been there over 100 years. So how does anybody sound talking about the Negro in America waging some revolution? Yes, he's condemning a system, but he's not trying to overturn the system or to destroy it. The Negro's so-called revolt is merely an asking to be accepted into the existing system. A true Negro revolt might entail, for instance, fighting for separate black states within this country, which several groups and individuals have advocated long before Elijah Muhammad came along. When the white man came into this country, he certainly wasn't demonstrating any non-violence. In fact, the very man whose name symbolizes non-violence here today has stated, Our nation was born in genocide when it embraced the doctrine that the original American, the Indian, was an inferior race. Even before there were large numbers of Negroes on our shores, the scar of racial hatred had already disfigured colonial society. From the 16th century forward, blood flowed in battles over racial supremacy. We are perhaps the only nation which tried as a matter of national policy to wipe out its indigenous population. Moreover, we elevated that tragic experience into a noble crusade. Indeed, even today we have not permitted ourselves to reject or to feel remorse for this shameful episode. Our literature, our films, our drama, our folklore all exalt it. Our children are still taught to respect the violence which reduced a red-skinned people of an earlier culture into a few fragmented groups herded into impoverished reservations. Peaceful coexistence. That's another one the white man has always been quick to cry. Fine, but what have been the deeds of the white man? During his entire advance through history, he has been waving the banner of Christianity and carrying in his other hand the sword and the flintlock. You can go right back to the very beginning of Christianity. Catholicism, the genesis of Christianity as we know it to be presently constituted, with its hierarchy, was conceived in Africa by those whom the Christian Church calls the Desert Fathers. The Christian Church became infected with racism when it entered white Europe. The Christian Church returned to Africa under the banner of the cross, conquering, killing, exploiting, pillaging, raping, bullying, beating, and teaching white supremacy. This is how the white man thrust himself into the position of leadership of the world, through the use of naked physical power. And he was totally inadequate spiritually. Mankind's history has proved from one era to another that the true criterion of leadership is spiritual. Men are attracted by spirit. By power, men are forced. Love is engendered by spirit. By power, anxieties are created. I am in agreement 100% with those racists who say that no government laws ever can force brotherhood. The only true world solution today is governments guided by true religion, of the spirit. Here in race-torn America, I am convinced that the Islam religion is desperately needed, particularly by the American black man. The black man needs to reflect that he has been America's most fervent Christian. And where has it gotten him? In fact, in the white man's hands, in the white man's interpretation, where has Christianity brought this world? It has brought the non-white two-thirds of the human population to rebellion. Two-thirds of the human population today is telling the one-third minority white man, get out, and the white man is leaving. And as he leaves, we see the non-white peoples returning in a rush to their original religions, which had been labeled pagan by the conquering white man. Only one religion, Islam, had the power to stand and fight the white man's Christianity for a thousand years. Only Islam could keep white Christianity at bay. The Africans are returning to Islam and other indigenous religions. The Asians are returning to being Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims. As the Christian crusade once went east, now the Islamic crusade is going west. With the east, Asia, closed to Christianity, with Africa rapidly being converted to Islam, with Europe rapidly becoming unchristian, generally today it is accepted that the Christian civilization of America, which is propping up the white race around the world, is Christianity's remaining strongest bastion. Well, if this is so, if the so-called Christianity now being practiced in America displays the best that world Christianity has left to offer, no one in his right mind should need any much greater proof that very close at hand is the end of Christianity. Are you aware that some Protestant theologians in their writings are using the phrase post-Christian era and they mean now? 
And what is the greatest single reason for this Christian church's failure? It is its failure to combat racism. It is the old you sow, you reap story. The Christian church sowed racism blasphemously. Now it reaps racism. Sunday mornings in this year of grace, 1965, imagine the Christian conscience of congregations guarded by deacons barring the door to black would-be worshippers, telling them, you can't enter this house of God. Tell me, if you can, a sadder irony than that St. Augustine, Florida, a city named for the black African saint who saved Catholicism from heresy, was recently the scene of bloody race riots. I believe that God now is giving the world's so-called Christian white society its last opportunity to repent and atone for the crimes of exploiting and enslaving the world's non-white peoples. It is exactly as when God gave Pharaoh a chance to repent, but Pharaoh persisted in his refusal to give justice to those whom he oppressed, and we know God finally destroyed Pharaoh. Is white America really sorry for our crimes against the black people? Does white America have the capacity to repent and to atone? Does the capacity to repent, to atone, exist in a majority, in one half, in even one third of American white society? Many black men, the victims, in fact most black men, would like to be able to forgive, to forget the crimes. But most American white people seem not to have it in them to make any serious atonement, to do justice to the black man. Indeed, how can white society atone for enslaving, for raping, for unmanning, for otherwise brutalizing millions of human beings for centuries? What atonement would the God of justice demand for the robbery of the black people's labor, their lives, their true identities, their culture, their history, and even their human dignity? A desegregated cup of coffee? A theater? Public toilets? The whole range of hypocritical integration. These are not atonement. After a while in America, I returned abroad, and this time I spent 18 weeks in the Middle East and Africa. The world leaders with whom I had private audiences this time included President Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, President Julius K. Nayarere of Tanzania, President Namoy Atsikwe of Nigeria, Osagiefo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, President Seko Toure of Guinea, President Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, and Prime Minister Dr. Milton Obote of Uganda. I also met with religious leaders, African, Arab, Asian, Muslim, and non-Muslim. And in all of these countries, I talked with Afro-Americans and whites of many professions and backgrounds. An American white ambassador in one African country was Africa's most respected American ambassador. I'm glad to say that this was told to me by one ranking African leader. We talked for an entire afternoon Based on what I had heard of him, I had to believe him when he told me that as long as he was on the African continent, he never thought in terms of race, that he dealt with human beings, never noticing their color. He said he was more aware of language differences than of color differences. He said that only when he returned to America would he become aware of color differences. I told him, what you are telling me is that it isn't the American white man who is a racist, but it's the American political, economic, and social atmosphere that automatically nourishes a racist psychology in the white man. He agreed. We both agreed that American society makes it next to impossible for humans to meet in America and not be conscious of their color differences. And we both agreed that if racism could be removed, America could offer a society where rich and poor could truly live like human beings. That discussion with the ambassador gave me a new insight, one which I like, that the white man is not inherently evil. But America's racist society influences him to act evilly. The society has produced and nourishes a psychology which brings out the lowest, most base part of human beings. I had a totally different kind of talk with another white man I met in Africa, who to me personified exactly what the ambassador and I had discussed. Throughout my trip, I was of course aware that I was under constant surveillance. The agent was a particularly obvious and obnoxious one. I'm not sure for what agency, as he never identified it, or I would say it. Anyway, this one finally got into my skin when I found I couldn't seem to eat a meal in the hotel without seeing him somewhere around watching me. You would have thought I was John Dillinger or somebody. I just got up for my breakfast one morning and walked over to where he was, and I told him I knew he was following me, and if he wanted to know anything, why didn't he ask me? He started to give me one of those too lofty to descend to you attitudes. I told him then right to his face he was a fool, 
that he didn't know me or what I stood for, so that made him one of those people who let somebody else do their thinking, and that no matter what job a man had, at least he ought to be able to think for himself. That stung him. He let me have it. I was, to hear him tell it, anti-American, un-American, seditious, subversive, and probably communist. I told him that what he said only proved how little he understood about me. I told him that the only thing the FBI, the CIA, or anybody else could ever find me guilty of was being open-minded. I said I was seeking for the truth, and I was trying to weigh, objectively, everything on its own merit. I said what I was against was straight-jacketed thinking and straight-jacketed societies. I said I respected every man's right to believe whatever his intelligence tells him is intellectually sound, and I expect everyone else to respect my right to believe likewise. This super sleuth then got off on my black Muslim religious beliefs. I asked him hadn't his headquarters bothered to brief him, that my attitudes and beliefs were changed. I told him that the Islam I believed in now was the Islam which was taught in Mecca, that there was no God but Allah, and that Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who lived in the holy city of Mecca 1400 years ago, was the last messenger of Allah. Almost from the first I've been guessing about something, and I took a chance. And I really shook up that super sleuth. From the consistent subjectivity in just about everything he asked and said, I deduced something, and I told him, You know, I think you're a Jew with an anglicized name. His involuntary expression told me I'd hit the button. He asked me how I knew. I told him I had so much experience with how Jews would attack me that I usually could identify them. I told him all I held against the Jew was that so many Jews actually were hypocrites in their claim to be friends of the American black man, and it burned me up to be so often called anti-Semitic when I spoke things I knew to be the absolute truth about Jews. I told him that, yes, I gave the Jew credit for being among all other whites the most active and the most vocal financier, leader, and liberal in the Negro civil rights movement. But I said at the same time I knew that the Jew played these roles for a very careful strategic reason. The more prejudice in America could be focused upon the Negro, then the more the white Gentiles' prejudice would keep diverted off the Jew. I said that to me, one proof that all the civil rights posturing of so many Jews wasn't sincere was that so often in the North the quickest segregationists were Jews themselves. Look at practically everything the black man is trying to integrate into, for instance. If Jews are not the actual owners, or are not in controlling positions, then they have major stock holdings, or they are otherwise in powerful leverage positions. And do they really, sincerely exert these influences? No. And an even clearer proof for me of how Jews truly regard Negroes, I said, was what invariably happened wherever a Negro moved into any white residential neighborhood that was thickly Jewish. Who would always lead the whites' exodus? The Jews. Generally in these situations, some whites stay put. You just notice who they are. They're Irish Catholics. They're Italians. They're rarely ever any Jews. And ironically, the Jews themselves often still have trouble being accepted. Saying this, I know I'll hear anti-Semitic from every direction again. Oh, yes, but truth is truth. Politics dominated the American scene while I was traveling abroad this time. In Cairo and again in Accra, the American press wire services reached me with transatlantic calls asking whom did I favor, Johnson or Goldwater? End of Side 10 Side 11 The Autobiography of Malcolm X Continuing on page 373 I said I felt that as far as the American black man was concerned, they were both just about the same. I felt that it was for the black man only a question of Johnson, the fox, or Goldwater, the wolf. Conservatism in America's politics means let's keep the niggers in their place. And liberalism means Let's keep the Negroes in their place, but tell them we'll treat them a little better. Let's fool them more with more promises. With these choices, I felt that the American black man only needed to choose which one to be eaten by, the liberal fox or the conservative wolf, because both of them would eat him. I didn't go for Goldwater any more than for Johnson, except that in a wolf's den I'd always know exactly where I stood. I'd watch the dangerous wolf closer than I would the smooth, sly fox, the wolf's very growling would keep me alert and fighting him to survive, whereas I might be lulled and fooled by the tricky fox. I'll give you an illustration of a fox. 
When the assassination in Dallas made Johnson president, who was the first person he called for? It was for his best friend, Dickey, Richard Russell of Georgia. Civil rights was a moral issue, Johnson was declaring to everybody, while his best friend was the southern racist who led the civil rights opposition. How would some sheriff sound declaring himself so against bank robbery? And Jesse James, his best friend. Goldwater is a man I respected for speaking out his true convictions, something rarely done in politics today. He wasn't whispering to racists and smiling at integrationists. I felt Goldwater wouldn't have risked his unpopular stand without conviction. He flatly told black men he wasn't for them. And there was this to consider. Always the black people have advanced further when they have seen they had to rise up against a system that they clearly saw was outright against them. Under these steady lullabies sung by foxy liberals, the northern Negro became a beggar. But the southern Negro, facing the honestly snarling white man, rose up to battle that white man for his freedom, long before it happened in the north. Anyway, I didn't feel that Goldwater was any better for black men than Johnson, or vice versa. I wasn't in the United States at election time, but if I had been, I wouldn't have put myself in the position of voting for either candidate for the presidency, or recommending to any black man to do so. It has turned out that it's Johnson in the White House, and black votes were a major factor in his winning as decisively as he wanted to. If it had been Goldwater, all I'm saying is that the black people would at least have known they were dealing with an honestly growling wolf, rather than a fox who could have them half digested before they even knew what was happening. I kept having all kinds of troubles trying to develop the kind of black nationalist organization I wanted to build for the American Negro. Why black nationalism? Well, in the competitive American society, how can there ever be any white-black solidarity before there's first some black solidarity? If you will remember, in my childhood I've been exposed to the black nationalist teachings of Marcus Garvey, which in fact I've been told had led to my father's murder. Even when I was a follower of Elijah Muhammad, I had been strongly aware of how the black nationalist political, economic, and social philosophies had the ability to instill within black men the racial dignity, the incentive, and the confidence that the black race needs today to get up off its knees and to get on its feet and get rid of its scars and to take a stand for itself. One of the major troubles that I was having in building the organization that I wanted, an all-black organization whose ultimate objective was to help create a society in which there could exist honest white-black brotherhood, was that my earlier public image, my old so-called black Muslim image, kept blocking me. I was trying to gradually reshape that image. I was trying to turn a corner into a new regard by the public, especially Negroes. I was no less angry than I'd been, but at the same time the true brotherhood I'd seen in the holy world had influenced me to recognize that anger can blind human vision. Every free moment I could find, I did a lot of talking to key people whom I knew around Harlem, and I made a lot of speeches saying, True Islam taught me that it takes all of the religious, political, economic, psychological, and racial ingredients or characteristics to make the human family and the human society complete. Since I learned the truth in Mecca, my dearest friends have come to include all kinds, some Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, agnostics, and even atheists. I have friends who are called capitalists, socialists, and communists. Some of my friends are moderates, conservatives, extremists. Some are even Uncle Toms. My friends today are black, brown, red, yellow, and white. I said to Harlem Street audiences that only when mankind would submit to the one God who created all, only then would mankind even approach the peace of which so much talk could be heard, but toward which so little action was seen. I said that on the American racial level, we had to approach the black man's struggle against the white man's racism as a human problem, that we had to forget hypocritical politics and propaganda. I said that both races, as human beings, had the obligation, the responsibility, of helping to correct America's human problem. The well-meaning white people, I said, had to combat actively and directly the racism in other white people. And the black people had to build within themselves much greater awareness that along with equal rights there had to be the bearing of equal responsibilities. I knew better than most Negroes how many white people truly wanted to see American racial problems solved. I knew that many whites were as frustrated as Negroes. I bet I got 50 letters some days from white people. The white people in meeting audiences would throng around me, asking me, after I'd addressed them somewhere, what can a sincere white person do? When I say that here now, it makes me think about that little coed I told you about, the one who flew from her New England college down to New York and came up to me in the Nation of Islam's restaurant in Harlem 
And I told her that there was nothing she could do. I regret that I told her that. I wish that now I knew her name or where I could telephone her or write to her and tell her what I tell white people now when they present themselves as being sincere and ask me one way or another the same thing that she asked. The first thing I tell them is that at least where my own particular black nationalist organization, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, is concerned, they can't join us. I have these very deep feelings that white people who want to join black organizations are really just taking the escapist way to salve their consciences. By visibly hovering near us, they are proving that they are with us. But the hard truth is this isn't helping to solve America's racist problem. The Negroes aren't the racists. Where the really sincere white people have got to do their proving of themselves is not among the black victims, but out on the battle lines of where America's racism really is. And that's in their own home communities. America's racism is among their own fellow whites. That's where the sincere whites who really mean to accomplish something have got to work. Aside from that, I mean nothing against any sincere whites when I say that as members of black organizations, generally, whites' very presence subtly renders the black organization automatically less effective. Even the best white members will slow down the Negroes' discovery of what they need to do, and particularly of what they can do for themselves working by themselves, among their own kind, in their own communities. I sure don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but in fact I'll even go so far as to say that I never really trust the kind of white people who are always so anxious to hang around Negroes or to hang around in Negro communities. I don't trust the kind of whites who love having Negroes always hanging around them. I don't know. This feeling may be a throwback to the years when I was hustling in Harlem, and all of those red-faced, drunk whites in the after-hours clubs were always grabbing hold of some Negroes and talking about, I just want you to know you're just as good as I am. And then they got back in their taxi cabs and black limousines and went back downtown to the places where they lived and worked, where no blacks except servants had better get caught. But anyway, I know that every time that whites join a black organization, you watch. Pretty soon the blacks will be leaning on the whites to support it, and before you know it, a black may be up front with a title, but the whites, because of their money, are the real controllers. I tell sincere white people, work in conjunction with us, each of us working among our own kind. Let sincere white individuals find all other white people they can who feel as they do, and let them form their own all-white groups to work trying to convert other white people who are thinking and acting so racist. Let sincere whites go and teach non-violence to white people. We will completely respect our white co-workers. They will deserve every credit. We will give them every credit. We will meanwhile be working among our own kind in our own black communities, showing and teaching black men in ways that only other black men can, that the black man has got to help himself. Working separately, the sincere white people and sincere black people actually will be working together. In our mutual sincerity, we might be able to show a road to the salvation of America's very soul. It can only be salvaged if human rights and dignity, in full, are extended to black men. Only such real, meaningful actions as those which are sincerely motivated from a deep sense of humanism and moral responsibility can get at the basic causes that produce the racial explosions in America today. Otherwise, the racial explosions are only going to grow worse. Certainly nothing is ever going to be solved by throwing upon me and other so-called black extremists and demagogues the blame for the racism that is in America. Sometimes I have dared to dream to myself that one day history may even say that my voice, which disturbed the white man's smugness and his arrogance and his complacency, that my voice helped to save America from a grave, possibly even a fatal catastrophe. The goal has always been the same with the approaches to it as different as mine and Dr. Martin Luther King's non-violent marching that dramatizes the brutality and the evil of the white man against defenseless blacks. And in the racial climate of this country today, it is anybody's guess which of the extremes in approach to the black man's problems might personally meet a fatal catastrophe first. Non-violent Dr. King, or so-called violent me. Anything I do today, I regard as urgent. No man is given but so much time to accomplish whatever is his life's work. My life in particular never has stayed fixed in one position for very long. 
You've seen how throughout my life I've often known unexpected drastic changes. I'm only facing the facts when I know that any moment of any day or any night could bring me death. This is particularly true since the last trip that I made abroad. I've seen the nature of things that are happening, and I've heard things from sources which are reliable. To speculate about dying doesn't disturb me as it might some people. I never have felt that I would live to become an old man. Even before I was a Muslim, when I was a hustler in the ghetto jungle and then a criminal in prison, it always stayed on my mind that I would die a violent death. In fact, it runs in my family. My father and most of his brothers died by violence. My father because of what he believed in. To come right down to it, if I take the kind of things in which I believe, then add to that the kind of temperament that I have, plus the 100% dedication I have to whatever I believe in, these are ingredients which make it just about impossible for me to die of old age. I've given to this book so much of whatever time I have because I feel, and I hope, that if I honestly and fully tell my life's account, read objectively, it might prove to be a testimony of some social value. I think that an objective reader may see how in the society to which I was exposed as a black youth here in America, for me to wind up in a prison was really just about inevitable. It happens to so many thousands of black youth. I think that an objective reader may see how when I heard, The white man is the devil, when I played back what had been my own experiences, it was inevitable that I would respond positively. Then the next twelve years of my life were devoted and dedicated to propagating that phrase among the black people. I think, I hope, that the objective reader in following my life, the life of only one ghetto-created Negro, may gain a better picture and understanding than he has previously had of the black ghettos which are shaping the lives and the thinking of almost all of the 22 million Negroes who live in America. Thicker each year in these ghettos is the kind of teenager that I was, with the wrong kinds of heroes and the wrong kinds of influences. I'm not saying that all of them become the kind of parasite that I was, Fortunately, by far, most do not. But still, the small fraction who do add up to an annual total of more and more costly, dangerous, youthful criminals. The FBI not long ago released a report of a shocking rise in crime each successive year since the end of World War II, 10 to 12 percent each year. The report did not say so in so many words, but I'm saying that the majority of that crime increase is annually spawned in the black ghettos which the American racist society permits to exist. In the 1964 long, hot summer riots in major cities across the United States, the socially disinherited black ghetto youth were always at the forefront. In this year, 1965, I am certain that more and worse riots are going to erupt in yet more cities in spite of the conscience-saving civil rights bill. The reason is that the cause of these riots, the racist malignancy in America, has been too long unattended. I believe that it would be almost impossible to find anywhere in America a black man who has lived further down in the mud of human society than I have, or a black man who has been any more ignorant than I have been, or a black man who has suffered more anguish during his life than I have. But it is only after the deepest darkness that the greatest joy can come. It is only after slavery and prison that the sweetest appreciation of freedom can come. For the freedom of my 22 million black brothers and sisters here in America, I do believe that I have fought the best that I knew how and the best that I could with the shortcomings that I've had. I know that my shortcomings are many. My greatest lack has been, I believe, that I don't have the kind of academic education I wish I'd been able to get. To have been a lawyer, perhaps. I do believe that I might have made a good lawyer. I've always loved verbal battle and challenge. You can believe me that if I had the time right now, I would not be one bit ashamed to go back into any New York City public school and start where I left off in the ninth grade and go on through a degree. Because I don't begin to be academically equipped for so many of the interests that I have. For instance, I love languages. I wish I were an accomplished linguist. I don't know anything more frustrating than to be around people talking something you can't understand, especially when they're people who look just like you. 
In Africa, I heard original mother tongues, such as Hausa and Swahili being spoken, and there I was standing like some little boy, waiting for someone to tell me what had been said. I never will forget how ignorant I felt. Aside from the basic African dialects, I would try to learn Chinese, because it looks as if Chinese will be the most powerful political language of the future. And already I've begun studying Arabic, which I think is going to be the most powerful spiritual language of the future. I would just like to study. I mean ranging study, because I have a wide open mind. I'm interested in almost any subject you can mention. I know this is the reason I've come to really like, as individuals, some of the hosts of radio or television panel programs I've been on, and to respect their minds, because even if they've been almost steadily in disagreement with me on the race issue, they still have kept their minds open and objective about the truths of things happening in this world. Irv Kupsinet in Chicago, and Barry Farber, Barry Gray and Mike Wallace in New York, people like them. They also let me see that they respected my mind in a way I know they never realized. The way I knew was that often they would invite my opinion on subjects off the race issue. Sometimes, after the programs, we would sit around and talk about all kinds of things, current events and other things, for an hour or more. You see, most whites, even when they credit a Negro with some intelligence, will still feel that all he can talk about is the race issue. Most whites never feel that Negroes can contribute anything to other areas of thought and ideas. You just notice how rarely you will ever hear whites asking any Negroes what they think about the problem of world health or the space race to land men on the moon. Every morning when I wake up now, I regard it as having another borrowed day. In any city, wherever I go, making speeches, holding meetings of my organization, or attending to other business, black men are watching every move I make, awaiting their chance to kill me. I've said publicly many times that I know that they have their orders. Anyone who chooses not to believe what I'm saying doesn't know the Muslims in the nation of Islam. But I'm also blessed with faithful followers who are, I believe, as dedicated to me as I once was to Mr. Elijah Muhammad. Those who would hunt a man need to remember that a jungle also contains those who hunt the hunters. I know, too, that I could suddenly die at the hands of some white racists, or I could die at the hands of some Negro hired by the white man, or it could be some brainwashed Negro acting on his own idea that by eliminating me he would be helping out the white man because I talk about the white man the way I do. Anyway, now, each day I live as if I am already dead, and I tell you what I would like for you to do. When I am dead, I say it that way because from the things I know, I do not expect to live long enough to read this book in its finished form. I want you to just watch and see if I'm not right in what I say. That the white man in his press is going to identify me with hate. He will make use of me dead as he's made use of me alive as a convenient symbol of hatred. And that will help him to escape facing the truth that all I've been doing is holding up a mirror to reflect, to show the history of unspeakable crimes that his race has committed against my race. You watch. I will be labeled as, at best, an irresponsible black man. I've always felt about this accusation that the black leader, whom white men consider to be responsible, is invariably the black leader who never gets any results. You only get action as a black man if you're regarded by the white man as irresponsible. In fact, this much I'd learned when I was just a little boy. And since I've been some kind of a leader of black people here in the racist society of America, I have been more reassured each time the white man resisted me or attacked me harder, because each time made me more certain that I was on the right track in the American black man's best interests. The racist white man's opposition automatically made me know that I did offer the black man something worthwhile. Yes, I have cherished my demagogue role. I know that societies often have killed the people who have helped to change those societies. And if I can die, having brought any light, having exposed any meaningful truth, that will help to destroy the racist cancer that is malignant in the body of America, then all the credit is due to Allah. 
only the mistakes have been mine. Alex Haley Epilogue During 1959, when the public was becoming aware of the Muslims after the New York telecast The Hate That Hate Produced, I was in San Francisco about to retire after 20 years in the U.S. Coast Guard. A friend returned from a visit to our Detroit home and told me of a startling black man's religion, the Nation of Islam, to which, to her surprise, her entire family was converted. I listened with incredulity to how a mad scientist, Mr. Yakub, had genetically grafted the white race from an original black people. The organization's leader was described as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and a Minister Malcolm X was apparently chief of staff. When I entered a civilian writing career in New York City, I collected, around Harlem, a good deal of provocative material and then proposed an article about the cult to the Reader's Digest. Visiting the Muslim restaurant in Harlem, I asked how I could meet Minister Malcolm X, who was pointed out talking in a telephone booth right behind me. Soon he came out, a gangling, tall, reddish, brown-skinned fellow, at that time thirty-five years old. When my purpose was made known, he bristled, his eyes skewering me from behind the horn-rimmed glasses. "'You're another one of the white man's tools sent to spy,' he accused me sharply. I said I had a legitimate writing assignment and showed him my letter from the magazine stating that an objective article was wanted, one that would balance what the Muslims said of themselves and what their attackers said about them. Malcolm X snorted that no white man's promise was worth the paper it was on. He would need time to decide if he would cooperate or not. Meanwhile, he suggested that I could attend some of the Harlem Temple No. 7 meetings. Temples have since been renamed mosques, which were open to non-Muslim Negroes. Around the Muslim's restaurant, I met some of the converts, all of them neatly dressed and almost embarrassingly polite. Their manners and means reflected the Spartan personal discipline the organization demanded, and none of them would utter anything but Nation of Islam clichés. Even excellent weather was viewed as a blessing from Allah, with corollary credit due to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Finally, Minister Malcolm X told me that he would not take personal responsibility. He said that I should talk about an article with Mr. Muhammad personally. I expressed willingness, an appointment was made, and I flew to Chicago. The slightly built, shy-acting, soft-voiced Mr. Muhammad invited me to dinner with his immediate family in his mansion. I was aware that I was being carefully sized up while he talked primarily of FBI and Internal Revenue Service, close surveillance of his organization, and of a rumored forthcoming congressional probe. But I have no fear of any of them. I have all that I need. The truth, Mr. Muhammad said. The subject of my writing an article somehow never got raised, but Malcolm X proved far more cooperative when I returned. He would sit with me at a white-topped table in the Muslim restaurant and answer guardedly any questions I asked between constant interruptions by calls from the New York press in the telephone booth. When I asked if I could see Muslim activities in some other cities, he arranged with other ministers for me to attend meetings at temples in Detroit, Washington, and Philadelphia. My article entitled, Mr. Muhammad Speaks, appeared in early 1960, and it was the first featured magazine notice of the phenomenon. A letter quickly came from Mr. Muhammad appreciating that the article kept my promise to be objective, and Malcolm X telephoned similar compliments. About this time, Dr. C. Eric Lincoln's book, The Black Muslims in America, was published, and the black Muslims became a subject of growing interest. During 1961 and 1962, the Saturday Evening Post teamed me with a white writer, Al Balk, to do an article. Next, I did a personal interview of Malcolm X for Playboy magazine, which had promised to print verbatim whatever response he made to my questions. During that interview of several days' duration, Malcolm X repeatedly exclaimed, after particularly blistering anti-Christian or anti-white statements, You know that devil's not going to print that. He was very much taken aback when Playboy kept its word. Malcolm X began to warm up to me somewhat. He was most aware of the national periodical's power, and he'd come to regard me, if still suspiciously, as one avenue of access. Occasionally now he began to telephone me, advising me of some radio, television, or personal speaking appearance he was about to make, or he would invite me to attend some black Muslim bazaar or other public affair. I was in this stage of relationship with a Malcolm X, who often described himself on the air as the angriest black man in America, when in early 1963... My agent brought me together with a publisher whom the Playboy interview had given the idea of the autobiography of Malcolm X. I was asked if I felt I could get the now nationally known firebrand to consent to telling the intimate details of his entire life. I said I didn't know, but I would ask him. The editor asked me if I could sketch the likely highlights of such a book, and as I commenced talking, I realized how little I knew about the man personally, despite all my interviews. I said that the question had made me aware of how careful Malcolm X had always been to play himself down and to play up his leader, Elijah Muhammad. 
All that I knew really, I said, was that I'd heard Malcolm X refer in passing to his life of crime and prison before he became a black Muslim, that several times he told me, you wouldn't believe my past, and that I'd heard others say that at one time he had peddled dope and women and committed armed robberies. I knew that Malcolm X had an almost fanatical obsession about time. I have less patience with someone who doesn't wear a watch than with anyone else, for this type is not time-conscious, he'd once told me. In all our deeds, the proper value and respect for time determines success or failure. I knew how the black Muslim membership was said to increase wherever Malcolm X lectured, and I knew his pride that Negro prisoners in most prisons were discovering the Muslim religion as he had when he was a convict. I knew he professed to eat only what a black Muslim, preferably his wife Betty, had cooked, and he drank innumerable cups of coffee which he lightened with cream, commenting wryly, Coffee is the only thing I like integrated. Over our luncheon table, I told the editor and my agent how Malcolm X could unsettle non-Muslims. As, for instance, once when he offered to drive me to a subway, I began to light a cigarette, and he dryly observed, that would make you the first person ever to smoke in this automobile. Malcolm X gave me a startled look when I asked him if he would tell his life story for publication. It was one of the few times I've ever seen him uncertain. I will have to give a book a lot of thought, he finally said. Two days later, he telephoned me to meet him again at the Black Muslim restaurant. He said, I'll agree. I think my life story may help people to appreciate better how Mr. Muhammad salvages black people. But I don't want my motives for this misinterpreted by anybody. The nation of Islam must get every penny that might come to me. Of course, Mr. Muhammad's agreement would be necessary, and I would have to ask Mr. Muhammad myself. So I flew again to see Mr. Muhammad, but this time to Phoenix, Arizona, where the nation of Islam had bought him the house in the hot, dry climate that relieved his severe bronchial condition. He and I talked alone this time. He told me how his organization had come far with largely uneducated Muslims and that truly giant strides for the black man could be made if his organization were aided by some of the talents which were available in the black race. He said, And one of our worst needs is writers. But he did not press me to answer. He suddenly began coughing and rapidly grew worse and worse until I rose from my seat and went to him alarmed, but he waved me away, gasping that he would be all right. Between gasps, he told me he felt that Allah approves the book. He said, Malcolm is one of my most outstanding ministers. After arranging for his chauffeur to return me to the Phoenix airport, Mr. Muhammad quickly bade me goodbye and rushed from the room, coughing. Back east, Malcolm X carefully read and then signed the publication contract, and he withdrew from his wallet a piece of paper filled with his sprawling longhand. This is this book's dedication, he said. I read, This book I dedicate to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who found me here in America in the muck and mire of the filthiest civilization and society on this earth, and pulled me out, cleaned me up, and stood me on my feet, and made me the man that I am today. The contract provided that all monies accruing to Malcolm X shall be made payable by the agent to Mohammed's Mosque No. 2. But Malcolm X felt this was insufficient. He dictated to me a letter to type for his signature, which I did. Any and all monies representing my contracted share of the financial returns should be made payable by the literary agent to Mohammed's Mosque No. 2. These payments should be mailed to the following address. Mr. Raymond Sharif, 4847 Woodlawn Avenue, Chicago 15, Illinois. Another letter was dictated. This one an agreement between him and me. Nothing can be in this book's manuscript that I didn't say, and nothing can be left out that I want in it. In turn, I asked Malcolm X to sign for me a personal pledge that however busy he was, he would give me a priority quota of his time for the planned 100,000-word, as told to, book, which would detail his entire life. And months later, in a time of strain between us, I asked for, and he gave, his permission that at the end of the book I could write comments of my own about him which would not be subject to his review. Malcolm X promptly did begin to pay me two- and three-hour visits, parking his blue Oldsmobile outside the working studio I then had in Greenwich Village. He always arrived around nine or ten at night carrying his flat tan leather briefcase, which along with his scholarly look gave him a resemblance to a hard-working lawyer. Inevitably, he was tired after his long, busy day, and sometimes he was clearly exhausted. We got off to a very poor start. To use a word he liked, I think both of us were a bit spooky. Sitting right there and staring at me was the fiery Malcolm X, who could be as acid toward Negroes who angered him as he was against whites in general. On television, in press conferences, and at Muslim rallies, I'd heard him bitterly attack other Negro writers as Uncle Toms, Yard Negroes, black men in white clothes. 
and there I sat staring at him, proposing to spend a year plumbing his innermost secrets when he had developed a near phobia for secrecy during his years of crime and his years in the Muslim hierarchy. My twenty years in military service and my Christian religious persuasion didn't help either. He often jeered publicly of these affiliations for Negroes. And although he now would indirectly urge me to write for national magazines about the Muslims, he had told me several times in various ways that you blacks with professional abilities of any kind will one of these days wake up and find out that you must unite under the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for your own salvation. Malcolm X was also convinced that the FBI had bugged my studio. He probably suspected that it may even have been done with my cooperation. For the first several weeks, he never entered the room where we worked without exclaiming, Testing! Testing! One! Two! Three! Tense incidents occurred. One night a white friend was in the studio when Malcolm X arrived a little earlier than anticipated, and they passed each other in the corridor. Malcolm X's manner during all of that session suggested that his worst doubts had been confirmed. Another time when Malcolm X sat haranguing me about the glories of the Muslim organization, he was gesturing with his passport in his hand. He saw that I was trying to read its perforated number, and suddenly he thrust the passport toward me, his neck flushed, reddish. Get the number straight, but it won't be anything the white devil doesn't already know. He issued me the passport. For perhaps a month, I was afraid we weren't going to get any book. Malcolm X was still stiffly addressing me as Sir, and my notebook contained almost nothing but black Muslim philosophy, praise of Mr. Muhammad, and the evils of the white devil. He would bristle when I tried to urge him that the proposed book was his life. I was thinking that I might have to advise the publisher that I simply couldn't seem to get through to my subject when the first note of hope occurred. I noticed that while Malcolm X was talking, he often simultaneously scribbled with his red ink ballpoint pen on any handy paper. Sometimes it was the margin of a newspaper he brought in. Sometimes it was on index cards that he carried in the back of a small red-backed appointment book. I began leaving two white paper napkins by him every time I served him more coffee, and the ruse worked when he sometimes scribbled on the napkins, which I retrieved when he left. Some examples of these. Here lies a YM, killed by a BM, fighting for the WM, who killed all the RM. Decoding that wasn't difficult, knowing Malcolm X. YM was for yellow man, BM for black man, WM for white man, and RM was for red man. Nothing ever happened without cause. Cause BM condition, WM won't face. WM obsessed with hiding his guilt. If Christianity had asserted itself in Germany, six million Jews would have lived. WM so quick to tell BM, look what I have done for you. No, look what you have done to us. BM dealing with WM who put our eyes out, now he condemns us because we cannot see. Only persons really changed history, those who changed men's thinking about themselves. Hitler as well as Jesus, Stalin as well as Buddha, Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It was through a clue from one of the scribblings that finally I cast a bait that Malcolm X took. Woman who cries all the time is only because she knows she can get away with it, he had scribbled. I somehow raised the subject of women. Suddenly, between sips of coffee and further scribbling and doodling, he vented his criticisms and skepticisms of women. You never can fully trust any woman, he said. I've got the only one I ever met whom I would trust 75%. I've told her that, he said. I've told her, like I tell you, I've seen too many men destroyed by their wives or their women. I don't completely trust anyone, he went on, not even myself. I've seen too many men destroy themselves. Other people I trust from not at all to highly, like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X looked squarely at me. You, I trust about 25%. Trying to keep Malcolm X talking, I mined the woman theme for all it was worth. Triumphantly, he exclaimed, Do you know why Benedict Arnold turned traitor? A woman. He said, Whatever else a woman is, I don't care who the woman is, it starts with her being vain. I'll prove it. Something you can do any time you want. And I know what I'm talking about. I've done it. You think of the hardest-looking, meanest-acting woman you know, one of those women who never smiles. Well, every day you see that woman, you look her right in the eyes and tell her, I think you're beautiful. And you watch what happens. The first day she may curse you out, the second day too. But you watch. You keep on. After a while, one day she's going to start smiling just as soon as you come in sight. When Malcolm X left that night, 
I retrieved napkin scribblings that further documented how he could be talking about one thing and thinking of something else. Negroes have too much righteousness. W.M. says, I want this piece of land. How do I get those couple of thousand B.M. on it off? I have wife who understands, or even if she doesn't, she at least pretends. B.M. struggle never gets open support from abroad it needs unless B.M. first forms own united front. Sit down, talk with people with brains I respect. All of us want same thing. Do some brainstorming. Would be shocking to reveal names of the B.M. leaders who have secretly met with T.H.E.M. The capitalized letters stood for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Then one night Malcolm X arrived nearly out on his feet from fatigue. For two hours he paced the floor delivering a tirade against Negro leaders who were attacking Elijah Muhammad and himself. I don't know what gave me the inspiration to say once when he paused for breath. I wonder if you tell me something about your mother. Abruptly he quit pacing, and the look he shot at me made me sense that somehow the chance question had hit him. When I look back at it now, I believe I must have caught him so physically weak that his defenses were vulnerable. Slowly Malcolm X began to talk, now walking in a tight circle. She was always standing over the stove, trying to stretch whatever we had to eat. We stayed so hungry that we were dizzy. I remember the color of dresses she used to wear. They were a kind of faded-out gray. And he kept on talking until dawn, so tired that the big feet would often almost stumble in their pacing. From this stream of consciousness reminiscing, I finally got out of him the foundation for this book's beginning chapters, Nightmare and Mascot. After that night, he never again hesitated to tell me even the most intimate details of his personal life. Over the next two years... His talking about his mother triggered something. Malcolm X's mood ranged from somber to grim as he recalled his childhood. I remember his making a great point of how he learned what had been a cardinal awareness of his ever since. It's the hinge that squeaks that gets the grease. When his narration reached his moving to Boston to live with his half-sister Ella, Malcolm X began to laugh about how square he had been in the ghetto streets. Well, I'm telling you things I haven't thought about since then, he would exclaim. Then it was during recalling the early Harlem days that Malcolm X really got carried away. One night, suddenly, wildly, he jumped up from his chair, and incredibly, the fearsome black demagogue was scat-singing and popping his fingers, re bop de bop blap blam and then grabbing a vertical pipe with one hand as the girl partner. He went jubilantly lindy-hopping around, his coattail and the long legs and the big feet flying as they had in those Harlem days. And then almost as suddenly, Malcolm X caught himself and sat back down and for the rest of that session he was decidedly grumpy. Later on in the Harlem narrative, he grew somber again. The only thing I considered wrong was what I got caught doing wrong. I had a jungle mind. I was living in a jungle, and everything I did was done by instinct to survive. But he stressed that he had no regrets about his crimes, because it was all a result of what happens to thousands upon thousands of black men in the white man's Christian world. His enjoyment resumed when the narrative entered his prison days. Let me tell you how I'd get those white devil convicts and the guards, too, to do anything I wanted. I'd whisper to them, If you don't, I'll start a rumor that you're really a light Negro just passing as white. That shows you what the white devil thinks about the black man. He'd rather die than be thought a Negro. He told me about the reading he'd been able to do in prison. I didn't know what I was doing, but just by instinct, I liked the books with intellectual vitamins. And another time... In the hectic pace of the world today, there is no time for meditation or for deep thought. A prisoner has time that he can put to good use. I'd put prison, second to college, as the best place for a man to go if he needs to do some thinking. If he's motivated, in prison, he can change his life. Yet another time, Malcolm X reflected, Once a man has been to prison, he never looks at himself or at other people the same again. The squares out here whose boat has been in smooth waters all the time turn up their noses at an ex-con. But an ex-con can keep his head up when the squares sink. He scribbled that night. I kept both my notebooks and the paper napkins dated. This W.M. created and dropped A-bomb on non-whites. W.M. now calls Red and lives in fear of other W.M. he knows may bomb us. Also, learn wisdom from the pupil of the eye that looks upon all things, and yet to self is blind. Persian poet. 
At intervals, Malcolm X will make a great point of stressing to me, Now, I don't want anything in this book to make it sound that I think I'm somebody important. I would assure him that I would try not to, and that in any event he would be checking the manuscript page by page, and ultimately the galley proofs. At other times he would end an attack upon the white man, and, watching me take the notes, exclaim, That devil's not going to print that, I don't care what he says. I would point out that the publishers had made a binding contract, and had paid a sizable sum in advance. Malcolm X would say, You trust them, and I don't. You studied what he wanted you to learn about him in schools. I studied him in the streets and in prison, where you see the truth. Experiences which Malcolm X had had during a day could flavor his interview mood. The most wistful, tender anecdotes generally were told on days when some incident had touched him. Once, for instance, he told me that he'd learned that a Harlem couple, not black Muslims, had named their newborn son Malcolm after him. What do you know about that? he kept exclaiming. And that was the night he went back to his own boyhood again, and this time recalled how he used to lie on his back on Hector's Hill and think. That night, too, I'll never forget the day they elected me the class president. A girl named Audrey Slaw, whose father owned a car repair shop, nominated me, and a boy named James Cotton seconded the nomination. The teacher asked me to leave the room while the class voted. When I returned, I was the class president. I couldn't believe it. Any interesting book which Malcolm X had read could get him going about his love of books. People don't realize how a man's whole life can be changed by one book. He came back again and again to the books that he'd studied when in prison. Did you ever read The Loom of Language? He asked me, and I said I hadn't. You should. Philology is a tough science, all about how words can be recognized no matter where you find them. Now you take Caesar. It's Latin. In Latin it's pronounced like Kaiser, with a hard C. But we anglicize it by pronouncing a soft C. The Russians say Tsar and mean the same thing. Another Russian dialect says Tsar. Jacob Grimm was one of the foremost philologists. I studied his Grimm's Law in prison, all about consonants. Philology is related to the science of etymology, dealing in root words. I dabbled in both of them. When I turned that page in my notebook, the next bears a note that Malcolm X had telephoned me saying, I'm going to be out of town for a few days. I assumed that, as had frequently been the case before, he had speaking engagements or other Muslim business to attend somewhere, and I was glad for the respite in which to get my notes separated under the chapter headings they would fit. But when Malcolm X returned this time, he reported triumphantly, I have something to tell you that will surprise you. Ever since we discussed my mother, I've been thinking about her. I realized that I'd blocked her out of my mind. It was just unpleasant to think about her having been twenty-some years in that mental hospital. He said, I don't want to take the credit. It was really my sister Yvonne who thought it might be possible to get her out. Yvonne got my brothers Wilfred, Wesley, and Philbert together, and I went out there too. It was Philbert who really handled it. It made me face something about myself, Malcolm X said. My mind had closed about our mother. I simply didn't feel the problem could be solved, so I had shut it out. I would built up subconscious defenses. The white man does this. He shuts out of his mind, and he builds up subconscious defenses against anything he doesn't want to face up to. I've just become aware how close my mind was now that I've opened it up again. That's one of the characteristics I don't like about myself. If I meet a problem I feel I can't solve, I shut it out. I make believe that it doesn't exist. But it exists. It was my turn to be deeply touched. Not long afterward, he was again away for a few days. When he returned this time, he said that at his brother Philbert's home, we had dinner with our mother for the first time in all those years. He said, She's sixty-six, and her memory is better than mine, and she looks young and healthy. She has more of her teeth than those who were instrumental in sending her to the institution. When something had angered Malcolm X during the day, his face would be flushed redder when he visited me, and he generally would spend much of the session lashing out bitterly. When some Muslims were shot by Los Angeles policemen, one of them being killed, Malcolm X, upon his return from a trip he made there, was fairly apoplectic for a week. It had been in this mood that he had made, in Los Angeles, the statement which caused him to be heavily censured by members of both races. I've just heard some good news. Referring to a plane crash at Orley Field in Paris, in which thirty-odd white Americans, mostly from Atlanta, Georgia, had been killed instantly. Malcolm X never publicly recanted the statement, to my knowledge, but much later he said to me, simply, That's one of the things I wish I'd never said. Any time the name of the present federal judge Thurgood Marshall was raised, Malcolm X still practically spat fire in memory of what the judge had said years before when he was the NAACP chief attorney. The Muslims are run by a bunch of thugs organized from prisons and jails and financed, I'm sure, by some Arab group. 
The only time that I've ever heard Malcolm X use what might be construed as a curse word, it was a hell used in response to a statement that Dr. Martin Luther King made that Malcolm X's talk brought misery upon Negroes. Malcolm X exploded to me, how in the hell can my talk do this? It's always a Negro responsible, not what the white man does. The extremist or demagogue accusation invariably would burn Malcolm X. Yes, I'm an extremist. The black race here in North America is in extremely bad condition. You show me a black man who isn't an extremist, and I'll show you one who needs psychiatric attention. Once when he said, Aristotle shocked people. Charles Darwin outraged people. Aldous Huxley scandalized millions. Malcolm X immediately followed the statement with, Don't print that. People would think I'm trying to link myself with them. Another time when something provoked him to exclaim, These Uncle Toms make me think about how the prophet Jesus was criticized in his own country. Malcolm X promptly got up and silently took my notebook, tore out that page, and crumpled it and put it into his pocket, and he was considerably subdued during the remainder of that session. I remember one time we talked, and he showed me a newspaper clipping reporting where a Negro baby had been bitten by a rat. Malcolm X said, Now just read that. Just think of that a minute. Suppose it was your child. Where's that slumlord? On some beach in Miami. He continued fuming throughout our interview. I did not go with him when later that day he addressed a Negro audience in Harlem, and an incident occurred which Helen Duda reported in the New York Post. Malcolm, speaking in Harlem, stared down at one of the white reporters present, the only whites admitted to the meeting, and went on, Now, there's a reporter who hasn't taken a note in half an hour, but as soon as I start talking about the Jews, he's busy taking notes to prove that I'm anti-Semitic. Behind the reporter, a male voice spoke up, Kill the bastard! Kill them all. The young man, in his unease, smiled nervously, and Malcolm jeered. Look at him laugh. He is really not laughing. He is just laughing with his teeth. An ugly tension curled the edges of the atmosphere. Then Malcolm went on. The white man doesn't know how to laugh. He just shows his teeth. But we know how to laugh. We laugh deep down, from the bottom up. The audience laughed, deep down, from the bottom up. And, as suddenly as Malcolm had stirred it, so... Skillfully and swiftly, he deflected it. It had been at once a masterful and shabby performance. I later heard somewhere, or read, that Malcolm X telephoned an apology to the reporter. But this was the kind of evidence which caused many close observers of the Malcolm X phenomenon to declare in absolute seriousness that he was the only Negro in America who could either start a race riot or stop one. When I once quoted this to him, tacitly inviting his comment, he told me tartly, I don't know if I could start one. I don't know if I'd want to stop one. It was the kind of statement he relished making. Over the months, I'd gradually come to establish something of a telephone acquaintance with Malcolm X's wife, whom I addressed as Sister Betty, as I'd heard the Muslims do. I admired how she ran a home with then three small daughters and still managed to take all of the calls which came for Malcolm X, surely as many calls as would provide a job for an average switchboard operator. Sometimes, when he was with me, he would telephone home and spend as much as five minutes rapidly jotting on a pad the various messages which had been left for him. Sister Betty, generally friendly enough on the phone with me, sometimes would exclaim in spontaneous indignation, The man never gets any sleep. Malcolm X rarely put in less than an 18-hour workday. Often when he left my studio at 4 a.m. and a 40-minute drive lay between him and home in East Elmhurst, Long Island, he'd ask me to telephone him there at 9 a.m. Usually this would be when he wanted me to accompany him somewhere, and he was going to tell me, after reviewing his commitments, when and where he wanted me to meet him. There were times when I didn't get an awful lot of sleep myself. He was always accompanied, either by some of his Muslim colleagues like James 67X, the 67th man named James, who had joined Harlem's Mosque No. 7, or Charles 37X, or by me, but he never asked me to be with him when they were. I went with him to college and university lectures, to radio and television stations for his broadcasts, and to public appearances in a variety of situations and locations. If we were driving somewhere, motorists along the highway would wave to Malcolm X, the faces of both whites and Negroes spontaneously aglow with the wonderment that I had seen evoked by other celebrities. No few airline hostesses had come to know him, because he flew so much. They smiled prettily at him. He was in turn the essence of courtly gentlemanliness, and inevitably the word spread, and soon an unusual flow of bathroom traffic would develop, passing where he sat. Whenever we arrived at our destination, it became familiar to hear, There's Malcolm X. Where? The tall one. 
Passers-by of both races stared at him. A few of both races, more Negroes than whites, would speak or nod to him in greeting. A high percentage of white people were visibly uncomfortable in his presence, especially within the confines of small areas, such as in elevators. I'm the only black man they've ever been close to who they know speaks the truth to them. Malcolm X once explained to me, it's their guilt that upsets them, not me. He said another time, the white man is afraid of truth. The truth takes the white man's breath and drains his strength. You just watch his face get red any time you tell him a little truth. There was something about this man when he was in a room with people. He commanded the room, whoever else was present, even out of doors. Once I remember in Harlem he sat on a speaker's stand between Congressman Adam Clayton Powell and the former Manhattan Borough President, Hewlin Jack, and when the street rally was over the crowd focus was chiefly on Malcolm X. I remember another time that we'd gone by railway from New York City to Philadelphia, where he appeared in the Philadelphia Convention Hall on the radio station WCAU program of Ed Harvey. You are the man who has said, All Negroes are angry, and I am the angriest of all. Is that correct? Asked Harvey, on the air, introducing Malcolm X. And as Malcolm X said crisply, That quote is correct. The gathering crowd of bystanders stared at him, riveted. We had ridden to Philadelphia in reserved parlor car seats. I can't get caught on a coach. I could get into trouble on a coach, Malcolm X had said. Walking to board the parlor car, we'd passed a dining car toward which he jerked his head. I used to work on that thing. Riding to our destination, he conversationally told me that the FBI had tried to bribe him for information about Elijah Muhammad, that he wanted me to be sure and read a new book, Crisis in Black and White, by Charles Silberman, one of the very few white writers I know with the courage to tell his kind the truth. And he asked me to make a note to please telephone the New York Post's feature writer, Helen Duda, and tell her he thought very highly of her recent series. He did not want to commend her directly. After the Ed Harvey show was concluded, we took the train to return to New York City. The parlor car, packed with businessmen behind their newspapers, commuting homeward after their work days, was electric with Malcolm X's presence. After the white-jacketed Negro porter had made several trips up and down the aisle, he was in the middle of another trip when Malcolm X sotto voce in my ear. He used to work with me. I forget his name. We worked right on this very train together. He knows it's me. He's trying to make up his mind what to do. The porter went on past us, poker-faced, but when he came through again, Malcolm X suddenly leaned forward from his seat, smiling at the porter. Why, sure, I know who you are, the porter suddenly said loudly. You wash dishes right on this train. I was just telling some of the fellows you were in my car here. We all follow you. The tension in the car could have been cut with a knife. Then soon, the porter returned to Malcolm X, his voice expansive. One of our guests would like to meet you. Now a young, clean-cut white man rose and came up, his hand extended, and Malcolm X rose and shook the prophet hand firmly. Newspapers dropped just below eye level, the length of the car. The young white man explained distinctly, loudly, that he had been in the Orient for a while, and now was studying at Columbia. I don't agree with everything you say, he told Malcolm X, but I have to admire your presentation. Malcolm's voice in reply was cordiality itself. I don't think you could search America, sir, and find two men who agree on everything. Subsequently, to another white man, an older businessman who came up and shook hands, he said evenly, Sir, I know how you feel. It's a hard thing to speak out against me when you are agreeing with so much that I say. And we rode on into New York under, now, a general open gazing. In Washington, D.C., Malcolm X slashed at the government's reluctance to take positive steps in the Negroes' behalf. I gather that even the White House took notice, for not long afterward I left off interviewing Malcolm X for a few days and went to the White House to do a playboy interview of the then White House press secretary, Pierre Salinger who grimaced spontaneously when I said I was writing the life story of Malcolm X. Another time I left Malcolm X to interview the U.S. Nazi Party commander, George Lincoln Rockwell, who frankly stated that he admired the courage of Malcolm X, and he felt that the two of them should speak together across the United States, and they could thus begin a real solution to the race problem, one of voluntary separation of the white and black races, with Negroes returning to Africa. I reported this to Malcolm X, who snorted, He must think I'm nuts. What am I going to look like? going speaking with a devil. Yet another time, I went off to Atlanta and interviewed for Playboy Dr. Martin Luther King. He was privately intrigued to hear little-known things about Malcolm X that I told him. For publication, he discussed him with reserve, and he did say that he would sometime like to have an opportunity to talk with him. Hearing this, Malcolm X said dryly, You think I ought to send him a telegram with my telephone number? But from other things that Malcolm X said to me at various times, I deduced that he actually had a reluctant admiration for Dr. King. Malcolm X and I reached the point, ultimately, 
where we shared a mutual camaraderie that, although it was never verbally expressed, was a warm one. He was, for me, unquestionably one of the most engaging personalities I'd ever met, and for his part, I gathered, I was someone he'd learned he could express himself to, with candor, without the likelihood of hearing it repeated. And like any person who lived amid tension, he enjoyed being around someone, another man, with whom he could psychically relax. When I made trips now, he always asked me to telephone him when I would be returning to New York, and generally, if he could squeeze it into a schedule, he met me at the airport. I would see him coming along with his long, gangling strides and wearing the wide, toothy, good-natured grin, and as he drove me into New York City, he would bring me up to date on things of interest that had happened since I left. I remember one incident within the airport that showed me how Malcolm X never lost his racial perspective. Waiting for my baggage, we witnessed a touching family reunion scene, as part of which several cherubic little children romped and played, exclaiming in another language. By tomorrow night, they'll know how to say their first English word. Nigger, observed Malcolm X. When Malcolm X made long trips, such as to San Francisco or Los Angeles, I did not go along. But frequently, usually very late at night, he would telephone me and ask how the book was coming along, and he might set up the time for our next interview upon his return. One call that I never will forget came at close to 4 a.m., waking me. He must have just gotten up in Los Angeles. His voice said, Alex Haley? I said sleepily, yes. Oh, hey, Malcolm. His voice said, I trust you 70%. And then he hung up. I lay a short time thinking about him, and I went back to sleep feeling warmed by that call, as I still am warmed to remember it. Neither of us ever mentioned it. Malcolm X's growing respect for individual whites seemed to be reserved for those who ignored on a personal basis the things he said about whites and who jousted with him as a man. He, moreover, was convinced that he could tell a lot about any person by listening. There's an art to listening well, he told me. I listen closely to the sound of a man's voice when he's speaking. I can hear sincerity. The newspaper person whom he ultimately came to admire probably more than any other was the New York Times' M. S. Handler. I was very happy when I learned that Handler had agreed to write this book's introduction. I know that Malcolm X would have liked that. The first time I ever heard Malcolm X speak of Handler, whom he had recently met, he began, I was talking with this devil, and abruptly cut himself off in obvious embarrassment. It's a reporter named Handler from the Times, he resumed. Malcolm X's respect for the man steadily increased, and Handler, for his part, was an influence upon the inner Malcolm X. He's the most genuinely unprejudiced white man I ever met, Malcolm X said to me, speaking of Handler months later. I've asked him things and tested him. I've listened to him talk closely. I saw Malcolm X too many times exhilarated and after lecture give and take with predominantly white student bodies at colleges and universities to ever believe that he nurtured at his core any blanket white hatred. The young whites and blacks, too, are the only hope that America has, he said to me once. The rest of us have always been living in a lie. Several Negroes come to mind now who I know in one way or another had vastly impressed Malcolm X. Some others come to mind whom I know he has vastly abhorred, but these I will not mention. Particularly high in his esteem, I know, was the great photographer, usually associated with Life magazine, Gordon Parks. It was Malcolm X's direct influence with Elijah Muhammad which got Parks permitted to enter and photograph for publication in Life the highly secret self-defense training program of the black Muslim Fruit of Islam, making Parks, as far as I know, the only non-Muslim who ever has witnessed this, except for policemen and other agency representatives who had feigned joining the black Muslims to infiltrate them. His success among the white man never has made him lose touch with black reality, Malcolm X said of Parks once. Another person toward whom Malcolm X felt similarly was the actor Ossie Davis. Once in the middle of one of our interviews, when we'd been talking about something else, Malcolm X suddenly asked me, Do you know Ossie Davis? I said I didn't. He said, I ought to introduce you sometime. That's one of the finest black men. In Malcolm X's long dealings with the staff of the Harlem Weekly newspaper Amsterdam News, he'd come to admire executive editor James Hicks, and the star feature writer, James Booker. He said that Hicks had an open mind, and he never panics for the white man. He thought that Booker was an outstanding reporter. He also was highly impressed with Mrs. Booker when he met her. It was he who introduced me to two of my friends today, Dr. C. Eric Lincoln, who was at the time writing the book The Black Muslims in America, and Louis Lomax, who was then writing various articles about the Muslims. Malcolm X deeply respected the care and depth which Dr. Lincoln was putting into his research. Lomax he admired for his ferreting ear and eye for hot news. If I see that rascal Lomax running somewhere, I'll grab my hat and get behind him, Malcolm X said once, because I know he's on to something. Author James Baldwin, Malcolm X also admired. 
He's so brilliant he confuses the white man with words on paper. And another time, he's upset the white man more than anybody except the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X had very little good to say of Negro ministers, very possibly because most of them had attacked the black Muslims. Accepting reluctant admiration of Dr. Martin Luther King, I heard him speak well of only one other, the Reverend Eugene L. Callender of Harlem's large Presbyterian Church of the Master. He is a preacher, but he's a fighter for the black man, said Malcolm X. I later learned that somewhere the direct, forthright Reverend Callender had privately cornered Malcolm X and had read him the riot act about his general attacks upon the Negro clergy. Malcolm X also admired the Reverend Adam Clayton Powell in his congressman political role. I'd think about retiring if the black man had ten like him in Washington. He had similar feelings about the NAACP lawyer, now a New York State Assemblyman, Percy Sutton, and later Sutton was retained as his personal attorney. Among Negro educators, of whom Malcolm X met many in his college and university lecturing, I never heard him speak well of any but one, Dr. Kenneth B. Clark. There's a black man with brains gone to bed, Malcolm X told me once, briefly lapsing into his old vernacular. He had very distinct reservations about Negro professional intelligentsia as a category. They were the source from which most of the black Muslims' attackers came. It was for this reason that some of his most bristling counterattacks against these so-called educated Uncle Thomas's Ph.D. were flung out at his audiences at Negro institutions of higher learning. Where I witnessed the Malcolm X who was happiest and most at ease among members of our own race was when sometimes I chanced to accompany him on what he liked to call my little daily rounds around the streets of Harlem among the Negroes that he said the so-called black leaders spoke of as black masses statistics. On these tours, Malcolm X generally avoided the arterial 125th Street in Harlem. He plied the side streets, especially in those areas which were thickest with what he described as the black man down in the gutter where I came from the poverty-ridden with a high incidence of dope addicts and winos. Malcolm X here indeed was a hero. Striding along the sidewalks, he bathed all whom he met in the boyish grin, and his conversation with any who came up was quiet and pleasant. It's just what the white devil wants you to do, brother, he might tell a wino. He wants you to get drunk, so he will have an excuse to put a club up beside your head. Or I remember once he halted at a stoop to greet several older women. Sisters, let me ask you something, he said conversationally. Have you ever known one white man who either didn't do something to you or take something from you? One among that audience exclaimed after a moment, I sure ain't, whereupon all of them joined in laughter, and we walked on with Malcolm X waving back to cries of, He's right! I remember that once in the early evening we rounded a corner to hear a man, shabbily dressed, haranguing a small crowd around his speaking platform of an upturned oblong wooden box with an American flag alongside. I don't respect or believe in this damn flag. It's there because I can't hold a public meeting without it unless I want the white man to put me in jail. And that's what I'm up here to talk about. These crackers getting rich off the blood and bones of your and my people, said Malcolm X, grinning. He's working. Malcolm X rarely exchanged any words with those Negro men with shiny, processed hair without giving them a nudge. Very genially. Ah, brother, the white devil has taught you to hate yourself so much that you put hot lye in your hair to make it look more like his hair. I remember another stoop full of women alongside the door of a small grocery store where I'd gone for something, leaving Malcolm X talking across the street. As I came out of the store, one woman was excitedly describing for the rest a Malcolm X lecture she'd heard in Mosque No. 7 one Sunday. Ooh, he burnt that white man, burnt him up, child! Child, he told us we descended from black kings and queens. Lord, I didn't know it. Another woman asked, You believe that? And the first vehemently responded, Yes, I do. And I remember a lone, almost ragged guitarist huddled on a side street playing and singing just for himself when he glanced up and instantly recognized the oncoming striding figure. Ha ho! the guitarist exclaimed, and jumping up he snapped into a mock salute. My man! Malcolm X loved it and they loved him. There was no question about it. Whether he was standing tall beside a street lamp chatting with winos, or whether he was firing his radio and television broadsides to unseen millions of people, or whether he was titillating small audiences of sophisticated whites with his small talk such as, My hobby is stirring up Negroes. That spelled K-N-E-E dash G-R-O-W-S, the way you liberals pronounce it. The man had charisma, and he had power. 
and I was not the only one who at various times marveled at how he could continue to receive such an awesome amount of international personal publicity and still season liberally practically everything he said, both in public and privately, with credit and hosannas to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Often I made side notes to myself about this. I kept, in effect, a double-entry set of notebooks. Once, noting me switching from one to the other, Malcolm X curiously asked me what for. I told him some reason, but not that one notebook was things he said for his book, and the other was for my various personal observations about him. Very likely he would have become self-conscious. You must have written a million words by now, said Malcolm X. Probably, I said. This white man's crazy, he mused. I'll prove it to you. Do you think I'd publicize somebody knocking me like I do him? Look, tell me the truth, Malcolm X said to me one evening. You travel around. Have you heard anything? Truthfully, I told him I didn't know what he had reference to. He dropped it and talked to something else. From Malcolm X himself, I had seen or heard a few unusual things which had caused me some little private wonder and speculation, and then, with nothing to hang them onto, I dismissed them. One day in his car, we'd stopped for the red light at an intersection. Another car with a white man driving had stopped alongside. And when this white man saw Malcolm X, he instantly called across to him, I don't blame your people for turning to you. If I were a Negro, I'd follow you too. Keep up the fight. Malcolm X said to the man very sincerely, I wish I could have a white chapter of the people I meet like you. The light changed, and as both cars drove on, Malcolm X quickly said to me firmly, Not only don't write that, never repeat it. Mr. Muhammad would have a fit. The significant thing about the incident, I later reflected, was that it was the first time I'd ever heard him speak of Elijah Muhammad with anything less than reverence. About the same time, one of the scribblings of Malcolm X's that I'd retrieved had read, enigmatically, My life has always been one of changes. Another time, this was in September 1963, Malcolm X had been highly upset about something during an entire session, and when I read the Amsterdam News for that week, I guessed that he'd been upset about an item in Jimmy Booker's column that Booker had heard that Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X were feuding. Booker was later to reveal that after his column was written he'd gone on vacation, and on his return he learned that Malcolm X stormed into the Amsterdam News with three followers. I want to see Jimmy Booker. I don't like what he wrote. There is no fight between me and Elijah Muhammad. I believe in Mr. Muhammad and will lay down my life for him. Also, now and then, when I chanced to meet a few other key Muslims, mainly when I was with Malcolm X, but when he was not immediately present, I thought I detected either in subtle phrasing or in manner something less than total admiration of their famous colleague, and then I would tell myself I had misinterpreted. And during these days, Dr. C. Eric Lincoln and I would talk on the phone fairly often. We rarely would fail to mention how it seemed almost certain that seeds of trouble lay in the fact that however much Malcolm X praised Elijah Muhammad, it was upon dramatic, articulate Malcolm X that the communications media, and hence the general public, focused the great bulk of their attention. I never dreamed, though, what Malcolm X was actually going through. He never breathed a word, at least not to me, until the actual rift became public. When Malcolm X left me at around 2 a.m. on that occasion, he asked me to call him at 9 a.m. The telephone in the home in East Elmhurst rang considerably longer than usual, and Sister Betty, when she answered, sounded strained, choked up. When Malcolm X came on, he too sounded different. He asked me, Have you heard the radio or seen the newspapers? I said I hadn't. He said, Well, do. And that he would call me later. I went and got the papers. I read with astonishment that Malcolm X had been suspended by Elijah Muhammad, the stated reason being the chickens coming home to roost remark that Malcolm X recently had made as a comment upon the assassination of President Kennedy. Malcolm X did telephone after about an hour, and I met him at the Black Muslims newspaper office in Harlem, a couple of blocks further up Lenox Avenue from their mosque and restaurant. He was seated behind his light brown metal desk, and his brown hat lay before him on the green blotter. He wore a dark suit with a vest, a white shirt, the inevitable leaping sailfish clip held his narrow tie, and the big feet in the shined black shoes pushed the swivel chair pendulously back and forth as he talked into the telephone. I'm always hurt over any act of disobedience on my part concerning Mr. Muhammad. Yes, sir. Anything the Honorable Elijah Muhammad does is all right with me. I believe absolutely in his wisdom and authority. The telephone would ring again instantly every time he put it down. Mr. Peter Goldman, I haven't heard your voice in a good while. Well, sir, I just should have kept my big mouth shut. To the New York Times. Sir? Yes. He suspended me from making public appearances for the time being, which I fully understand. I say the same thing to you that I've told others. I'm in complete submission to Mr. Muhammad's judgment because I've always found his judgment to be based on sound thinking. To CBS. 
I think that anybody who is in a position to discipline others should first learn to accept discipline himself. He brought it off, the image of contriteness, the best he could, throughout the harshly trying next several weeks. But the back of his neck was reddish every time I saw him. He did not yet put into words his obvious fury at the public humiliation. We did very little interviewing now. He was so busy on telephones elsewhere. But it did not matter too much because by now I had the bulk of the needed life story material in hand. When he did find some time to visit me, he was very preoccupied, and I could feel him rankling with anger and with inactivity, but he tried hard to hide it. He scribbled one night, You have not converted a man because you have silenced him. John Viscount Morley. And the same night, almost illegibly, I was going downhill until he picked me up, but the more I think of it, we picked each other up. When I did not see him for several days, a letter came. I have cancelled all public appearances and speaking engagements for a number of weeks, so within that period it should be possible to finish this book. With the fast pace of newly developing incidents today, it is easy for something that is done or said tomorrow to be outdated even by sunset on the same day. Malcolm X. I pressed to get the first chapter, Nightmare, into a shape that he could review. When it was ready in a readable rough draft, I telephoned him. He came as quickly as he could drive from his home which made me see how grinding an ordeal it was to him to just be sitting at home, inactive, and knowing his temperament, my sympathies went out to Sister Betty. He pored over the manuscript pages, raptly the first time, then drawing out his red ink ballpoint pen, he read through the chapter again, with the pen occasionally stabbing at something. You can't bless Allah, he exclaimed, changing bless to praise. In a place that referred to himself and his brothers and sisters, he scratched red through, We kids! Kids are goats, he exclaimed sharply. Soon, Malcolm X and his family flew to Miami. Cassius Clay had extended the invitation as a sixth wedding anniversary present to Malcolm X and Sister Betty, and they had accepted most gratefully. It was Sister Betty's first vacation in the six years of the taut regimen as a black Muslim wife, and it was for Malcolm X both a saving of face and something to do. Very soon after his arrival, he telegraphed me his phone number at a motel. I called him, and he told me, I just want to tell you something. I'm not a betting man anymore, but if you are, you bet on Cassius to beat Liston, and you will win. I laughed and said he was prejudiced. He said, remember what I told you when the fight's over. I received later a picture postcard, the picture in vivid colors being of a chimpanzee at the monkey jungle in Miami. Malcolm X had written on the reverse side, 100 years after the Civil War, and these chimpanzees get more recognition, respect, and freedom in America than our people do. Bruh Malcolm X. Another time, an envelope came, and inside it was a clipping of an Irv Cupsonet column in the Chicago Sun-Times. Malcolm X's red pen had encircled an item which read, Insiders are predicting a split in the black Muslims. Malcolm X, ousted as number two man in the organization, may form a splinter group to oppose Elijah Muhammad. Alongside the item, Malcolm X had scribbled, Imagine this. The night of the phenomenal upset, when Clay did beat Liston, Malcolm X telephoned me, and sounds of excitement were in the background. The victory party was in his motel suite, Malcolm X told me. He described what was happening, mentioned some of those who were present, and that the new heavyweight king was in the next room, my bedroom here, taking a nap. After reminding me of the fight prediction he had made, Malcolm X said that I should look forward now to Clay's quick development into a major world figure. I don't know if you really realize the world significance that this is the first Muslim champion. It was the following morning when Cassius Clay gave the press interview which resulted in national headlines that he was actually a black Muslim. And soon after, the newspapers were carrying pictures of Malcolm X introducing the heavyweight champion to various African diplomats in the lobbies of the United Nations headquarters in New York City. Malcolm X toured Clay about in Harlem and in other places, functioning, he said, as Clay's friend and religious advisor. I had now moved upstate to finish my work on the book and we talked on the telephone every three or four days. He said things suggesting that he might never be returned to his former black Muslim post, and he now began to say things quietly critical of Elijah Muhammad. Playboy magazine asked me to do an interview for them with a the new champion, Cassius Clay, and when I confidently asked Malcolm X to arrange for me the needed introduction to Clay, Malcolm X hesitantly said, I think you'd better ask somebody else to do that. I was highly surprised at the reply, but I learned never to press him for information, and then very soon after I received a letter. Dear Alex Haley, a quick note. Would you prepare a properly worded letter that would enable me to change the reading of the contract 
so that all remaining proceeds now would go to the Muslim mosque incorporated, or in the case of my death, then to go directly to my wife, Mrs. Betty X. Little. The sooner this letter or contract is changed, the more easily I will rest. Under the signature, Malcolm X, there was a P.S. How is it possible to write one's autobiography in a world so fast changing as this? Soon I read in the various newspapers that rumors were being heard of threats on Malcolm X's life. Then there was an article in the Amsterdam News. The caption was, Malcolm X tells of death threat. And the story reported that he'd said that former close associates of his in the New York mosque had sent out a special squad to try to kill me in cold blood. Thanks to Allah, I learned of the plot from the very same brothers who had been sent out to murder me. These brothers had heard me represent and defend Mr. Muhammad for too long for them to swallow the lies about me without first asking me some questions for their own clarification. I telephoned Malcolm X and expressed my personal concern for him. His voice sounded weary. He said that his uppermost interest was that any money which might come to him in the future would go directly to his new organization or to his wife, as the letter he had signed and mailed had specified. He told me, I know I've got to get a will made for myself. I never did because I never have had anything to will to anybody. But if I don't have one and something happened to me, there could be a mess. I expressed concern for him, and he told me that he had a loaded rifle in his home and I can take care of myself. The Muslim Mosque Incorporated, to which Malcolm X had referred, was a new organization which he had formed, which at that time consisted of perhaps 40 or 50 Muslims who had left the leadership of Elijah Muhammad. Through a close associate of Cassius Clay, whom Malcolm X had finally suggested to me, my interview appointment was arranged with a heavyweight champion, and I flew down to New York City to do the interview for Playboy. Malcolm X was away briefly, Sister Betty said on the phone, and she spoke brusquely. I talked with one black Muslim lady, whom I had known before she had joined, and who had been an admirer of Malcolm X. She had elected to remain in the original fold. But I'll tell you, brother, what a lot in the mosque are saying. You know, it's like if you divorced your husband, you'd still like to see him once in a while. During my interviews with Cassius Clay in his three-room suite at Harlem's Teresa Hotel, inevitably the questions got around to Clay's Muslim membership, then to a query about what had happened to his formerly very close relationship with Malcolm X. Evenly, Clay said, You just don't buck Mr. Muhammad and get away with it. I don't want to talk about him no more. End of Side 11 Side 12 The Autobiography of Malcolm X Continuing on page 409 Elijah Muhammad at his headquarters in Chicago grew emotionally affected whenever the name of Malcolm X had to be raised in his presence, one of the Muslims in Clay's entourage told me. Mr. Muhammad reportedly had said, Brother Malcolm got to be a big man. I made him big. I was about to make him a great man. The faithful black Muslims predicted that soon Malcolm X would be turned upon by the defectors from Mosque No. 7 who had joined him. They will feel betrayed, said others, a great chastisement of Allah will fall upon a hypocrite. Mr. Muhammad reportedly had said at another time, Malcolm is destroying himself, and that he had no wish whatever to see Malcolm X die, that he would rather see him live and suffer his treachery. The general feeling among Harlemites, non-Muslims, with whom I talked, was that Malcolm X had been powerful and influential enough a minister that eventually he would split the mosque membership into two hostile camps, and that in New York City at least, Elijah Muhammad's unquestioned rule would be ended. Malcolm X returned. He said that he had been in Boston and Philadelphia. He spent ample time with me now during the day, in room 1936 in the Hotel Americana. His old total ease was no longer with him. As if it was the most natural thing in the world to do, at sudden intervals he would stride to the door, pulling it open, he would look up and down the corridor, then shut the door again. If I am alive when this book comes out, it will be a miracle, he said by way of explanation. I'm not saying it distressingly. He leaned forward and touched the buff gold bedspread. I'm saying it like I say, that's a bedspread. For the first time he talked with me in some detail about what had happened. He said that his statement about President Kennedy's assassination was not why he'd been ousted from the Muslims. It wasn't the reason at all. Nobody said anything when I made stronger statements before. The real reason, he said, was jealousy in Chicago and I had objected to the immorality of the man who professed to be more moral than anybody. Malcolm X said that he had increased the Nation of Islam membership from about 400 when he had joined to around 40,000. I don't think there were more than 400 in the country when I joined. I really don't. 
They were mostly older people, and many of them couldn't even pronounce Mr. Muhammad's name, and he stayed mostly in the background. Malcolm X worked hard not to show it, but he was upset. There is nothing more frightful than ignorance in action. Goethe, he scribbled one day. He hinted about Cassius Clay a couple of times, and when I responded only with anecdotes about my interview with Clay, he finally asked what Clay had said of him. I dug out the index card on which the question was typed in advance, and Clay's response was beneath in longhand. Malcolm X stared at the card, then out of the window, and he got up and walked around. One of the few times I ever heard his voice betray his hurt was when he said, I felt like a blood big brother to him. He paused. I'm not against him now. He's a fine young man, smart. He's just let himself be used, led astray. And at another time, there in the hotel room, he came the nearest to tears that I ever saw him, and also the only time I ever heard him use, for his race, one word. He'd been talking about how hard he'd worked building up the Muslim organization in the early days when he was first moved to New York City, when abruptly he exclaimed hoarsely, We had the best organization the black man's ever had. Niggers ruined it. A few days later, however, he wrote in one of his memo books this, which he let me read. Children have a lesson adults should learn. To not be ashamed of failing, but to get up and try again. Most of us adults are so afraid, so cautious, so safe, and therefore so shrinking and rigid and afraid. That is why so many humans fail. Most middle-aged adults have resigned themselves to failure. Telephone calls came frequently for Malcolm X when he was in the room with me, or he would make calls. He would talk in a covert, guarded manner, clearly not wishing me to be able to follow the discussion. I took to going into the bathroom at these times and closing the door, emerging when the murmuring of his voice had stopped, hoping that made him more comfortable. Later he would tell me that he was hearing from some Muslims who were still ostensibly Elijah Muhammad's followers. I'm a marked man, he said one day after such a call. I've had highly placed people tell me to be very careful every move I make. He thought about it. Just as long as my family doesn't get hurt, I'm not frightened for myself. I have the impression that Malcolm X heard in advance that the Muslim organization was going to sue to make him vacate the home he and his family lived in. I'd become worried that Malcolm X, bitter, would want to go back through the chapters in which he told of his black Muslim days and re-edit them in some way. The day before I left New York City to return upstate, I raised my concern to Malcolm X. I have thought about that, he said. There are a lot of things I could say that passed through my mind at times even then, things I saw and heard, but I threw them out of my mind. I'm going to let it stand the way I've told it. I want the book to be the way it was. Then, March 26, 1964, a note came from Malcolm X. There is a chance that I may make a quick trip to several very important countries in Africa, including a pilgrimage to the Muslim holy cities of Mecca and Medina, beginning about April 13th. Keep this to yourself. While abroad, Malcolm X wrote letters and postcards to almost everyone he knew well. His letters now were signed, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. Then, in mid-May, Sister Betty telephoned me, her voice jubilant. Malcolm X was returning. I flew to New York City. On May 21st, the phone rang in my hotel room, and Sister Betty said, Just a minute, please. Then the deep voice said, How are you? Well, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, how are you? He said, just a little bit tired. He had arrived on a Pan American Airlines flight at 4.30. He was going to have a press conference at 7 p.m. at the Hotel Teresa. I'll pick you up at 6.30 at 135th and Lennox on the uptown side, all right? When the Blue Oldsmobile stopped and I got in, El Hajj Malcolm, broadly beaming, wore a seersucker suit. The red hair needed a barber's attention, and he'd grown a beard. Also in the car was Sister Betty. It was the first time we'd ever seen each other after more than a year of talking several times a week on the telephone. We smiled at each other. She wore dark glasses, a blue maternity suit, and she was pregnant with what would be her fourth child. There must have been fifty still and television photographers and reporters jockeying for position up front, and the rest of the Skyline Ballroom was filling with Negro followers of Malcolm X or his well-wishers and the curious. The room lit up with flickering and flooding lights as he came in the door, squiring Sister Betty, holding her arm tenderly, and she was smiling broadly in her pride that this man was her man. I recognized the Times' M.S. Handler and introduced myself. We warmly shook hands and commandeered a little two-chair table. The reporters in a thick semicircle before Malcolm X, seated on the podium, fired questions at him, and he gave the impression that all of his twelve years' oratorical practice had prepared him for this new image. 
Do we correctly understand that you now do not think all whites are evil? True, sir. My trip to Mecca has opened my eyes. I no longer subscribe to racism. I've adjusted my thinking to the point where I believe that whites are human beings. A significant pause. As long as this is borne out by their humane attitude toward Negroes. They picked at his racist image. I am not a racist. I'm not condemning whites for being whites, but for their deeds. I condemn what whites collectively have done to our people collectively. He almost continually flashed about the room the ingratiating boyish smile. He would pick at the new reddish beard. They asked him about that. Did he plan to keep it? He said he hadn't decided yet. He would have to see if he could get used to it or not. Was he maneuvering to now join the major civil rights leaders whom he had previously bitterly attacked? He answered that one sideways. I'll explain it this way, sir. If some men are in a car, driving with a destination in mind, and you know they're going the wrong way, but they're convinced they're going the right way, then you get into the car with them, and ride with them, talking. And finally, when they see they're on the wrong road, not getting where they were intending, then you tell them, and they will listen to you then, what road to take. He'd never been in better form, weighing, parrying, answering the questions. The Times handler beside me was taking notes and muttering under his breath, Incredible! Incredible! I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking, some of the time, that if a pebble were dropped from the window behind Malcolm X, it would have struck on a sidewalk eight floors below where years before he had skulked selling dope. As I resumed writing upstate, periodic notes came from Malcolm X. I hope the book is proceeding rapidly, for events concerning my life happened so swiftly, much of what has already been written can easily be outdated from month to month. In life... Nothing is permanent, not even life itself. Smile. So I would advise you to rush it on out as fast as possible. Another note, special delivery, had a tone of irritation with me. He had received from the publisher a letter which indicated that he received a $2,500 check when the book contract was signed, and therefore I will be expected to pay personal income tax on this. As you know, it was my repeated specification that this entire transaction was to be made at that time directly with and to the mosque. In fact, I have never seen that check to this very day. The matter was straightened out, and I sent Malcolm X some rough chapters to read. I was appalled when they were soon returned, read inked in many places where he had told of his almost father and son relationship with Elijah Muhammad. Telephoning Malcolm X, I reminded him of his previous decision, and I stressed that if those chapters contained such telegraphing to readers of what would lie ahead, then the book would automatically be robbed of some of its building suspense and drama. Malcolm X said gruffly, Whose book is this? I told him, yours, of course, and that I only made the objection in my position as a writer. He said that he would have to think about it. I was heart-sick of the prospect that he might want to re-edit the entire book into a polemic against Elijah Muhammad. But late that night, Malcolm X telephoned. I'm sorry. You're right. I was upset about something. Forget what I wanted changed. Let what you already had stand. I never again gave him chapters to review unless I was with him. Several times I would covertly watch him frown and wince as he read but he never again asked for any change in what he'd originally said. And the only thing that he ever indicated that he wished had been different in his life came when he was reading the chapter, Laura. He said, That was a smart girl. A good girl. She tried her best to make something out of me, and look what I started her into. Dope and prostitution. I wrecked that girl. Malcolm X was busy, busy, busy. He could not visit my hotel room often. And when he did, it shortly would get the feeling of Grand Central Station. It seemed that when the telephone was not ringing for him, he was calling someone else, consulting the jotted numbers in his ever-ready memorandum book. Now he began to talk a great deal with various people from the Middle East or Africa who were in New York. Some of these came to see him at the hotel room. At first I would sit by the window, engrossed in reading, while they talked by the room's door in low tones. He was very apologetic when this occurred, and I told him I felt no sensitivity about it. Then afterwards I would generally step out into the hallway, or perhaps take the elevator down to the lobby, then watch the elevators until I saw the visitor leave. One day, I remember, the phone had rung steadily with such callers as CBS, ABC, NBC, every New York City paper, the London Daily Express, and numerous individuals. He and I had gotten no work at all accomplished. Then a television camera crew arrived and filled the room to tape an interview with Malcolm X by ABC's commentator, Bill Butel. As the crew was setting up its floodlights on tripods, a Dayton, Ohio radio station called, wishing to interview Malcolm X by telephone. He asked me to ask them to call him the following day at his sister Ella's home in Boston. Then the Ghana Ministry of Information called. 
I turned with a note to Malcolm X, to whom the commentator Butel had just said, I won't take much of your time, I just have a few probably stupid questions. Glancing at my note, Malcolm X said to Butel, Only the unasked question is stupid. And then to me, Tell them I'll call them back, please. And then, just as the television cameras began rolling, with Butel and Malcolm X talking, the telephone rang again, and it was Life magazine reporter Mark Crawford to whom I whispered what was happening. Crawford, undaunted, asked if the open receiver could be placed where he could hear the interview, and I complied, relieved that it was one way to let the interview proceed without interruption. The manuscript copy which Malcolm X was given to review was in better shape now, and he poured through page by page, intently, and now and then his head would raise with some comment. You know, he said once, why I've been able to have some effect is because I make a study of the weaknesses of this country, and because the more the white man yelps, the more I know I have struck a nerve. Another time he put down upon the bed the manuscript he was reading, and he got up from his chair and walked back and forth, stroking his chin. Then he looked at me. You know, this place here in this chapter where I told you how I put the pistol up to my head and kept pulling the trigger and scared them so when I was starting the burglary ring, well... He paused. I don't know if I ought to tell you this or not, but I want to tell the truth. He eyed me, speculatively. I palmed the bullet. We laughed together. I said, Okay, give that page here. I'll fix it. Then he considered, No, leave it that way. Too many people would be so quick to say, That's what I'm doing today. Bluffing. Again, when reading about the period when he had discovered the prison library, Malcolm X's head jerked up. Boy, I never will forget that old aardvark. The next evening, he came into the room and told me that he'd been to the Museum of Natural History and learned something about the aardvark. Now, aardvark actually means earth hog. That's a good example of root words, as I was telling you. When you study the science of philology, you learn the laws governing how a consonant can lose its shape but it keeps its identity from language to language. What astonished me here was that I knew on that day Malcolm X's schedule had been crushing, involving both a television and radio appearance and a live speech, yet he had gone to find out something about the aardvark. Before long, Malcolm X called a press conference and announced, My new organization of Afro-American unity is a non-religious and non-sectarian group organized to unite Afro-Americans for a constructive program toward attainment of human rights. The new OAAU's tone appeared to be one of militant black nationalism. He said to the questions of various reporters in subsequent interviews that the OAAU would seek to convert the Negro population from non-violence to active self-defense against white supremacists across America. On the subject of politics, he offered an enigma. Whether you use bullets or ballots, you've got to aim well. Don't strike at the puppet strike at the puppeteer. Did he envision any special area of activity? I'm going to join in the fight wherever Negroes ask for my help. What about alliance with other Negro organizations? He said that he would consider forming some united front with certain selected Negro leaders. He conceded under questioning that the NAACP was doing some good. Could any whites join his OAAU? If John Brown were alive, maybe him and he answered his critics with such statements as that he would send armed guerrillas into Mississippi. I am dead serious. We will send them not only to Mississippi, but to any place where black people's lives are threatened by white bigots. As far as I'm concerned, Mississippi is anywhere south of the Canadian border. At another time, when Evelyn Cunningham of the Pittsburgh Courier asked Malcolm X in a kidding way, say something startling for my column, he told her, anyone who wants to follow me and my movement has got to be ready to go to jail, to the hospital, and to the cemetery before he can be truly free. Evelyn Cunningham, printing the item, commented, He smiled and chuckled, but he was in dead earnest. His fourth child, yet another daughter, was born, and he and Sister Betty named the baby Gamila Lumumba. A young waitress named Helen Lanier at Harlem's 22 Club, where Malcolm X now often asked people to meet him, gave him a layette for the new baby. He was very deeply touched by the gesture. Why, I hardly know that girl. He was clearly irked when a New York Times poll among New York City Negroes reflected that three-fourths had named Dr. Martin Luther King as doing the best work for Negroes, and another one-fifth had voted for the NAACP's 
Roy Wilkins, while only 6% had voted for Malcolm X. Brother, he said to me, do you realize that some of history's greatest leaders never were recognized until they were safely in the ground? One morning in midsummer 1964, Malcolm X telephoned me and said that he would be leaving within the next two or three days for a planned six weeks abroad. I heard from him first in Cairo, about as the predicted long hot summer began in earnest with riots and other uprisings of Negroes occurring in suburban Philadelphia, in Rochester, in Brooklyn, in Harlem, and other cities. The New York Times reported that a meeting of Negro intellectuals had agreed that Dr. Martin Luther King could secure the allegiance of the middle and upper classes of Negroes, but Malcolm X alone could secure the allegiance of Negroes at the bottom. The Negroes respect Dr. King and Malcolm X because they sense in these men absolute integrity and know they will never sell them out. Malcolm X cannot be corrupted, and the Negroes know this, and therefore respect him. They also know that he comes from the lower depths, as they do, and regard him as one of their own. Malcolm X is going to play a formidable role because the racial struggle is now shifted to the urban north. If Dr. King is convinced that he has sacrificed ten years of brilliant leadership, he will be forced to revise his concepts. There is only one direction in which he can move, and that is in the direction of Malcolm X. I sent a clipping of that story to Malcolm X in Cairo. In Washington, D.C., in New York City at least, powerful civic, private, and governmental agencies and individuals were keenly interested in what Malcolm X was saying abroad and was speculating upon what would he say and possibly do when he returned to America. In upstate New York, I received a telephone call from a close friend who said he had been asked to ask me if I would come to New York City on an appointed day to meet with a very high government official who was interested in Malcolm X. I did fly down to the city. My friend accompanied me to the offices of a large private foundation well known for its activities and donations in the civil rights area. I met the foundation's president, and he introduced me to the Justice Department Civil Rights Section Head, Burke Marshall. Marshall was chiefly interested in Malcolm X's finances, particularly how his extensive traveling since his black Muslim ouster had been paid for. I told him that, to the best of my knowledge, the several payments from the publisher had financed Malcolm X, along with fees he received for some speeches and possible donations that his organization received, and that Malcolm X had told me of borrowing money from his sister Ella for the current trip and that recently the Saturday Evening Post had bought the condensation rights of the book for a substantial sum that was soon to be received. Marshall listened quietly, intently, and asked a few questions concerning other aspects of Malcolm X's life, then thanked me. I wrote to Malcolm X in Cairo that night about the interview. He never mentioned it. The Saturday Evening Post flew photographer John Lenoyes to Cairo to locate Malcolm X and photograph him in color. The magazine's September 12th issue appeared and I sent a copy by airmail to Malcolm X. Within a few days I received a stinging note expressing his anger at the magazine's editorial regarding his life story. The editorial's opening sentence read, If Malcolm X were not a Negro, his autobiography would be little more than a journal of abnormal psychology, the story of a burglar, dope pusher, addict, and jailbird, with a family history of insanity, who acquires messianic delusions and sets forth to preach an upside-down religion of brotherly hatred. I wrote to Malcolm X that he could not fairly hold me responsible for what the magazine had written in a separate editorial opinion. He wrote an apology. But the greatest care must be exercised in the future. His return from Africa was even more auspicious than when he returned from the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. A large group of Negroes, his followers and well-wishers, kept gathering in the overseas arrival building at Kennedy Airport. When I entered, white men with cameras were positioned on the second level, taking pictures of all the Negroes who entered, and almost as obvious were Negro plainclothesmen moving about. Malcolm's greeters had draped across the glass overlooking the U.S. Customs Inspection Line some large cloth banners on which were painted in bold letters, Welcome Home, Malcolm. He came in sight, stepping into one of the Customs Inspection Lines. He heard the cheering, and he looked up, smiling his pleasure. Malcolm X wanted to huddle with me to fill me in on details from his trip that he wanted in the book. He said that he was giving me only the highlights because he felt that his carefully kept diary might be turned into another book. We had intensive sessions in my hotel room where we read what he selected from the diary and I took notes. What I want to stress is that I was trying to internationalize our problem, he said to me, to make the Africans feel their kinship with us Afro-Americans. I made them think about it, that they are our blood brothers and we all came from the same foreparents. That's why the Africans loved me, the same way the Asians loved me because I was religious. Within a few days, he had no more time to see me. He would call and apologize. He was beset by a host of problems, some of which he mentioned, and some of which I heard from other people. 
Most immediately, there was discontent within his organization, the OAAU. His having stayed away almost three times as long as he had said he would be gone had sorely tested the morale of even his key members, and there was a general feeling that his interest was insufficient to expect his followers' interest to stay high. I heard from one member that a growing disillusion could be sensed throughout the organization. In Harlem at large, in the bars and restaurants, on the street corners and stoops, there could be heard more blunt criticism of Malcolm X than ever before in his career. There were, variously expressed, two primary complaints. One was that actually Malcolm X only talked, but other civil rights organizations were doing. All he's ever done was talk. Core and Snick and some of them people of Dr. King's are out getting beat over the head. The second major complaint was that Malcolm X was himself too confused to be seriously followed any longer. He doesn't know what he believes in. No sooner do he hear one thing than he switched to something else. The two complaints were not helping the old firebrand Malcolm X image any. Nor were they generating the local public interest that was badly needed by his small, young OAAU. A court had made it clear that Malcolm X and his family would have to vacate the Elmhurst house for its return to the adjudged legal owners, Elijah Muhammad's Nation of Islam. And other immediate problems which Malcolm X faced included finances. Among his other expenses, a wife and four daughters had to be supported, along with at least one full-time OAAU official. Upon his return from Africa, our agent for the book had delivered to me for Malcolm X a check for a sizable sum. Soon afterward, Malcolm X told me, laughing wryly, It's evaporated. I don't know where. Malcolm X plunged into a welter of activities. He wrote and telephoned dozens of acceptances to invitations to speak, predominantly at colleges and universities both to expound his philosophies and to earn the $150 to $300 honorariums above traveling expenses. When he was in New York City, he spent all the time he could in his OAAU's sparsely furnished office on the mezzanine floor of the Hotel Teresa, trying to do something about the OAAU's knotty problems. I'm not exposing our size and numbers, he evaded the query of one reporter. You know, the strongest part of a tree is the root, and if you expose the root, the tree dies. While we have many invisible members of all types. Unlike other leaders, I practiced the flexibility to put myself into contact with every kind of Negro in the country. Even at mealtimes, at his favorite 22 Club, or elsewhere in Harlem, he could scarcely eat for the people who came up asking for appointments to discuss with him topics ranging from personal problems to his opinions on international issues. It seemed not in him to say no to such requests. And aides of his, volunteering their time, as often as not had to wait lengthy periods to get his ear for matters important to the OAAU or to himself. Often even then, he most uncharacteristically showed an impatience with their questions or their suggestions, and they chafed visibly. And at least once weekly, generally on Sunday evenings, he would address as many Negroes as word of mouth and mimeographed advertising could draw to hear him in Harlem's Audubon Ballroom on West 166th Street between Broadway and St. Nicholas Avenue, near New York City's famous Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. Malcolm X, for some reason, suddenly began to deliver a spate of attacks against Elijah Muhammad, making more bitter accusations of religious fakery and immorality than he ever had. Very possibly, Malcolm X had grown increasingly incensed by the imminence of the court's deadline for him to have to move his wife and four little daughters from the comfortable home in which they had lived for years in Elmhurst, and Sister Betty was again pregnant. A home is really the only thing I've ever provided, Betty, since we've been married, he told me, discussing the court's order. And they want to take that away. Man, I can't keep on putting her through changes. All she's put up with. Man, I've got to love this woman. A rash of death threats were anonymously telephoned to the police, to various newspapers, to the OAAU office, and to the family's home in Elmhurst. When he went to court again, fighting to keep the house, he was guarded by a phalanx of eight OAAU men, twenty uniformed policemen, and twelve plainclothes detectives. The court's decision was that the order to vacate would not be altered. When Malcolm X reached home in Long Island, one of his followers, telephoning him there, got, instead, a telephone company operator who said that the OL16320 number was disconnected. A carload of his OAAU followers, racing to Long Island, found Malcolm X and his family perfectly safe. Inquiry of the telephone company revealed that a Mrs. Small had called and requested that the service for that number be disconnected for vacation. The OAAU followers drove back to Harlem. 
there was an ensuing confrontation between them and followers of Elijah Muhammad in front of the Black Muslim Restaurant at 116th Street and Lenox Avenue. The incident wound up with policemen who rushed to the scene finding two guns in the OAAU car and the six OAAU men were arrested. Malcolm X had a date to speak in Boston, but he was too busy to go, and he sent an OAAU assistant who spoke instead. The car returning him to the Boston airport was blocked to the East Boston Tunnel by another car. Reportedly, men with knives rushed out of the blockade car, but the Malcolm X forces showed a shotgun and the attackers dispersed. Malcolm X steadily accused the black Muslims as the source of the various attacks and threats. There is no group in the United States more able to carry out this threat than the black Muslims, he said. I know, because I taught them myself. Asked why he had attacked the black Muslims and Elijah Muhammad when things had seemed to be cooled down, he said, I would not have revealed any of this if they had left me alone. He let himself be photographed in his home, holding an automatic carbine rifle with a full double clip of ammunition that he said he kept ready for action against any possible assassination efforts. I have taught my wife to use it, and instructed her to fire on anyone, white, black, or yellow, who tries to force his way inside. I went to New York City in December for Malcolm X's reading of final additions to the manuscript to include the latest developments. He was further than I'd ever seen him from his old, assured self, it seemed to me. He kept saying that the press was making light of his statements about the threats on his life. They act like I'm jiving. He brought up again the Saturday Evening Post editorial. You can't trust the publishing people. I don't care what they tell you. The agent for the book sent to my hotel a contract dealing with foreign publication rights, which needed Malcolm X's and my signature. I signed it, as he observed, and handed the pen to him. He looked suspiciously at the contract and said, I'd better show this thing to my lawyer, and put the contract in his inside coat pocket. Driving in Harlem about an hour later, he suddenly stopped the car across the street from the 135th Street YMCA building. Withdrawing the contract, he signed it and thrust it to me. I'll trust you, he said, and drove on. With Christmas approaching, upon an impulse, I bought for Malcolm X's two oldest daughters two large dolls with painted brown complexions, the kind of dolls that would walk when held by the left hand. When Malcolm X next came to my room in the Hotel Wellington, I said, I've gotten something for you to take to Attila and Kubilla for Christmas gifts. And I walked out the dolls. Amazement, then a wide grin spread over his face. Well, what do you know about that? Well, how about that? He bent to examine the dolls. His expression showed how touched he was. You know, he said after a while, this isn't something I'm proud to say, but I don't think I've ever bought one gift for my children. Everything they play with, either Betty got it for them or somebody gave it to them, never me. That's not good. I know it. I've always been too busy. In early January... I flew from upstate New York to Kennedy Airport where I telephoned Malcolm X at home and told him that I was waiting for another plane to Kansas City to witness the swearing-in of my younger brother George, who had recently been elected a Kansas State Senator. Tell your brother for me to remember us in the alley, Malcolm X said. Tell him that he and all of the other moderate Negroes who are getting somewhere need to always remember that it was us extremists who made it possible. He said that when I was ready to leave Kansas, to telephone him saying when I would arrive back in New York and if he could, we could get together. I did this and he met me at Kennedy Airport. He had only a little while. He was so pressed, he said. He had to leave that afternoon himself for a speaking engagement which had come up. So I made reservations for the next flight back upstate. Then we went outside and sat and talked in his car in a parking lot. He talked about the pressures on him everywhere he turned, and about the frustrations, among them that no one wanted to accept anything relating to him except my old hate and violence image. He said the so-called moderate civil rights organizations avoided him as too militant, and the so-called militants avoided him as too moderate. They won't let me turn the corner, he once exclaimed. I'm caught in a trap. In a happier area, we talked about the coming baby. We laughed about the four girls in a row already. This one will be the boy, he said. He beamed. If not, the next one. When I said it was close to time for my plane to leave, he said he had to be getting on too. I said, give my best to Sister Betty. He said that he would. We shook hands and I got outside and stood as he backed the blue Oldsmobile from its parking space. I called out, See you! And we waved as he started driving away. There was no way to know that it was the last time I would see him alive. On January 19th, Malcolm X appeared on the Pierre Berton television show in Canada and said, in response to a question about integration and intermarriage, I believe in recognizing every human being as a human being, neither white, black, brown, or red. 
And when you are dealing with humanity as a family, there's no question of integration or intermarriage. It's just one human being marrying another human being, or one human being living around and with another human being. I may say, though, that I don't think it should ever be put upon a black man. I don't think the burden to defend any position should ever be put upon the black man, because it is the white man collectively who has shown that he is hostile toward integration and toward intermarriage and toward these other strides toward oneness. So as a black man, and especially as a black American, any stand that I formerly took, I don't think that I would have to defend it because it's still a reaction to the society, and it's a reaction that was produced by the society. And I think that it is the society that produced this that should be attacked, not the reaction that develops among the people who are the victims of that negative society. From this, it would be fair to say that one month before his death, Malcolm had revised his views on intermarriage to the point where he regarded it as simply a personal matter. On the 28th of January, Malcolm X was on TWA's flight number 9 from New York that landed at about 3 p.m. in Los Angeles. A special police intelligence squad saw Malcolm X greeted by two close friends, Edward Bradley and Alan Jamal, who drove him to the Statler Hilton Hotel where Malcolm X checked into room 1129. Said Bradley, As we entered the lobby, six men came in right after us. I recognized them as black Muslims. When Malcolm X returned downstairs to the lobby, he practically bumped into the Muslim entourage. The Muslims were stunned. Malcolm's face froze, but he never broke his gait. Then we knew we were facing trouble. Malcolm X's friends drove him to pick up two former secretaries of Elijah Muhammad who had filed paternity suits against him. And they went to the office of the colorful Los Angeles attorney, Gladys Root. Mrs. Root said that Malcolm X made accusations about Elijah Muhammad's conduct with various former secretaries. After dinner, Malcolm X's two friends drove him back to the hotel. Black Muslims were all over the place, Bradley related. Some were in cars and others stood around near the hotel. They had the hotel completely surrounded. Malcolm sized up the situation and jumped out of the car. He warned me to watch out and ran into the lobby. He went to his room and remained there for the rest of his stay in Los Angeles. The car in which Malcolm X left the hotel, bound for the airport, was followed, said Bradley. Hardly had we got on the freeway when we saw two carloads of black Muslims following us. The cars started to pull alongside. Malcolm picked up my walking cane and stuck it out of a back window as if it were a rifle. The two cars fell behind. We picked up speed, pulled off the airport ramp, and roared up to the front of the terminal. The police were waiting, and Malcolm was escorted to the plane through an underground passageway. Then I saw Malcolm to the plane. Chicago police were waiting when the plane landed at O'Hare Airport that night at 8 o'clock. Driven to the Bristol Hotel, Malcolm X checked in, and the adjoining suite was taken by members of the police force who would keep him under steady guard for the next three days in Chicago. Malcolm X testified at the office of the Attorney General of the State of Illinois, which had been investigating the Nation of Islam. Another day he appeared on the television program of Irv Kupsonet. He described attempts that had been made to kill him. He said he had on his desk a letter naming the persons assigned to kill him. When police returned Malcolm X to his hotel, at least 15 grim-faced Negroes were loitering nearby. Whispered Malcolm X to Detective Sergeant Edward McClellan, those are all black Muslims. At least two of them I recognize as being from New York. Elijah seems to know every move I make. Later in his room, he told the detective, it's only going to be a matter of time before they catch up with me. I know too much about the Muslims, but their threats are not going to stop me from what I am determined to do. After that night spent in the hotel, Malcolm X was police escorted back to O'Hare, where he caught a plane to New York City's Kennedy Airport. Right away he was served with a court order of eviction from the Elmhurst home. He telephoned me upstate. His voice was strained. He told me that he filed an appeal to the court order, that on the next day he was going to Alabama and thence to England and France for scheduled speeches, and soon after returning he would go to Jackson, Mississippi to address the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party on February 19th. Then he said, the first time he'd ever voiced to me such an admission, Haley, my nerves are shot, my brain's tired. He said that upon his return from Mississippi he would like to come and spend two or three days in the town where I was and read the book's manuscript again. You say it's a quiet town. Just a couple of days of peace and quiet. That's what I need. I said that he knew he was welcome, but there was no need for him to tax himself reading through the long book again, as it had only a few very minor editing changes since he'd only recently read it. I just want to read it one more time, he said, because I don't expect to read it in finished form. So he made a tentative agreement that the day after his projected return from Mississippi, he would fly upstate to visit for a weekend with me. The projected date was the Saturday and Sunday 
of February 2021. Jet Magazine reported Malcolm X's trip to Selma, Alabama, on the invitation of two members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Dr. Martin Luther King was in a Selma jail when Malcolm X's arrival sent officials of Dr. King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference into a tailspin. Quickly, the SCLC's Executive Director, Reverend Andrew Young, and Reverend James Bevel met with Malcolm X, urging him not to incite any incidents and cautioning him that his presence could cause violence. He listened with a smile, said Miss Faye Bellamy, Secretary of the SNCC, who accompanied Malcolm X to a Negro church where he would address a mass meeting. Remember this, nobody puts words in my mouth, he told Miss Bellamy. He told her that in about two weeks... He planned to start Southern recruiting for his Harlem-based OAAU. At the church where he would speak, Malcolm X was seated on the platform next to Mrs. Martin Luther King, to whom he leaned and whispered that he was trying to help, she told Jet. He said he wanted to present an alternative, that it might be easier for whites to accept Martin's proposals after hearing him, Malcolm X. I didn't understand him at first, said Mrs. King. He seemed rather anxious to let Martin know he was not causing trouble or making it difficult, but that he was trying to make it easier. Later in the hallway, he reiterated this. He seemed sincere. Addressing the mass meeting, Malcolm X reportedly shouted, I don't advocate violence, but if a man steps on my toes, I'll step on his. Whites better be glad Martin Luther King is rallying the people, because other forces are waiting to take over if he fails. Returned to New York City, Malcolm X soon flew to France. He was scheduled to speak before a Congress of African Students, but he was formally advised that he would not be permitted to speak, and moreover, that he could consider himself officially barred forever from France as an undesirable person. He was asked to leave, and he did, fuming with indignation. He flew on to London, and reporters of the British Broadcasting Corporation took him on an interviewing tour in Smethwick, a town near Birmingham with a large coloured population. Numerous residents raised a storm of criticism that the BBC was a party to a fanning of racism in the already tension-filled community. On this visit, he spoke also at the London School of Economics. Malcolm X returned to New York City on Saturday, February 13th. He was asleep with his family when at about a quarter of three the following Sunday morning, a terrifying blast awakened them. Sister Betty would tell me later that Malcolm X, barking commands and snatching up screaming frightened children, got the family safely out of the back door into the yard. Someone had thrown flaming Molotov cocktail gasoline bombs through the front picture window. It took the fire department an hour to extinguish the flames. Half the house was destroyed. Malcolm X had no fire insurance. Pregnant, distraught Sister Betty and the four little daughters went to the home of close friends. Malcolm X steeled himself to catch a plane as scheduled that morning to speak in Detroit. He wore an open-necked sweater shirt under his suit. Immediately afterward, he flew back to New York. Monday morning, amid a flurry of emergency rehousing plans for his family, Malcolm X was outraged when he learned that Elijah Muhammad's New York Mosque No. 7 minister, James X, had told the press that Malcolm X himself had firebombed the home to get publicity. Monday night, Malcolm X spoke to an audience in the familiar Audubon ballroom. If he had possessed the steel nerves not to become rattled in public before, now he was. I've reached the end of my rope, he shouted to the audience of 500. I wouldn't care for myself if they would not harm my family. He declared flatly, My house was bombed by the Muslims, and he hinted at revenge. There are hunters. There are also those who hunt the hunters. Tuesday, February 16th, Malcolm X telephoned me. He spoke very briefly, saying that the complications following the bombing of his home had thrown his plans so awry that he would be unable to visit me upstate on the weekend, as he had said he would. He said he had also had to cancel his planned trip to Jackson, Mississippi, which he was going to try and make later. He said he had to hurry to an appointment and hung up. I would read later where also on that day he told a close associate, I have been marked for death in the next five days. I have the names of five black Muslims who have been chosen to kill me. I will announce them at the meeting. And Malcolm X told a friend that he was going to apply to the police department for a permit to carry a pistol. I don't know whether they will let me have one or not, as I served time in prison. On Thursday he told a reporter, in an interview which did not appear until after his death, I'm man enough to tell you that I can't put my finger on exactly what my philosophy is now, but I'm flexible. The blackboard in the OAAU office counseled members and visitors that Brother Malcolm Speaks, Thursday, February 18th, WINS Station, 10.30 p.m. Earlier Thursday, 
Malcolm X discussed locating another home with a real estate dealer. On Friday, he had an appointment with Gordon Parks, the light magazine photographer author whom he had long admired and respected. He appeared calm and somewhat resplendent with his goatee and astrakhan hat, Parks would report later in life. Much of the old hostility and bitterness seemed to have left him, but the fire and confidence were still there. Malcolm X, speaking of the old mosque number seven days, said, That was a bad scene, brother. The sickness and madness of those days, I'm glad to be free of them. It's a time for martyrs now. And if I'm to be one, it will be in the cause of brotherhood. That's the only thing that can save this country. I've learned it the hard way, but I've learned it. Parks asked Malcolm X if it was really true that killers were after him. It's as true as we are standing here, Malcolm X said. They've tried it twice in the last two weeks. Parks asked him about police protection, and Malcolm X laughed. Brother, nobody can protect you from a Muslim but a Muslim, or someone trained in Muslim tactics. I know. I invented many of those tactics. Recalling the incident of the young white college girl who had come to the black Muslim restaurant and asked, What can I do? And he told her, Nothing. And she left in tears. Malcolm X told Gordon Parks, Well, I've lived to regret that incident. In many parts of the African continent, I saw white students helping black people. Something like this kills a lot of argument. I did many things as a Muslim that I'm sorry for now. I was a zombie then, like all Muslims. I was hypnotized pointed in a certain direction and told to march. Well, I guess a man's entitled to make a fool of himself if he's ready to pay the cost. It cost me twelve years. Saturday morning, he drove Sister Betty to see a real estate man, the house that the man then showed them that Malcolm X particularly liked, in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood also on Long Island, required a $3,000 down payment. Sister Betty indicated her approval too, and Malcolm X told the real estate man he thought they would take it. Driving Sister Betty back to the friend's home where she was staying with the children, they estimated that it would cost them about another thousand dollars to make the move. He stayed until mid-afternoon with Sister Betty at the friend's home, talking. He told her that he realized that she had been under protracted great strain, and that he was sorry about it. When he got his hat to leave, to drive into Manhattan, standing in the hallway, he told Sister Betty, We'll all be together. I want my family with me. Families shouldn't be separated. I'll never make another long trip without you. We'll get somebody to keep the children. I'll never leave you so long again. I couldn't help but just break out grinning, Sister Betty would later tell me. She figured that he must have stopped at a nearby drugstore to use the telephone booth when I later told her that Malcolm X had telephoned me upstate at about 3.30 that afternoon. For the first time in nearly two years, I did not recognize immediately that the voice on the other end of the phone belonged to Malcolm X. He sounded as if he'd had a heavy, deep cold. He told me that in the middle of the night he and some friends had helped a moving company's men take out of the other house all of the family's furniture and other belongings salvageable after the fire bombing, before a sheriff's eviction party would set the things out on the sidewalk. Betty and I have been looking at a house we want to buy. He tried to chuckle. You know nobody's going to rent. Not to me, these days. He said, all I've got is about $150, and that he needed a $3,000 down payment plus $1,000 moving costs. He asked if I thought the publisher would advance him $4,000 against the projected profits from the book. I said that when our agent's offices opened on Monday morning, I would telephone, and I knew that he would query the publisher to see if it couldn't be arranged. Then Monday night, I would call him back and let him know. He said that he and Sister Betty had decided that although they were going to pay for the house, to avoid possible trouble, they'd gotten the agreement of his sister Ella, who lived in Boston, to let the house be bought in her name. He said that he still owed $1,500 to his sister Ella, which she had loaned him to make one trip abroad. Eventually, they would change the house's title into Sister Betty's name, he said, or maybe into the name of their oldest daughter, Attila. He digressed on the dangers he faced. But you know, I'm going to tell you something, brother. The more I keep thinking about this thing, the things that have been happening lately, I'm not all that sure it's the Muslims. I know what they can do and what they can't and they can't do some of the stuff recently going on. And I'm going to tell you, the more I keep thinking about what happened to me in France, I think I'm going to quit saying it's the Muslims. Then it seemed to me such an odd, abrupt change of subject. You know, I'm glad I've been the first to establish official ties between Afro-Americans and our blood brothers in Africa. And saying goodbye, he hung up. After that telephone call, Malcolm X drove on into Manhattan and to the New York Hilton Hotel between 53rd and 54th Streets at Rockefeller Center. He checked the Blue Oldsmobile into the hotel garage, and then, in the lobby, 
he checked himself in and was assigned a twelfth-floor room to which a bellman accompanied him. Soon some Negro men entered the giant hotel's busy lobby. They began asking various bellmen what room Malcolm X was in. The bellman, of course, never would answer that question concerning any guest, and considering that it was Malcolm X whom practically everyone who read New York City newspapers knew was receiving constant death threats, the bellman quickly notified the hotel's security chief. From then until Malcolm X checked out the next day, extra security vigilance was continuously maintained on the twelfth floor. During that time, Malcolm X left the room only once to have dinner in the hotel's lobby-level, dimly-lit bourbon room. Sunday morning at nine o'clock, Sister Betty in Long Island was surprised when her husband telephoned her and asked if she felt it would be too much trouble for her to get all of the four children dressed and bring them to the two o'clock meeting that afternoon at the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem. She said, of course it won't. On Saturday, he had told her that she couldn't come to the meeting. He said to her, you know what happened an hour ago? Exactly at eight o'clock, the phone woke me up. Some man said, wake up, brother, and hung up. Malcolm X said goodbye to Sister Betty. And four hours later, Malcolm X left his room and took an elevator down to the lobby where he checked out. He got his car, and in the clear, warm midday of Sunday, February 21st, he drove uptown to the Audubon Ballroom. The Audubon Ballroom between Broadway and St. Nicholas Avenue on the south side of West 166th Street is a two-story building frequently rented for dances, organization functions, and other affairs. A dark, slender, pretty young lady, occupationally a receptionist, and avocationally a hard-working OAAU assistant to Malcolm X, has since told me that she arrived early, about 1.30 p.m., having some preliminary work to do. Entering, she saw that the usual 400 wooden chairs had been set up, with aisles on either side, but no center aisle. The young lady, she wishes to be nameless, noticed that several people were already seated in the front rows, but she gave it no thought, since some always came early, liking to get seats up close to the stage to savor to the fullest the dramatic orator Malcolm X. On the stage, behind the speaker's stand, were eight straight brown chairs arranged in a row, and behind him was the stage's painted backdrop, a mural of a restful country scene. The young lady's responsibilities for this day had included making arrangements and subsequent confirmations with the scheduled co-speaker, the Reverend Milton Galamison, the militant Brooklyn Presbyterian, who in 1964 had led the two one-day Negro boycotts in New York City public schools protesting racial imbalance. She had similarly made arrangements with some other prominent Negroes who were due to appeal to the audience for their maximum possible contributions to aid the work of Malcolm X and his organization. The people who entered the ballroom were not searched at the door. In recent weeks, Malcolm X had become irritable about this, saying, It makes people uncomfortable, and that it reminded him of Elijah Muhammad. If I can't be safe among my own kind, where can I be? He had once said testily. For this day also, he had ordered the press, as such, barred, white or black. He was angry at what he interpreted as slanted press treatment recently. He felt especially that the newspapers had not taken seriously his statements of the personal danger he was in. United Press International reporter Stanley Scott, a Negro, had been admitted, he later said, when a Malcolm lieutenant decided, as a Negro, you will be allowed to enter as a citizen if you like, but you must remove your press badge. The same criterion had applied to WMCA newsman Hugh Simpson. Both he and Scott came early enough so that they obtained seats up near the stage. Malcolm X entered the ballroom at shortly before two o'clock, trudging heavily instead of with his usual lithe strides, his young lady assistant has told me. By this time several other of his assistants were filtering in and out of the small anteroom alongside the stage. He sat down sideways on a chair, his long legs folded around its bottom, and he leaned one elbow on a kind of counter before a rather rickety make-up mirror that entertainers used when dances were held in the ballroom. He wore a dark suit, white shirt, and narrow dark tie. He said to a little group of his assistants that he wasn't going to talk about his personal troubles. I don't want that to be the reason for anyone to come to hear me. He stood up and paced about the little room. He said he was going to state that he'd been hasty to accuse the black Muslims of bombing his home. Things have happened since that are bigger than what they can do. I know what they can do. Things have gone beyond that. Those in the anteroom could hear the sounds of the enlarging audience outside taking seats. The way I feel, I ought not to go out there at all today, Malcolm X said. In fact, I'm going to ease some of this tension by telling the black man not to fight himself. That's all a part of the white man's big maneuver, to keep us fighting among ourselves, against each other. I'm not fighting anyone. That's not what we're here for. He kept glancing at his wristwatch, anticipating the arrival of Reverend Galamison. 
Whenever you make any appointment with a minister, he said to his young lady assistant, you have to call them two or three hours before time because they will change their mind. This is typical of ministers. I felt bad. I felt that it was my fault, the young lady told me. It was time for the meeting to start, too. She turned to Malcolm X's stalwart assistant, Benjamin X, known as a highly able speaker himself. Brother, will you speak? she asked. Then turning to Malcolm X, is it all right if he speaks? And maybe he can introduce you. Malcolm X abruptly whirled on her and barked, you know you shouldn't ask me right in front of him. Then collecting himself quickly, he said, okay. Brother Benjamin X asked how long he should speak. Malcolm X said, glancing again at his wristwatch, make it half an hour. And Brother Benjamin X went through the door leading onto the stage. They heard him expertly exhorting the audience about what is needed today by the black man here in these United States. The Reverend Galamison and other notables do hadn't arrived by three o'clock. Brother Malcolm looked so disappointed, the young lady says. He said to me, I don't think any of them are coming either. I felt so terrible for him. It did seem as if no one cared. I told him, Oh, don't worry, they're just late. They'll be here. It was also reported by another source that Galamison, unable to come to the meeting, did telephone earlier, and that Malcolm X was told of this before he went out to speak. Then Brother Benjamin X's half hour was up, and the young lady and Malcolm X, alone back there in the anteroom, could hear him entering the introduction. And now, without further remarks... I present to you one who is willing to put himself on the line for you, a man who would give his life for you. I want you to hear, listen, to understand, one who is a Trojan for the black man. Applause rose from the audience. At the anteroom door, Malcolm X turned and looked back at his young lady assistant. You'll have to forgive me for raising my voice to you. I'm just about at my wit's end. Oh, don't mention it, she said quickly. I understand. His voice sounded far away. I wonder if anybody really understands. And he walked out onto the stage, into the applause, smiling and nodding at Brother Benjamin X, who passed him en route to the anteroom. The young lady picked up some paperwork she had to do when Benjamin X came in, perspiring. She patted his hand, saying, That was good. Through the anteroom door, just ajar, she and Benjamin X heard the applause diminishing. Then the familiar ringing greeting, Assalaikum, brothers and sisters. Assalaikum salam, some in the audience responded. About eight rows of seats from the front, then, a disturbance occurred. In a sudden scuffling, a man's voice was raised angrily. Take your hand out of my pocket. The entire audience was swiveling to look. Hold it, hold it, don't get excited, Malcolm X said crisply. Let's cool it, brothers. With his own attention distracted, it is possible that he never saw the gunmen. One woman who was seated near the front says, The commotion back there diverted me just for an instant. Then I turned back to look at Malcolm X just in time to see at least three men in the front row stand and take aim and start firing simultaneously. It looked like a firing squad. Numerous persons later said they saw two men rushing toward the stage, one with a shotgun, the other with two revolvers. Said UPI reporter Stanley Scott, shots rang out. Men, women, and children ran for cover. They stretched out on the floor and ducked under tables. Radio station WMCA reporter Hugh Simpson said, Then I heard this muffled sound. I saw Malcolm hit with his hand still raised. Then he fell back over the chairs behind him. Everybody was shouting. I saw one man firing a gun from under his coat behind me as I hit it. The floor, too. He was firing like he was in some western, running backward toward the door and firing at the same time. The young lady who was in the backstage anteroom told me, It sounded like an army had taken over. Somehow I knew. I wouldn't go and look. I wanted to remember him as he was. Malcolm X's hand flew to his chest as the first of sixteen shotgun pellets or revolver slugs hit him. Then the other hand flew up. The middle finger of the left hand was bullet-shattered, and blood gushed from his goatee. He clutched his chest. His big body suddenly fell back stiffly, knocking over two chairs. His head struck the stage floor with a thud. In the bedlam of shouting, screaming, running people, some ran toward the stage. Among them, Sister Betty scrambled up from where she'd thrown her body over her children who were shrieking. She ran, crying hysterically, My husband, they're killing my husband. An unidentified photographer snapped shots of Malcolm X, prone on the stage floor, with people bent over him, snatching apart his bloody shirt, loosening his tie, trying to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth artificial respiration. First a woman, then a man. Said the woman, who identified herself only as a registered nurse, I don't know how I got up on the stage but I threw myself down on who I thought was Malcolm, but it wasn't. I was willing to die for the man. I would have taken the bullets myself. Then I saw Malcolm, and the firing had stopped, and I tried to give him artificial respiration. Then Sister Betty came through the people, herself a nurse, and people recognizing her moved back. 
She fell on her knees, looking down at his bare, bullet-pocked chest, sobbing. They killed him. Patrolman Thomas Hoy, 22, was stationed outside the Audubon Ballroom entrance. I heard the shooting and the place exploded. He rushed inside. He saw Malcolm X lying on the stage and then some people chasing a man. Patrolman Hoy grabbed the suspect. Louis Michaud, the owner of the Nationalist Memorial Bookstore at 125th Street and 7th Avenue in Harlem, said, I was arriving late at the meeting where Malcolm X had invited me. I met a large number of people rushing out. Sergeant Alvin Aronoff and Patrolman Louis Angelos happened to be cruising by in their radio car when they heard shots. When we got there, said Aronoff, the crowds were pushing out and screaming, Malcolm's been shot, and get him, get him, don't let him go. The two policemen grabbed by the arms a Negro who was being kicked as he tried to escape. Firing a warning shot into the air, the policemen pushed the man into their police car, not wanting the angry crowd to close in, and drove him quickly to the police station. Someone had run up to the Columbia Presbyterian Hospital's Vanderbilt Clinic emergency entrance at 167th Street and grabbed a poles and canvas stretcher and brought it back to the Audubon Ballroom stage. Malcolm X was put on the stretcher and an unidentified photographer got a macabre picture of him with his mouth open and his teeth bared as men rushed him up to the hospital clinic emergency entrance. A hospital spokesman said later that it was about 3.15 p.m. when Malcolm X reached a third-floor operating room. He was either dead or in a death-appearing state, said the spokesman. A team of surgeons cut through his chest to attempt to massage the heart. The effort was abandoned at 3.30 p.m. Reporters who had descended upon the hospital office fired questions at the spokesman, who kept saying brusquely, I don't know. Then he took the elevator upstairs to the emergency operating room. A small crowd of friends and Sister Betty had also pushed into the hospital office when the hospital spokesman returned. Collecting himself, he made an announcement. The gentleman you know as Malcolm X is dead. He died from gunshot wounds. He was apparently dead before he got here. He was shot in the chest several times and once in the cheek. The group filed out of the hospital office. The Negro men were visibly fighting their emotions. One kept smashing his fist into the other cupped palm. Among the women, many were openly crying. Moments after the news flashed throughout Harlem and throughout the entire world, a crowd began to gather outside the Hotel Teresa where Malcolm X's OAAU had its headquarters. They learned over transistor radios that the man whom the two policemen had taken from the murder scene initially identified himself as Thomas Hagen, 22. He was later identified as Talmadge Hayer, in whose right trousers pocket the policeman had found a 45 caliber cartridge clip containing four unused cartridges. And then at Jewish Memorial Hospital, doctors reported that Hayer had been shot in the left thigh. His forehead was bruised and his body was beaten. If we hadn't gotten him away, they would have kicked him to death, Sergeant Aronoff had said, and Hayer had been taken to the Bellevue Hospital prison ward. By 5 p.m., the crowd in front of the Teresa Hotel had been quietly, carefully dispersed and the Black Muslim Mosque No. 7 and its restaurant around the corner at 116th Street and Lenox Avenue had been ordered closed as a precautionary measure. On the orders of the local 28th Precinct's Captain Lloyd Seeley, New York City's first Negro to command a precinct. When reporters telephoned the Black Muslim restaurant, a man's voice stated, No one is available to make any statement. When the OAAU office in the Teresa Hotel was tried, the telephone kept ringing, unanswered. Precinct Captain Seeley soon appeared, walking by himself along 125th Street, swinging his nightstick and conversing with people he met. At the 28th Precinct Station House on West 123rd Street, the 40 policemen who were to have gone off duty at 4 p.m. had been told they must remain on duty, and two full busloads of the highly trained New York City Police Tactical Patrol Force had arrived at the precinct. Various high police officials made press statements. A Tactical Patrol Force captain, Harry Kaiser, said no unusual occurrences had been noted, and he anticipated no trouble. Deputy Police Commissioner Walter Arm said that hundreds of extra policemen would be put into the Harlem area, including some members of the Bureau of Special Services. An assistant chief inspector, Harry Taylor, speculated that the assassins had not rushed from the ballroom among the crowd, but had kept running past the stage and escaped on 165th Street. In the early evening, the police department's chief of detectives, Philip J. Walsh, quit a vacation he was on to join the hunt for the killers, and he said he looked forward to a long, drawn-out investigation. Police and reporters at the shooting scene had pictures taken of the stage, with white chalk marks now circling five bullet holes in the speaker's stand. There were other holes in the stage's mural backdrop, indicating slugs or shotgun pellets which had either missed Malcolm X or passed through him. 
Police declined to discuss a rumour sweeping Harlem that they had some motion pictures which had been taken in the Audubon Ballroom as the murder took place. Another rumour that gained swift momentum was that when Sister Betty had leaned over her husband's body, she had removed from his coat pocket a paper on which he had written the names of those he had supposedly learned were assigned to execute him. Deputy Police Commissioner Walter Arm stressed that the department had made efforts to protect Malcolm X. Twenty different times the department had offered protection to Malcolm X or to some of his assistants, and the protection was refused, said Commissioner Arm. And seventeen times uniformed police guards had been offered for the OAAU meetings at the Audubon Ballroom, the most recent time being last Sunday. Asked about the pistol permit that Malcolm X had said publicly he planned to request, Commissioner Arm said that as far as he knew, Malcolm X had never actually filed a request. A number of questions have been raised. The suspect arrested by Patrolman Hoy as he was being chased from the meeting has, at present writing, not been identified publicly. Deputy Police Commissioner Walter Arm's statement that Malcolm X refused police protection conflicts directly with the statements of many of his associates that during the week preceding his assassination, Malcolm X complained repeatedly that the police would not take his requests for protection seriously. Finally, although police sources said that a special detail of 20 men had been assigned to the meeting and that it had even been attended by agents of the Bureau of Special Services, these men were nowhere in evidence during or after the assassination. And Talmadge Heyer, rescued from the crowd and arrested as a suspect immediately after the assassination, was picked up by two patrolmen in a squad car cruising by. On long-distance telephones, reporters reached the Chicago mansion headquarters of Elijah Muhammad. He would not come to the telephone, but a spokesman of his said that Muhammad has no comment today, but he might have something to say tomorrow. No statement could be obtained either from Malcolm X's oldest brother, Wilfred X, the black Muslim minister of Mosque No. 1 in Detroit. At his home, a woman told reporters that Minister Wilfred X was not there, that he had not gone to New York, and she didn't believe he had any plans to do so. Minister Wilfred X, reached later, said that he anticipated attending the Black Muslim Convention in Chicago on the following Sunday, and regarding his brother, my brother is dead and there is nothing we can do to bring him back. As dark fell, many Negro men and women assembled before Louis Michaud's bookstore, where most of Harlem's black nationalist public activity centered. A small group of OAAU members opened their Hotel Teresa headquarters and sat in the room and would not make any statements to reporters. The New York Daily News came onto the newsstands with its cover page devoted to Malcolm X Murdered, over the photograph of him being borne away on the stretcher, and a subcaption, Gunned Down at Rally. In Long Island, where she had been taken just after her father's murder, six-year-old Attila carefully wrote a letter to him. Dear Daddy, I love you so. Oh dear, oh dear, I wish you wasn't dead. The body, still listed as John Doe because it had not yet been formally identified, had been moved late Sunday to the New York City Medical Examiner's Office at 520 1st Avenue. The autopsy confirmed that shotgun pellet wounds in the heart had killed Malcolm X. Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Milton Halpin said the death followed the first sawed-off shotgun blast, which caused 13 wounds in the heart and chest, and he said that 38 and 45 caliber bullet wounds in the thighs and legs evidenced that Malcolm X had been shot at after he had fallen. Monday morning, the official identification was made at the medical examiner's office by Sister Betty, who was accompanied by Percy Sutton, Malcolm X's Boston half-sister Mrs. Ella Collins, and Joseph E. Hall, general manager of the large Unity Funeral Home in Harlem. Leaving the medical examiner's office at about noon to go and complete funeral arrangements, Sister Betty told reporters, no one believed what he said. They never took him seriously. Even after the bombing of our home, they said he did it himself. At the Unity Funeral Home on the east side of 8th Avenue between 126th and 127th Streets, Sister Betty chose a 6-foot 9-inch bronze casket lined with eggshell velvet. At her request, the funeral would be delayed until the following Saturday, five days away. The funeral home's manager, Hall, announced to the press that the body would be dressed in a business suit and it would be put on view under a glass shield from Tuesday through Friday. Then the Saturday services would be at a Harlem church. Soon posted on the funeral home's directory was El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. In Brooklyn, Orthodox Muslim Sheikh Al Hajj Daoud Ahmed Faisal of the Islamic Mission of America said that the delayed funeral services violated a Muslim practice that the sun should not set twice on a believer's body, that the Quran prescribed burial inside 24 hours if possible, and Muslims believed that when a body grows cold, the soul leaves it, 
and when the body is put into the earth, it comes alive again. In Chicago, where policemen were watching all bus depots, railways, terminals, O'Hare Airport and highway entrances, Elijah Muhammad, under heavy guard in his three-story mansion, said, Malcolm died according to his preaching. He seems to have taken weapons as his guard. Therefore, we couldn't tolerate a man like that. He preached war. We preach peace. We are permitted to fight if we are attacked. That's the scripture, the Koran, and the Bible, too. But we will never be the aggressor. I don't have the right to be frightened because I was chosen by Allah. If Allah gives me up to the hands of the wicked, I am satisfied. My life is in the hands of Allah. The grounds outside the mansion were patrolled by both Chicago police and Fruit of Islam bodyguards. More of both patrolled before the University of Islam High School and the offices of the newspaper Muhammad Speaks. Malcolm X's lawyer, Assemblyman Percy Sutton, said that the police now have the names of those who Malcolm X had said planned to kill him. All over Harlem, reporters were interviewing people, and microphones were being put before the mouths of the man in the street. At police precinct station houses, people being questioned were leaving by side entrances. Said Assistant Chief Inspector Joseph Coyle, in charge of Manhattan North Detectives, A well-planned conspiracy. We're doing a screening process of the 400 people who were in the hall at the time. Fifty detectives were on the case, he said, and he'd been in touch with police in other cities. Harlem was mostly asleep when around the Black Muslim Mosque No. 7, on the top floor of a four-story building at 116th Street and Lenox Avenue, an explosive sound at 2.15 p.m. ripped the night. Firemen were instantly summoned by the four policemen who had been guarding the sidewalk entrance to the mosque. Within a few minutes, flames burst through the building's roof and leaped 30 feet into the air. For the next seven hours, firemen would pour water into the building. On an adjacent roof, they found an empty five-gallon gasoline can, a brown gasoline-stained shopping bag, and oily rags. Southbound IRT subway service was rerouted for a while, also three bus lines. At the spectacular five-alarm fire's height, a wall of the building collapsed. It smashed two fire engines at the curb and injured five firemen, one seriously, and also a pedestrian who had been across the street buying a newspaper. By daybreak, when the fire was declared under control, the Black Muslim Mosque and the Gethsemane Church of God in Christ on the floor beneath it were gutted, and seven street-level stores, including the Black Muslim Restaurant, were total losses. Fire department sources said that replacing the ruined equipment would cost around $50,000. Joseph X of the Black Muslims, who once had been the immediate assistant of Malcolm X, said that Elijah Muhammad's followers had two alternative mosques to meet in, one in Brooklyn and the other in Queens, Long Island. Both these mosques were under continuous police guard. Across the nation in San Francisco on Tuesday afternoon, two policemen discovered a fire beginning in the San Francisco Black Muslim Mosque and quickly extinguished it. Kerosene had been splashed on the sidewalk and door and set afire. The body of Al-Hajj Malik El-Shabazz originally had been scheduled to go on public view at 2.30 p.m. Tuesday. Crowds stood in line behind police barricades waiting to be admitted, and the policemen, wherever one looked, included numerous patrol cars and even sharpshooters on the roofs around the Unity Funeral Home. But the telephoned bomb threats, which had begun shortly after noon, made necessary two evacuations of the funeral home for bomb squad searches, which proved futile. A search was conducted even in the 43rd Street offices of the New York Times, after a man telephoned complaining of an editorial about Malcolm X and said, Your plant will be destroyed at four o'clock. At the funeral home in Harlem, policemen inspected all packages and floral pieces being delivered, as well as the large handbags of women mourners. It was 6.15 p.m. when a court and a policeman arrived, flanking Sister Betty and four close relatives and friends who entered the funeral home in a glare of flashbulbs. She's a black Jacqueline Kennedy, observed a white reporter. She has class. She knows what to do and when. She handles herself beautifully. It was 7.10 p.m. when the family party emerged and left. After ten minutes, the first of the waiting public was admitted. Between then and an hour before midnight, 2,000 people, including scores of whites, had filed past the open coffin in which the body lay dressed in a dark business suit, a white shirt and dark tie, with a small oblong brass plate above it inscribed, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, May 19th, 1925, February 21st, 1965. Malcolm X followers had been canvassing with growing anxiety for a Harlem church that would accept the Saturday funeral. Officials of several churches had refused, including a spokesman for the community's largest church, Abyssinian Baptist, of which Congressman Reverend Adam Clayton Powell is the pastor. Others which turned down requests, according to the Amsterdam News, 
included the Williams CME Church and the Refuge Temple of the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ. Then the funeral was accepted by Bishop Alvin A. Childs for the Faith Temple, Church of God in Christ, located at 147th Street and Amsterdam Avenue. The Faith Temple, a former movie theater which had been converted 15 years previously, could seat a 1,000 in its auditorium and another 700 in its basement. Bishop Childs, who in 1964 had been elected as Harlem's locality mayor, told the press that it was as a humanitarian gesture that he made his church available, and of Malcolm X he said, A militant and vocal person. I do not agree with all of his philosophy, but this did not affect our friendship. Shortly after the news became known, Bishop Childs and his wife began to receive the first of a succession of bomb threats telephoned both to the church and to their home. Prominent Negro figures were being quoted by the various press media. The famed psychologist Dr. Kenneth B. Clark told Jet Magazine, I had a deep respect for this man. I believe that he was sincerely groping to find a place in the fight for civil rights, on a level where he would be respected and understood fully. I looked forward to his growth along those lines. It doesn't matter so much about his past. It is tragic that he was cut down at the point when he seemed on the verge of achieving the position of respectability he sought. A New York Times correspondent in a London press conference quoted the author and dramatist James Baldwin, who thought the death of Malcolm X was a major setback for the Negro movement. Pointing at white reporters, Baldwin accused, You did it. Whoever did it was formed in the crucible of the Western world, of the American Republic. European rape of Africa began racial problems and was therefore the beginning of the end for Malcolm X, Baldwin said. The bookstore owner in Harlem, Louis Michaud, a major voice in the community, told the Amsterdam News, It's things like the murder of Malcolm X that drive the masses closer together. He died in the same manner that Patrice Lumumba met his death in the Congo. We must unite, not fight. Malcolm X caused many young Negroes to take a new vision of themselves, said Bayard Rustin, a main figure in organizing the March on Washington in 1963. A third party was suspected of killing Malcolm X by Corps' national director James Farmer, who said, Malcolm's murder was calculated to produce more violence and murder and vengeance killings. A few days later, asked for his opinion of a rumor circulating about that a red Chinese plot brought about the murder, Farmer said, I would not say it is impossible. For the Negroes in America, the death of Malcolm X is the most portentous event since the deportation of Marcus Garvey in the 1920s, said Dr. C. Eric Lincoln, author of The Black Muslims in America, who talked to the press at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, where he was a visiting professor and research fellow. I doubt there are international implications in the slaying. The answer is closer to home. The answer is in the local struggle among contending rivals for leadership of the black masses, which are potentially the most volatile subgroup in America. Said Roy Wilkins, Executive Secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Master spellbinder that he was, Malcolm X, in death, cast a spell more far-flung and more disturbing than any he cast in life. The New York City police investigators who were pursuing the case were unhappy that Malcolm's followers had not come forward to aid the investigation. At police request, the press printed a telephone number, SW58117, for strictly confidential information that anyone might offer concerning the slaying. The police had picked up and were holding Reuben Francis, described as a Malcolm X bodyguard, who was believed to be the person who had shot the suspected assassin Talmadge Heyer during the melee the previous Sunday at the Audubon Ballroom. Heyer remained in the Bellevue Prison Ward, awaiting surgery. As thousands continued viewing the body of the slain Malcolm X amid intermittent new bomb threats telephoned to the funeral home and to the Faith Temple where his funeral was scheduled for Saturday, a new organization, the Federation of Independent Political Action, threatened to picket all Harlem business establishments which would not close from Thursday afternoon until Monday morning in tribute to Malcolm X. The FIPA's spokesman was Jesse Gray, the well-known rent strike leader. Harlem pedestrians began to be handed printed sheets reading, in part, If the stores refuse to close, they identify with our enemy, therefore we must close them, pass them by. Those that shop along 125th Street during the hours that the stores are to be closed identify with the murderous stooge that allowed the power structure to use his hands to kill Brother Malcolm. At a late evening FIPA rally before Louis Michaud's bookstore, Jesse Gray declared that in 1965 a Negro should run for mayor of New York in the name of Malcolm. 
and speculated that such a candidate should receive 100,000 votes. Shortly after the FIPA rally, merchants and other members of the Uptown Chamber of Commerce met and swiftly passed a resolution urging all Harlem stores to remain open and continue to serve their customers, and recommendation was made that full pay be given to any store employees who might wish to attend Malcolm X's funeral on Saturday morning. Then, one after another, Harlem leaders sharply criticized the FIPA proposal as irresponsible. Finally, nearly all of the Harlem stores kept their doors open for business. The FIPA got together about 20 pickets who patrolled for a while before Harlem's largest store, Blumstein's. Leading the pickets were two white men carrying signs reading, All stores should close. Honor Malcolm X. End of Side 12 Side 13 The Autobiography of Malcolm X Continuing on page 445 The weather had turned very cold. Icicles hung from the collapsed roof of the fire-ruined building that had housed Black Muslim Mosque No. 7. The Amsterdam News, its offices barely a block down 8th Avenue from the funeral home where Malcolm X's body lay, editorialized, Steady Eddie, saying that orderly tributes to Malcolm X would confound his critics who would like nothing better than to see black people rioting over his remains. The fear of serious mass rioting set off by some unpredictable spark hung steadily in the air. An increasing number of Harlem leaders declared that the principal reason for this was the downtown white press media sensationalizing what was going on in a calm, dignified community. Finally, the Harlem Minister's Interfaith Association would issue a formal accusation. The screaming headlines of many of our newspapers make it seem as if all of Harlem was an armed camp, ready to explode at any moment. The vast majority of the citizens of the Harlem community is not involved in the unfortunate acts of violence that have been grossly overplayed by the press. Many times the slanting of the news is able to bring about an atmosphere through which a few depraved and reckless individuals can take advantage. Malcolm X died broke. That headline in Harlem's Amsterdam News came as a shock to many in the community. Few had reflected that Malcolm X, upon becoming a black Muslim minister, had signed an oath of poverty so that for twelve years he never acquired anything in his own name. Somewhere I've read that Malcolm X in his black Muslim days received about $175 weekly to cover his living and other expenses exclusive of travel. He left his four daughters and pregnant wife with no insurance of any kind, no savings, and no income, the Amsterdam News story said. And it might have added that he never drew up a will. He had made a February 26th appointment with his lawyer five days after his death. Within the week, two groups had organized and were asking Harlemites for contributions to help Sister Betty raise and educate the children, since organized as the Malcolm X Daughters Fund at Harlem's Freedom National Bank, 275 West 125th Street. In Boston, Malcolm X's half-sister, Mrs. Ella May Collins, told a news conference that she would choose the leaders of the OAAU to succeed Malcolm X. Mrs. Collins operated the Sarah A. Little School of Preparatory Arts, where, she said, children were taught Arabic, Swahili, French, and Spanish. In 1959, she too had broken away from Elijah Muhammad's black Muslims, to which she had originally been converted by Malcolm X. Far from Harlem, in lands where Malcolm X had traveled, the press had given the murder a coverage that had highly irritated the director of the United States Information Agency, Carl T. Rowan, himself a Negro. In Washington, addressing the American Foreign Service Association, Rowan said that when he first heard of the murder, he knew it would be grossly misconstrued in some countries where people were unaware of what Malcolm X represented. And he said the USIA had worked hard to inform the African press of the facts about Malcolm X and his preachments, but still there had been a host of African reaction based on misinformation and misrepresentation. Said USIA Director Rowan, Mind you, here was a Negro who preached segregation and race hatred, killed by another Negro, presumably from another organization that preaches segregation and race hatred, and neither of them representative of more than a tiny minority of the Negro population of America. Rowan held up some foreign newspapers. All this about an ex-convict, ex-dope peddler, who became a racial fanatic, continued Rowan. I can only conclude that we Americans know less about what goes on in the minds of other peoples than we thought, or the need to inform is even greater than we in USIA thought it to be. The Daily Times of Lagos in Nigeria had said, Like all mortals, Malcolm X was not without his faults, but that he was a dedicated and consistent disciple of the movement for the emancipation of his brethren, no one can doubt. 
Malcolm X has fought and died for what he believed to be right. He will have a place in the Palace of Martyrs. The Ghanaian Times, Accra, called Malcolm X the militant and most popular of Afro-American anti-segregationist leaders, and it added his name to a host of Africans and Americans, ranging from John Brown to Patrice Lumumba, who were martyred in freedom's cause. Also in Accra, the Daily Graphic, the assassination of Malcolm X will go down in history as the greatest blow the American integrationist movement has suffered since the shocking assassination of Medgar Evers and John F. Kennedy. The Pakistan Hurriyat of Karachi said, a great Negro leader. The Pakistan Times said, his death is a definite setback to the Negro movement for emancipation. The Peking China People's Daily said the killing happened because Malcolm X fought for the emancipation of the 23 million American Negroes. According to correspondence reports, the first Algerian headline said, the Ku Klux Klan assassinated Malcolm X. The pro-communist Alger Republicans editorial on the slaying accused American fascism, and the Times Algerian correspondent said Algerians showed signs of raising Malcolm X to martyrdom. The U.S. consulate in Georgetown, British Guiana, was marched on by pickets accusing American imperialists. Another Peking China paper, Jianmin Jipao, said that the death showed that in dealing with imperialists' oppressors, violence must be met with violence. Pravda in Moscow carried on a brief stories and no editorial comment, the New York Times Moscow correspondent said. And another in Poland said there was no noticeable reaction of any kind, and that few Poles had heard of Malcolm or were interested in the racial issue. Reportedly, the murder was only routinely reported with little special interest by the press in Cairo, Beirut, New Delhi, and Saigon. In Paris and Western Europe, the story was essentially a one-day sensation, with the West German press handling it as if it were in the Chicago gangster tradition. The New York Times said, The London newspapers have probably played the story harder and longer than most, giving continuing emphasis to the police work on the murder. The London Times and the London Daily Telegraph both carried editorial comments, but neither treated Malcolm X as a major figure. Also reported by the New York Times London correspondent was that a London group calling itself the Council of African Organizations has violently attacked the United States over the murder. This group is made up of students and other unofficial African representatives here. A press release described Malcolm as a leader in the struggle against American imperialism, oppression, and racialism. It said... The butchers of Patrice Lumumba are the very same monsters who have murdered Malcolm X in cold blood. Friday morning, New York City Press headlines concerning Malcolm X's slaying were devoted to the police department's apprehension of a second slaying suspect. He was a stocky, round-faced, 26-year-old karate expert named Norman 3X Butler, allegedly a black Muslim, and a week later, this was followed by the arrest of Thomas 15X Johnson, also allegedly a black Muslim. Both men had been early indicted in the January 1965 shooting of Benjamin Brown, a New York City correction officer and a black Muslim defector. Both men were indicted, along with Hayer, for the murder of Malcolm X on March 10th. With the news announcement of Butler's arrest and his at least tentative identification as a member of Elijah Muhammad's organization, tension reached a new high among all who had any role in the feud. The Black Muslim National Convention was scheduled to begin that Friday in Chicago to last for three days. Early Friday morning in New York at the Kennedy Airport, Dozens of policemen spent 40 minutes searching a plane belonging to Capital Airlines, which back in December 1964 had accepted a Mosque No. 7 charter flight to Chicago and return at a fee of $5,175.54, which the Mosque had subsequently paid in increments. Altogether, about 3,000 black Muslims from their mosques in most sizable cities were in Chicago for their annual Savior's Day convention, regarded by them as similar to the holiday of Christmas. In the order of arrival, each group from the different mosques and cities assembled outside the big sports coliseum south of Chicago's business district. The brothers of all ages dressed in neat dark suits and white shirts, and the sisters garbed in flowing silk gowns and headdresses. And every individual was filtered through an intense security check that Chicago police sources said was unprecedented in Chicago except for a visiting president. Searched even more closely were the relatively few non-Muslim Negroes who came to be spectators, and the press representatives, both white and black. Take off your hat, show some respect, snapped a black Muslim guard at a white reporter. As each person was cleared, a Fruit of Islam man ushered him or her to a specific seat in the drafty interior of the 7,500-seat Coliseum. 
Later, Muslim sources would blame the half-full house upon the white man's dividing of Negroes. But observers who recall the Pact Coliseum in 1964 said that bombing fears kept away many non-Muslim Negroes. The audience sat lightly murmuring under the two huge hanging banners proclaiming, Welcome Elijah Muhammad. We are glad to have you with us. And we must have some of this land. Referring to Elijah Muhammad's demand that one or more states be turned over to the 23 million so-called Negroes in America as partial reparation for over a century of our free blood and sweat as slaves which helped to develop this wealthy nation where still today you show us you do not wish or intend to accept us as equals. In front of the wide, raised speaker's platform were two nearly life-sized photographic blow-ups of Elijah Muhammad. Standing between the stage and the audience were Fruit of Islam guards. Others were prowling the aisles, scanning rolls of faces with intermittent peremptory demands for identification. What mosque, brother? Still more Fruit of Islam men were inspecting the Coliseum's vacant balcony, backstage, downstairs, and rafters and roof. The ghost of Malcolm X was in the Coliseum. First in a high drama for the Muslims, Elijah Muhammad's son, Wallace Delaney Muhammad, who once had sided with Malcolm X, faced the audience and begged forgiveness for his defection. Next, two brothers of Malcolm X, Wilfred and Filbert, both of them black Muslim ministers, urged unity with Elijah Muhammad. Said Minister Wilfred X of the Detroit Mosque, We would be ignorant to get confused and go to arguing and fighting among ourselves and forget who the real enemy is. Said Minister Filbert X of the Lansing Mosque, Malcolm was my own blood brother, next to me. I was shocked. No man wants to see his own brother destroyed. But I knew that he was traveling on a very reckless and dangerous road. I made attempts to change his course. When he was living, I tried to keep him living. Now that he is dead, there is nothing I can do. Indicating the seated Elijah Muhammad, Minister Filbert X declared, Where he leads me, I will follow. And then he introduced the black Muslim leader to make his address. Only the head of Elijah Muhammad was visible above the grim-faced fruit of Islam men in a living wall, Cassius Clay among them. Crescents, stars, moons, and suns were in gold thread embroidery on the small fez that Elijah Muhammad wore. He said in his speech, For a long time Malcolm stood here where I stand. In those days Malcolm was safe. Malcolm was loved. God himself protected Malcolm. For more than a year Malcolm was given his freedom. He went everywhere, Asia, Europe, Africa, even to Mecca, trying to make enemies for me. He came back preaching that we should not hate the enemy. He came here a few weeks ago to blast away his hate and mudslinging, everything he could think of to disgrace me. We didn't want to kill Malcolm and didn't try to kill him. They know I didn't harm Malcolm. They know I loved him. His foolish teaching brought him to his own end. Both physically and emotionally worked up, often Elijah Muhammad would begin coughing, Take it easy. Take your time, his audience pleaded with him. He had no right to reject me, Elijah Muhammad declared. He was a star who went astray. They knew I didn't harm Malcolm, but he tried to make war against me. He said that Malcolm X would have been given the most glorious of burials if he had stayed with the black Muslims and had died a natural death. Instead, we stand beside the grave of a hypocrite. Malcolm, who was he leading? Who was he teaching? He has no truth. We didn't want to kill Malcolm. His foolish teaching would bring him to his own end. I am not going to let the crackpots destroy the good things Allah sent to you and me. Elijah Muhammad drove his frail energy to speak for about an hour and a half. He challenged any would-be assassins. If you seek to snuff out the life of Elijah Muhammad, you are inviting your own doom. The Holy Quran tells us not to pick a fight, but to defend ourselves. We will fight. It was mid-afternoon when Elijah Muhammad turned back to his seat with some 3,000 black Muslim men, women, and children shouting, Yes, sir, so sweet, all praise to Muhammad. In the Unity Funeral Home in the Harlem community of New York City in the mid-afternoon, the public's viewing of the body of Malcolm X was interrupted by the arrival of a party of about a dozen people whose central figure was a white-turbaned, dark-robed, elderly man whose white beard fell to his chest and who carried a forked stick when reporters rushed to attempt interviews, another man in the party waved them away, saying, A silent tongue does not betray its owner. The man was Sheikh Ahmed Hassoun, a Sudanese, a member of the Sunni Muslims, who had taught in Mecca for 35 years when he had met Malcolm X there, and then had soon come to the United States to serve as Malcolm X's spiritual advisor and to teach at the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. 
Sheikh Hassoun prepared the body for burial in accordance with Muslim ritual. Removing the western clothing in which the body had been on display, Sheikh Hassoun washed the body with special holy oil. Then he draped the body in the traditional seven white linen shrouds, called the kafan. Only the face with its reddish moustache and goatee was left exposed. The mourners who had come with Sheikh Hassoun filed to the bier, and he read passages from the Koran. Then he turned to a funeral home representative. Now the body is ready for burial. Soon the sheikh and his retinue left, and the viewing by the public resumed. When the word spread, numbers of persons who had come before returned for another wait in the long, slowly moving line, wanting to see the Muslim burial dress. It was late during this Friday afternoon that I got into the quietly moving line, thinking about the Malcolm X with whom I had worked closely for about two years. Blue uniformed policemen stood at intervals watching us shuffle along within the wooden, grey-painted police barricades. Just across the street, several men were looking at the line from behind a large side window of the Lone Star Barbershop, Eddie Johns, proprietor, William Ash, manager. Among the policemen were a few press representatives talking to each other to pass the time. Then we were inside the softly lit, hushed, cool, large chapel. Standing at either end of the long, handsome bronze coffin were two big, dark policemen, mostly looking straight ahead, but moving their lips when some viewer tarried. Within minutes I had reached the coffin. Under the glass lid I glimpsed the delicate white shrouding over the chest and up like a hood about the face on which I tried to concentrate for as long as I could. All that I could think was that it was he, all right. Malcolm X. Move on. The policeman's voice was soft. Malcolm looked to me just waxy and dead. The policeman's hand was gesturing at his waist level. I thought, well... Goodbye. I moved on. Twenty-two thousand people had viewed the body when the line was stopped that night for good, at 11 p.m. Quietly, between midnight and dawn, a dozen police cars flanked a hearse that went the twenty-odd blocks farther uptown to the Faith Temple. The bronze coffin was wheeled inside and placed upon a platform draped in thick, dark red velvet in front of the altar, and the coffin's lid was reopened. As the hearse pulled away, policemen stood at posts of vigil, both inside and outside Faith Temple. It was crispy cold outside. About 6 a.m., people began forming a line on the east side of Amsterdam Avenue. By 9 a.m., an estimated 6,000 persons thronged the nearby blocks behind police barriers, and faces were in every window of the apartment buildings across the street. Some stood shivering on fire escapes. From 145th Street to 149th Street, policemen had blocked off all automobile traffic except for their own cars, the newspapers' cars, and the equipment trucks for radio and television on-the-spot coverage. There were hundreds of policemen, some on the rooftops in the immediate area. Combing the crowd's edges were reporters with microphones and notebooks. He was fascinating, a remarkably fascinating man. That's why I'm here, a white girl in her mid-twenties told a New York Times man. And a Negro woman, I'm paying my respects to the greatest black man in the century. He's a black man. Don't say colored. Another woman, noticing steel helmets inside a television network car, laughed to the driver, You getting ready for next summer? When the Faith Temple doors were opened at 9.20, a corps of OAAU members entered. Within the next quarter hour, 20 of the men had ushered in 600 seat holders. Fifty press reporters, photographers, and television cameramen clustered beneath religious murals to the rear of the altar, and some stood on chairs to see better. A Negro engineer monitored recording equipment between the altar and the coffin, which was guarded by eight uniformed Negro policemen and two uniformed Negro police women. One Negro plainclothes policeman sat on either side of heavily veiled Sister Betty in the second row. The raised lid of the coffin hid the Faith Temple's brass tithe box and candelabra. The head of the Islamic Mission of America in Brooklyn, Sheikh Al-Hajj Daoud Ahmed Faisal, had counseled that any hint of Christianity in the services would make the deceased a kafir, an unbeliever. The Sheikh had also dissented with the days of public exhibition of the body. Death is a private matter between Allah and the deceased. Before the services began, OAAU ushers brought in one floral wreath, a two-by-five arrangement of the Islamic star and crescent in white carnations against a background of red carnations. First, the actor Ossie Davis and his wife, actress Ruby Dee, read the notes, telegrams, and cables of condolence. They came from every major civil rights organization, from individual figures such as Dr. Martin Luther King, from organizations and governments abroad, such as the Africa-Pakistan-West Indian Society of the London School of Economics, the Pan-African Congress of Southern Africa, 
the Nigerian ambassador from Lagos, the president of the Republic of Ghana, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the death of Malcolm X shall not have been in vain. Next, Omar Osman stood, a representative of the Islam Center of Switzerland and the United States. We knew Brother Malcolm as a blood brother, particularly after his pilgrimage to Mecca last year. The highest thing that a Muslim can aspire to is to die on the battlefield and not die at his bedside. He paused briefly to wait out the applause from among the mourners. Those who die on the battlefield are not dead, but are alive. The applause was louder and cries rose, Right! Right! Omar Osman then critically commented upon the remarks which USIA director Carl Rowan had made in Washington, D.C. about the foreign press reaction to the death of the deceased. From the audience then, hisses rose. Again, the actor Ossie Davis stood. His deep voice delivered the eulogy to Malcolm X, which was going to cause Davis subsequently to be hailed more than ever among Negroes in Harlem. Here, at this final hour, in this quiet place, Harlem has come to bid farewell to one of its brightest hopes, extinguished now and gone from us forever. Many will ask what Harlem finds to honor in this stormy, controversial, and bold young captain, and we will smile. They will say that he is of hate, a fanatic, a racist, who can only bring evil to the cause for which you struggle. And we will answer and say unto them, Did you ever talk to Brother Malcolm? Did you ever touch him or have him smile at you? Did you ever really listen to him? Did he ever do a mean thing? Was he ever himself associated with violence or any public disturbance? For if you did, you would know him. And if you knew him, you would know why we must honor him. Malcolm was our manhood, our living black manhood. This was his meaning to his people. And in honoring him, we honor the best in ourselves. And we will know him then for what he was and is, a prince, our own black shining prince, who didn't hesitate to die because he loved us so. Brief speeches were made by others. Then the family, the OAAU members and other Muslims present, stood and filed by the coffin to view the body for the last time. Finally, the two plainclothes policemen ushered Sister Betty to have her last sight of her husband. She leaned over, kissing the glass over him. She broke into tears. Until then, almost no crying had been heard in the services. But now Sister Betty's sobs were taken up by other women. The services had lasted a little over an hour when the three minutes of prayers said for every Muslim who is dead were recited by al Haj Hesham Jaber of Elizabeth, New Jersey. At the phrase, Allahu Akbar, God is most great, all Muslims in the audience placed their opened hands at the sides of their faces. An official cortege with a hearse of three family cars, 18 mourners' cars, 12 police cars and six press cars, followed by about 50 other cars, briskly drove the 18 miles out of Manhattan and along the New York Thruway, then off its exit 7 to reach the Fern Cliff Cemetery in Ardsley, New York. All along the route, Negroes placed their hats or hands over their hearts, paying their final respects. At each bridge crossing in Manhattan County, police cars stood watch. The Westchester County Police had stationed individual patrolmen at intervals en route to the cemetery. Over the coffin, Final Muslim prayers were said by Sheikh al Haj Hesham Jaber. The coffin was lowered into the grave, the head facing the east, in keeping with Islamic tradition. Among the mourners, the Muslims knelt beside the grave to pray with their foreheads pressed to the earth in the eastern manner. When the family left the grave site, followers of Malcolm X would not let the coffin be covered by the white grave diggers who had stood a little distance away, waiting. Instead, seven OAAU men began dropping bare handfuls of earth down on the coffin. Then they were given shovels, and they carried dirt to fill the grave, and then mound it. The night fell over the earthly remains of El Haj Malik El Shabazz, who had been called Malcolm X, who had been called Malcolm Little, who had been called Big Red, and Satan, and Homeboy, and other names, who had been buried as a Muslim. According to the Koran, the New York Times reported, the bodies of the dead remain in their graves until the last day, the day of judgment, 
On this day of cataclysm, the heavens are rent, and the mountains ground to dust, the graves open, and men are called to account by Allah. The blessed, the God-fearing, the humble, the charitable, those who have suffered and been persecuted for Allah's sake, or fought in religious wars for Islam, are summoned to the garden of paradise. There, according to the teaching of Muhammad, the prophet, they live forever by flowing streams, reclining on silken cushions and enjoying the company of dark-eyed maidens and wives of perfect purity. The damned, the covetous, the evildoer, the follower of gods other than Allah, are sent to eternal fire, where they are fed boiling water and molten brass. The death from which ye flee will truly overtake you, the Koran says. Then will ye be sent back to the knower of things secret and open, and he will tell you the truth of the things that ye did. After signing the contract for this book, Malcolm X looked at me hard. A writer is what I want, not an interpreter. I tried to be a dispassionate chronicler, but he was the most electric personality I've ever met, and I still can't quite conceive him dead. It still feels to me as if he's just gone into some next chapter to be written by historians. New York, 1965 Ossie Davis on Malcolm X Mr. Davis wrote the following in response to a magazine editor's question, Why did you eulogize Malcolm X? You're not the only person curious to know why I would eulogize a man like Malcolm X. Many who know and respect me have written letters. Of these letters, I am proudest of those from a sixth grade class of young white boys and girls who asked me to explain. I appreciate you giving me this chance to do so. You may anticipate my defense somewhat by considering the following fact. No Negro has yet asked me that question. My pastor in Grace Baptist Church, where I teach Sunday school, preached a sermon about Malcolm in which he called him a giant in a sick world. Every one of the many letters I got from my own people lauded Malcolm as a man and commended me for having spoken at his funeral. At the same time, and this is important, most of them took special pains to disagree with much or all of what Malcolm said and what he stood for. That is, with one singing exception. They all, every last black glory-hugging one of them, knew that Malcolm, whatever else he was or was not, Malcolm was a man. White folks do not need anybody to remind them that they are men. We do. This was his one incontrovertible benefit to his people. Protocol and common sense require the Negroes stand back and let the white man speak up for us, defend us, and lead us from behind the scene in our fight. This is the essence of Negro politics. But Malcolm said to hell with that. Get up off your knees and fight your own battles. That's the way to win back your self-respect. That's the way to make the white man respect you. And if he won't let you live like a man, he certainly can't keep you from dying like one. Malcolm, as you can see, was refreshing excitement. He scared hell out of the rest of us, bred as we are to caution, to hypocrisy in the presence of white folks, to the smile that never fades. Malcolm knew that every white man in America profits directly or indirectly from his position vis-a-vis Negroes, profits from racism even though he does not practice it or believe in it. He also knew that every Negro who did not challenge on the spot every instance of racism, overt or covert, committed against him and his people, who chose instead to swallow his spit and go on smiling, was an Uncle Tom and a traitor without balls or guts or any other commonly accepted aspects of manhood. Now, we knew all these things as well as Malcolm did. But we also knew what happened to people who stick their necks out and say them. And if all the lies we tell ourselves by way of extenuation were put into print, it would constitute one of the great chapters in the history of man's justifiable cowardice in the face of other men. But Malcolm kept snatching our lies away. He kept shouting the painful truth we whites and blacks did not want to hear from all the housetops. And he wouldn't stop for love nor money. You can imagine what a howling, shocking nuisance this man was to both Negroes and whites. Once Malcolm fastened on you, you could not escape. He was one of the most fascinating and charming men I have ever met, and never hesitated to take his attractiveness and beat you to death with it. Yet his irritation 
though painful to us, was most salutary. He would make you angry as hell, but he would also make you proud. It was impossible to remain defensive and apologetic about being a Negro in his presence. He wouldn't let you. And you always left his presence with the sneaky suspicion that maybe, after all, you were a man. But in explaining Malcolm, let me take care not to explain him away. He had been a criminal, an addict, a pimp, and a prisoner, a racist, and a hater. He had really believed the white man was a devil. But all this had changed. Two days before his death, in commenting to Gordon Parks about his past life, he said, That was a mad scene, the sickness and madness of those days. I'm glad to be free of them. And Malcolm was free. No one who knew him before and after his trip to Mecca could doubt that he had completely abandoned racism, separatism, and hatred. But he had not abandoned his shock effect statements, his bristling agitation for immediate freedom in this country, not only for blacks, but for everybody. And most of all, in the area of race relations, he still delighted in twisting the white man's tail and in making Uncle Tom's compromises and accommodationists. I deliberately include myself thoroughly ashamed of the urbane and smiling hypocrisy we practice merely to exist in a world whose values we both envy and despise. But even had Malcolm not changed, he would still have been a relevant figure on the American scene, standing in relation, as he does, to the responsible civil rights leaders, just about where John Brown stood in relation to the responsible abolitionists in the fight against slavery. Almost all disagreed with Brown's mad and fanatical tactics, which led him foolishly to attack a federal arsenal at Harpers Ferry to lose two sons there and later to be hanged for treason. Yet today the world, and especially the Negro people, proclaim Brown not a traitor, but a hero and a martyr in a noble cause. So in future, I will not be surprised if men come to see that Malcolm X was, within his own limitations, and in his own inimitable style, also a martyr in that cause. But there is much controversy still about this most controversial American, and I am content to wait for history to make the final decision. But in personal judgment, there is no appeal from instinct. I knew the man personally, and however much I disagreed with him, I never doubted that Malcolm X, even when he was wrong, was always that rarest thing in the world among us Negroes, a true man. And if, to protect my relations with the many good white folks who make it possible for me to earn a fairly good living in the entertainment industry, I was too chicken, too cautious to admit that fact when he was alive, I thought at least that now when all the white folks are safe from him at last. I could be honest with myself enough to lift my hat for one final salute to that brave, black, ironic gallantry which was his style and hallmark, that shocking zing of fire and be damned to you, so absolutely absent in every other Negro man I know, which brought him too soon to his death. End of the autobiography of Malcolm X.